Hey there, and welcome to Better Life Library. If you enjoy this audiobook, please give it a thumbs up and leave a comment down below. We've noticed that only 6% of you are subscribed, so if you'd like to help us continue to grow, please consider subscribing. Thank you, enjoy the audiobook, and remember, you are loved. Preface of Mental Fascination This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea Fiore Mental Fascination by William Walker Atkinson Preface This book is Sidelight Manual Number 1, accompanying my main work entitled The Secret of Mental Magic, and being in the nature of a sequel, supplement, or sidelight thereto. The sidelight manuals, of which this is the first, are designed to bring out the details and special features of several of the lessons of which the secret of mental magic is composed, and to give something in the nature of special instruction regarding the actual operation or workings of the principles referred to in the lessons of my main work. The present manual bears the above-mentioned relation to that lesson in my main work entitled Personal Influence. In order to obviate the repetition of the information contained in my main work, I have been obliged to constantly refer to the latter. This would be inexcusable were the present book offered as a separate and independent work, for it might be justly considered as an effort to force my main work upon the attention of the reader, for the purpose of increasing its sale. But insomuch as the present book is advertised as a sidelight, and its relation to my main work is plainly stated in every notice, and particularly as its sale will be almost exclusively among those who have already purchased and studied my main work, I think I may reasonably ask to be absolved from such suspicion. I think that I have condensed much valuable information within the pages of this book, and I trust that my readers will like the work as well as I do. But be that as it may, I defy anyone to read it without gaining a strong practical realization of the powerful part, for good or ill, that mental fascination is playing in this twentieth century world of ours. And I feel that the majority will agree with me that it is time that this potent influence should be studied, understood, mastered, and its string extracted by such universal knowledge of its principles as will serve to destroy its improper employment. To those who may consider this rather dangerous knowledge to be spread broadcast, I will say that ignorance is no protection. I believe that in all cases the best way to dispel darkness, and all that goes with it, is to turn on the light. And this, then, is the spirit in which this book has been written. May you so receive it. William Walker Atkinson, Chicago, Illinois, USA, May 13th. 1907. End of preface. Recording by Andrea Fiore. Chapter One of Mental Fascination by William Walker Atkinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Andrea Fiore. Chapter One. What is mental fascination? Fascination means the act of fascinating, or state of being fascinated. The word fascinate springs from the Latin word fascinar, meaning to enchant, bewitch, charm by eyes or tongue, captivate, attract, etc. The definition of the English word fascinate is as follows. To act upon by some powerful or irresistible influence, to influence by an irresistible charm, to allure or excite, irresistibly or powerfully, to charm, captivate or attract, powerfully, to influence the imagination, reason or will of another, in an uncontrollable manner, to enchant, captivate or allure, powerfully or irresistibly. The above definition is condensed from a number of the best dictionaries, and gives the cream of the idea embodied in the word. My Definition 
in this manual i shall use the term mental fascination in the sense of the action of a mental force that powerfully influences the imagination desire or will of another this is my own broad definition which includes all the varied phenomena of personal magnetism psychological influence hypnotism mesmerism charming etc etc all of which i hold to be but varying phases of phenomena of one force these things are all a bit of the same piece in spite of the claims to the contrary on the part of those who did not like the relationship the nature of the force what is the nature of the force which produces that which we call mental fascination which latter i have defined as the action of a mental force that powerfully influences the imagination desire or will of another mental fascination is the manifestation what is the nature of the mental force that powerfully influences as you will see in some of the following chapters there have been many theories advanced to account for this force the theories varying from magnetic fluids to mere simple suggestions on the part of the influencing person nearly every writer on the subject has had his own pet theory but although these theories varied and differed greatly the effects produced were about the same which naturally leads us to look for some common basic principle operating under all forms regardless of the many theories advanced by those producing the effects it is the old story here as elsewhere a man finds that he is able to produce certain phenomena by certain methods he works along practical lines for a time endeavoring to perfect his methods and increase the variety and effectiveness of the phenomena when he has advanced along these lines he begins to look around him for a theory to fit the facts of the case and here is where he usually makes his mistake he evolves some fantastic theory which seems to him to account for the effects produced and then he endeavors to fit the facts into the theory if the facts will not so fit in well so much worse for the facts and he either discards the non-conforming facts or else ignores or denies them this has been the course of theorists since the beginning after a while some man of a more scientific mind examines the recorded facts and discovers the true underlying principle and reconciles the differing theories of the original theorists by a new synthesis which combines the true principles in all the other theories discarding the pet hobbies or prejudices of the previous authorities and so it is the case of mental fascination as we shall see the underlying theory i shall not have much to say about theory in this book i have explained the theory and principle underlying mental fascination in my larger book entitled the secret of mental magic of which this little manual is a sidelight in that book i have explained the underlying force beneath all forms of mental magic and mental fascination is one of those forms it is the universal mentative energy of which and in which each individual mind is a center of activity i have also explained that the mentative energy of each individual mind is and may be transmitted from one person to another by means of mentative currents or waves and that these mentative currents and waves tend to induce in the minds of other persons the emotions or feelings existing in the mental states of the person sending out the waves or currents the mental poles i have also explained that there are two mental poles known as the motive and emotive poles respectively which manifest will power and desire force respectively desire force acts in the direction of drawing pulling attracting luring coaxing charming etc while will power acts in the direction of compelling forcing driving impelling commanding demanding etc desire always draws its object toward itself while will always overpowers and compels its object generally in the sense of driving it into action 
in mental fascination both desire force and will power are employed generally in combination desire force has been called the feminine phase of mentative energy and will power the masculine and in this as in everything else the combination of those two qualities produces the most marked results the student will be able to distinguish between the action of these two phases of the force as he reads the pages of this book in which instances of mental fascination are given that is all that i shall have to say about theory in this book except where the various points are brought out in illustrating the examples given i must refer my students to my secret of mental magic for details of theory and principle the present book deals with the how rather than the why End of chapter 1 Recording by Andrea Fiore Chapter 2 of Mental Fascination This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mental Fascination by William Walker Atkinson Chapter 2 Mental Fascination Among the Animals even before the human race was evolved mental fascination was known instinctively to the lower forms of life it is said that the cells in the blood of living things become aware of the presence of each other at distances which must preclude any theory of ordinary sense awareness not only do they recognize or sense the presence of each other but they seem to be attracted toward each other by some force or fascination which must operate along the lines of desire and will eminent scientists inform us that even the atoms manifest an attraction for each other varying in degree according to the nature of the respective atoms and the same authorities tell us that this attracting operates along the lines of a desire for each other and a will which causes them to fly to each other is it not reasonable to suppose that in this instinctive manifestation of attraction and the response to attraction among the atoms there is to be found the elemental principle of mental fascination and are not the phenomena of electrical attraction and magnetic attraction related to the human phenomena by a long series of links in a grand chain the two phases but leaving the above questions without further consideration we may find an abundance of proof among the higher forms of the lower animals among the animals we find many instances of the power of charming or fascinating both of which i hold to be but varying forms of manifestation of mental fascination as i use the term i e the action of a mental force that powerfully influences the imagination desire or will of another this mental fascination among the animals manifests along two lines viz one along the lines of desire operating in the direction of sex manifestation such as the winning of mates etc and two along the lines of will operation in the direction of overcoming the prey of the animal such as the charming of birds by serpents or of the smaller animals by tigers etc these cases are capable of liberal illustration and proof and natural history affords us full authority for accepting the same instances of animal fascination i recently read an account of a naturalist who related that one day in a tropical country he noticed a winged insect circling around and around a scorpion after a bit the insect made a series of desperate plunges at the scorpion as if in a frantic desire to terminate the charm the scorpion soon striking down the insect and afterwards devouring it it is related by travellers that when one comes suddenly in the presence of a lion tiger or leopard his legs seem paralyzed and the eyes of the beast seem to exert a peculiar fascination and power over him i have seen a mouse manifest the same emotion in the presence of a cat and the same is true of a rat in the presence of a ferret or similar enemy on the other hand every observer has noticed the wonderful charming power that animals exert over others of their kind of the opposite sex if you have ever witnessed the courting of a bird during the mating season you will have a keen sense of the reality of the power employed one of the birds and it may be either the male or female will be seen to actually fascinate or charm the one of the opposite sex 
the latter lying still with quivering wings and a helpless expression in its eyes. When compared with the attitude of the same bird, when charmed by a serpent, the resemblance will be striking. Scientific Testimony I have before me a book, written in 1847, which relates quite a number of instances in the operation of mental fascination among the lower animals. I will give you a few of them, condensed and abbreviated. Professor Silliman is quoted as stating that one day, while crossing the Hudson River at Catskill, he passed along a narrow road with the river on one side and a steep bank covered by bushes on the other side. His attention was attracted by the sight of a number of birds of a variety of species who were flying forward and backwards across the road, turning and wheeling in strange gyrations and with noisy chirpings, seemingly centering over a particular point of the road. Upon examination the professor found an enormous black snake, partly coiled and partly erect, showing an appearance of great animation with his eyes flashing like a brilliant diamond and his tongue darting in and out. The snake was the centre of the motion of the birds. The professor adds that although the snake disappeared in the bushes, frightened at the approach of the men, still the birds seemed too dazed to escape, and perched on the nearby bushes evidently awaiting the reappearance of their charmer. THE CHARMING BY SNAKES The same book relates an incident of a man in Pennsylvania who saw a large black snake charming a bird. The bird described gradually decreasing circles around the snake, at the same time uttering piteous cries. It seemed almost ready to drop into the jaws of the snake when the man drove off the latter, when the bird arose with a song of joy. Another case is related of a ground squirrel which was observed running to and fro between a creek and a large tree a few yards distant. The squirrel's fur was badly ruffled and he exhibited fright and distress. Investigation disclosed the head and neck of a rattlesnake protruding from the hole of the tree and pointing directly at the squirrel. The poor squirrel at last gave up the fight and, yielding to the fascination, laid himself down with his head very close to the snake's mouth. The snake then proceeded to swallow the squirrel, when his meal was interrupted with a cut of a carriage whip in the hands of the observer, and the squirrel, released from the spell, ran briskly away. Interesting Instances Dr. Good is quoted as having made quite a study of the curious fascinating power that rattlesnakes manifest over small animals, such as birds, squirrels, and young hares, etc., he relates that these animals seem incapable of drawing their eyes away from those of the snake, and, although seemingly struggling to get away, they still gradually approach the snake, as though urged toward him, or attracted by a power superior to their natural instincts. He goes on to state that the animals creep nearer and nearer, until at last it is drawn into the serpent's mouth, which has been open all the while to receive them. Dr. Barrow is quoted as relating many instances of this kind known to peasants in all parts of the world. Valiant, the African traveller, tells of an instance in which he witnessed a shrike at the very act of being fascinated by a large snake at a distance, the fiery eyes and open mouth of which was gradually approaching the bird, the latter manifesting convulsive trembling and uttering piercing shrieks of distress. The traveller shot the snake, but upon picking up the bird he found it dead, killed either by fear or the power of the serpent, or perhaps by the violent breaking of the spell. He measured the distance between the snake and the bird, and found it to be three and one-half feet. Strange Stories A case is related in one of the early reports of the Philosophical Society, in which a mouse was put in a cage with a viper by way of an experiment. The mouse at first seemed greatly agitated, which state was followed by a condition of fascination, the mouse drawing nearer and nearer to the viper, which remained motionless, with distended jaws and glistening eyes. The mouse, finally, actually entered the jaws of the viper, and was devoured. Bruce, the African traveller, relates that the natives of an interior tribe seem to be protected by nature against the bite of scorpions and vipers. They are said to handle these creatures fearlessly, the latter seeming to be robbed of their power of resistance. He states that the creatures seem to sicken the moment they are touched by the natives, and are sometimes so exhausted by the invisible fascinating power that they perish shortly. He says, I have constantly observed that however lively the viper was before, upon being seized by any of these barbarians, he seemed as if taken with sickness and feebleness, 
and frequently would shut his eyes, and would never turn his mouth toward the arm that held him. Snake Charmer Personally, I have seen a somewhat similar case. When I was a boy in Maryland, I knew of a farmhand who was called a snake charmer. How he did it I could never find out, but he would exert some kind of influence over all kinds of snakes, poisonous ones included, and would cause them to remain fascinated until with a quick movement he would grab them by the neck with his bare hands. This man generally carried a few pet snakes around with him for company. They seemed perfectly contented, and would poke their heads up out of his pocket in order to look at someone else with whom he might be talking. The negroes on the farm had a mortal terror of this man, and would walk a couple of miles rather than pass by his house. FASCINATING FIERCE ANIMALS The power of charming animals, dogs, and wild beasts is undoubtedly possessed by some men in varying degrees, and nearly every one has known of men who could charm the wildest horses as if by magic. I have read of some burglars who seemed able to quiet the most ferocious watchdogs. The Swedish writer, Linda Krantz, tells of certain natives of Lapland who are possessed of some process of charming dogs, to such an extent that they have been known to cow the most savage great hound, causing him to fly from them with all the signs of abject fear. Many of my readers have seen or heard of the horse whisperers, found in various parts of the country, who will shut themselves in a stable with a fierce horse, and by whispering to him will manage to tame him completely and make him passive to their will. Charmed by a snake There are cases recorded in which men, who have been charmed by a snake, have afterwards given in their experience. One of these cases relates that a man was walking in his garden when he suddenly came into the presence of a snake, whose eyes gleamed in a peculiar manner. He found himself fascinated, as if by a spell, and unable to withdraw his eyes from those of the creature. The snake, he stated afterward, seemed to begin to increase immensely in size, and assumed in rapid succession a mixture of brilliant colors. He grew dizzy, and would have fallen in the direction of the snake, had not his wife approached, throwing her arms about him and breaking the spell. Another similar case is related in which a man found his companion standing still on the road with his eyes fixed intently upon those of a large rattlesnake which was regarding him fixedly with gleaming eyes scintillating in its raised head. The man was leaning toward the snake and would have fallen toward it in a few moments. He was crying feebly but piteously, "'He will bite me! He will kill me!' "'Sure he will,' replied his friend. "'Why don't you run away? Why are you staying here?' but the man seemed perfectly dazed and distracted and could not answer. The companion finally picked up a stick and struck at the snake, which glided away savagely. The fascinated man was sick for several hours afterward. A Personal Experience When I was a boy I had somewhat similar experience, although not nearly so serious. Walking one day among a grove of trees belonging to my grandfather, I found myself standing, staring intently at a snake about two feet long, whose eyes glistened like large diamonds. In a moment I ceased to see anything but those awful eyes, which glistened and displayed all the prismatic colors to my frightened glance. It lasted but a moment, however, for the snake glided away seemingly as anxious to get away from me as I was to part company with him. I cannot say whether the spell would have been broken by me if the snake had not moved away. Perhaps it might, or perhaps not. All that I remember now, after the passage of thirty-five years or more, is that I did not seem to feel fear after the first shock, my feeling and emotion seemingly being that of great wonder and amazement arising from what I saw in those eyes. AN ELEMENTAL FORCE But I have said enough regarding the manifestation of mental fascination among the lower animals. There are many interesting instances of this sort, scattered through the pages of books on animal life, and nearly every one who has lived in the woods or among wild life knows of many cases illustrating this fact, which have come under his own observation. I have mentioned these features of the subject merely for the purpose of showing you that we have to deal with a general natural principle which manifests throughout all life. This book has to deal with the manifestation of this force among men, but in closing this chapter, I would ask you to notice the resemblance between the manifestation of the force among the animals, on the one hand, and among mankind, on the other. The animals employ the force for two purposes, i.e., the captivating of mates and the capture of prey. 
and how do men and women use it among similar lines yes i mean this as startling as it may appear for is not the use of fascination in the direction of attracting the opposite sex akin to the sex charming noticed among the birds and animals and is not the use of fascination in the direction of influencing men and women along the lines of business or personal interest akin to the charming of prey by wild animals serpents etc you may see that evolution simply changes the form of use in this and other natural qualities and power the force or power remaining the same under all of the changes and does it not become important for us to understand study and guard ourselves against the employment of such an elemental force as this which manifests along all planes of life from lowest to highest i emphatically answer yes end of chapter two chapter three of mental fascination this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Mental Fascination by William Walker Atkinson Chapter 3 The Story of Mental Fascination The story of mental fascination runs along with the history of the human race, for it has always been known to man in some form. Coming to primitive man along with other inheritances from still lower forms, it was used from the beginning. Its earliest forms were similar to its employment by the lower animals, such as has been mentioned in the preceding chapter. The strong-willed of the race influenced and dominated the weaker-willed ones. Without understanding its laws, the strong-willed barbarians discovered that they possessed a strange power of inducing mental states among their weaker-willed companions, and were thus enabled to work their will upon them. Many of the leaders of barbarian races owe their positions of prominence and leadership to this law of mental induction the magic of the priests but along with the rise of leaders there was manifested a similar rise in power and influence of the priests all races have had their priests and have to-day a priest is a man whose office is that of a mediator between men and their divinities one who claims to represent the supernatural entities in their dealings with men a religious or spiritual middleman, as it were. I use this expression in all seriousness, and with no desire to sneer at the priestly offices, which have played an important part in the history of the race. The priests, not being occupied with warfare or agriculture, and by reason of their support being contributed by the people, found plenty of time to think, a somewhat rare privilege in the early days, and even in these times for that matter, and so there gradually arose among all peoples a priestly caste that possessed the bulk of intelligence of the race these priests soon began to recognize the importance of the mental forces and they studied the underlying principles and laws of operation this of course gave them an additional hold on the people and a power over them there seems to be no doubt but that even in the early days of the race the priestly caste held a very wide knowledge of the laws and practice of mental fascination. Mystic Powers In the heart of Africa today, we find the voodoo men, or conjurers, or medicine men, well versed in the application of mental fascination. It was known among the early American Indians, although their degenerated descendants seem to have lost the knowledge, except in a few instances. The power of the priesthood among primitive races is based almost entirely upon some form of mental fascination and as we see the race ascending in the scale so do we see the priests displaying a broader and fuller knowledge of the subject in question the history of the oriental races show that a full knowledge of the operation of mental fascination has been possessed by them for thousands of years in the pictured stories of the egyptians the traces of which appear in the ruined temples and other buildings we see that they understood the art perfectly. In ancient Persia and Chaldea, the art arose to great heights. In fact, among all of the advanced ancient races of men, we find an important place given to the subject before us. The Ancient Mysteries Among the ancient mysteries, the various ceremonies of the temples of the early races, we see many instances of the use of mental fascination. 
back of the rites and ceremonies was always the same underlying principle of mentative induction. In the early use of the force, its employment was largely along the lines of healing, which phase of the subject does not concern us in this particular manual, although it belongs to the general subject of mental magic. But still we read in the pages of early history of many instances of mental fascination, pure and simple. That which was afterward called mesmerism, hypnotism, etc., was well known to the ancients, and, in fact, some of the recorded results coming down to us from the past have never been equaled by modern experimenters. Some of the feats of the modern Hindu magicians, or fakirs, which will be mentioned in detail as we proceed, have never been equaled by Western hypnotists. The Tale of the Magi As I have stated in Lesson 4 of Mental Magic, the name magnet given to the lodestone or natural magnet was bestowed by the ancients because the observed properties of the lodestone resembled the mental power of the magi, or esoteric priesthood of ancient Persia and Medea. These priests were the magi, or wise men of the East, who had developed wonderful mentative powers and who were known as wonder workers. The word magic comes from the same source. When the attracting power and quality of induction of the lodestone were noticed, it was remarked that the physical phenomena closely resembled the mental phenomena of the magi, and therefore the lodestone was called the Magian stone, or the magic stone, from which sprung the terms magnet and magnetism. As the centuries rolled by, and the Western world had its attention called to the mysterious phenomena of mesmerism, etc., in the eighteenth century the public mind instinctively connected the phenomena with that of magnetism, and the terms animal magnetism, personal magnetism, etc., came into general use. And these terms persist to this day, and we hear the terms very magnetic, lacking magnetism, magnetic personality, etc., etc., as applied to people. And so history worked out an instance of the law of compensation. The magnet, which took its name because its properties resembled the phenomena resulting from the use of mentative influence by the magi, repaid the debt after many centuries and served to give a name to mental manifestations resembling those of the magi in the dim past. The magnet gives back to the modern magi the name it borrowed from the magi of ancient Persia. This is an interesting bit of occult history, little known to the general public. Julius Caesar's Fascination Ancient history is full of instances of the operation of mental fascination among the people of the early days. It is related that Julius Caesar, while quite a young man, fell in with pirates near the Isle of Rhodes who captured his ship and took him prisoner. They held him for several weeks while awaiting the ransom money being raised by his relatives. Plutarch writes that while the young Caesar was a captive of the pirates, he asserted his mastery over them to such an extent that he seemed a ruler rather than a prisoner. When he wished to rest or sleep, he forbade them to make any noise, and they obeyed him without question. He abused them and ordered them around like servants, and they did not seem to disobey him. He did not hesitate to threaten them with death when he regained his liberty, and they did not resent it, and he afterward made good his threat. The Mystic Power of Alcibiades It is related of Alcibiades the Athenian that he once made a bet with some of the young Athenian nobles that he would publicly box the ears of Hipponicus, a venerable and greatly respected citizen. Not only did he bet that he would do this thing, but he also claimed that he would afterward compel the old man to give him his favorite daughter in marriage. The day following, when Hipponicus came out, Alcibiades walked up to him and gave him a resounding box on the ears. The old man seemed dazed and bewildered and retired to his home. A great public outcry arose, and the young man seemed likely to fall a victim to the indignation of the citizens. But the next day Alcibiades went to the home of Hipponicus, and, after making a pretense of bearing his back for punishment, he managed to induce in the old man a feeling of good humor and mirth and obtained his pardon and good will, the latter increasing daily thereafter until finally he grew so devoted to the young man that he offered him the hand of his daughter in marriage, which was accepted. 
any one who is acquainted with the recorded character of the athenians will realize what a wonderful occurrence this was it was a striking exhibition of mental fascination without a question the napoleonic charm all the great generals of history have possessed this quality caesar alexander the great napoleon frederick the great and the modern mystic warrior general gordon all managed their men in a mysterious and wonderful manner so that their troops worshipped them as almost gods and went to their death willingly and joyfully the single instance of napoleon when he returned from elba and confronted the bourbon army drawn up to capture him should satisfy any one of the possession of the greatest fascinating power by this wonderful man you remember that the troops were drawn up confronting napoleon their muskets levelled at his breast in obedience to the command aim napoleon who was on foot marched deliberately toward the troops with measured tread gazing directly into their eyes then the officers shouted fire a single shot would have killed napoleon and would have brought to the man who fired it a fortune from the bourbon king but not a man obeyed the order so completely were they under the spell of napoleon's fascination instead of firing they threw down their guns and ran joyfully toward the corsican shouting vive l'empereur their officers fled and napoleon placing himself at the head of the troops marched on to paris other troops flocked to his standard at each point where he confronted them although they had been sent out to capture or kill him by the time the gate of paris were reached he was at the head of an immense army the fascination manifested by this man was one of the marked instances of its possession of which we have any record and it seems to endure to this day almost a century after his death the very mention of his name makes one's blood tingle modern examples all great leaders of men statesmen orators politicians etc have the power of mental fascination developed to a considerable degree if you have ever come in contact with a man of this sort you will always remember the impression he made upon you every man who knew james g blaine will remember his personal magnetism of which so much was said during his lifetime any one who heard the famous speech of william j bryan at the chicago convention in which he made use of the famous expression thou shalt not press upon the brow of labor the crown of thorns thou shalt not crucify mankind upon the cross of gold needs no further proof of the reality of mental fascination bryan was almost unknown to the majority of the delegates and no thought of nominating him was entertained by them but his magnetism was so great that it swept the convention like a mighty tidal wave carrying all before it and bryan was carried around the hall on the shoulders of the delegates who afterward made him their nominee for president and although defeated twice this man still possesses a wonderful fascination over hundreds of thousands of people in this country who would rally around his standard at any time that he would sound the call henry ward beecher at the great meeting in england manifested the same power the whole meeting was against him and drowned his words by hoots yells and other noises but beecher looked them straight in the eye and gradually cowed them into subjection and then talked to them for two hours and fairly carried the meeting by storm he was but one man facing thousands of other men hostile to him and determined to prevent him from speaking but the single man won by the power of his mental fascination manifesting in the phase of will it was not alone the words in these cases it was the will behind the words the will is an actual living force and is one of the two great phases or poles of mental fascination mesmer and his work coming down to the latter part of the eighteenth century and omitting all reference to the phenomena of mental fascination recorded in the middle ages we reach what may be called the beginning of the revival of the subject among the western peoples i allude to the work of frederick anton mesmer a man who understood far more than he taught but who was regarded as a charlatan and a trickster by the ignorant learned men of his day those who are informed regarding the secret history of mesmer know that he was an occultist of no mean attainments 
who was compelled to cloak his real teachings with popular theories and sensational phenomena in order to gain the attention of the world and also to escape religious persecutions mesmer was born in seventeen thirty four and in seventeen seventy five began his work in vienna by writing and teaching about a mysterious universal fluid which was able to control the wills of people and also cure them of diseases and which could be controlled and operated by man he taught that there was a universal fluid which permeated everything and was capable of receiving and communicating all kinds of motions and impressions this fluid he thought acted immediately upon the nerves in which it is embodied and produced in the human body phenomena similar to that of the lodestone or magnet he called this fluid animal magnetism he taught that this magnetism flowed rapidly from body to body acted at a distance was reflected by a mirror like light etc etc mesmer attracted to himself great attention and great abuse on the one hand he was sneered and scoffed at and also driven out of the church for possessing the power of the devil and witchcraft but on the other hand he gathered around him a body of supporters and students he was investigated by a royal commission and by scientific bodies with varying results the coming of the french revolution interfered with a general interest in the subject for a number of years mesmer's followers adhered to his general lines of theory and practice with unimportant additions or changes the abbe faria in 1814 the abbe faria attracted much interest in paris his theories were different from those of mesmer inasmuch as he claimed that the sleep produced by mesmer and his followers was not the result of any outside force but was caused by the patient himself for a number of years a spirited contest was waged between the two schools of mesmerists and much bad feeling was developed braid and hypnotism then came james braid the manchester surgeon who proceeded to tear down the accepted theories substituting one of his own braid may be called the father of hypnotism the term being first employed in connection with his work his theory was that there was no such thing as animal magnetism but the phenomena obtained by mesmer and his followers were caused by physiological condition brought about by physical means such as fixing the eyes rigidity of the muscles etc braid made some very important contributions to the knowledge on the subject although of course all that he wrote or taught was coloured by his own particular theories braid regarded the hypnotic sleep produced by his methods as the necessary condition and cause of the phenomena of animal magnetism braid's writings brought the subject before the attention of physicians who had up to his time avoided it as unprofessional etc and a series of investigations by medical men in france and germany were begun and have continued up to this time the result of such investigation has been the placing of the subject upon a scientific basis. Libou and Suggestion Dr. Libou, of the school of Nancy, France, first brought into prominence the theory of suggestion, which has since found so many followers. Dr. Burnham, a pupil of Libou in his work, Suggestive Therapeutics, carried his teacher's theories on still further, the theory of suggestion as taught by Libourg and Bernheim was that the cause of the phenomena of mesmerism and animal magnetism, etc., lay in the verbal suggestion or verbal command of the hypnotist to the subject, given and received while the subject was in a deep hypnotic sleep. This hypnotic sleep was considered to be an essential and fundamental prerequisite of the phenomena. It was all sleep, with the teachers, students, and investigators at that day, and the majority of them are still under the spell of the old teachings. Burnham's Mistake As an instance of how near a man may come to a thing and still miss it, I may mention that Burnham has recorded that in rare cases, where the conditions were exceptionally favourable, he could obtain results even when the subject was not asleep. But he missed his opportunity of following up this promising lead, and to the end he proceeded upon the belief and theory that the hypnotic sleep was a necessary precedent to the phenomena obtained he endeavoured to produce the condition of deep sleep or profound hypnosis believing that the same was a necessary condition for suggestibility the very word hypnosis 
arises from the Greek word meaning to lull to sleep. So you can see how deeply this idea of sleep was and is among hypnotists. Remember this always, please. Hypnosis means a condition of sleep. So never use the word in any other way. Mental fascination is not hypnosis, although hypnosis is a form of application of mental fascination. The New School During the past ten years or so there has arisen a new school of investigators of the phenomena of mesmerism, etc. This new school proceeds upon the theory that the hypnotic sleep is merely an incident and that all the phenomena obtained by the earlier authorities is possible without the production of a sleep condition. In other words, sleep is not a necessary condition of suggestibility. This brings a new school of the suggestionists very near to the occult idea of mental fascination, although there are some radical differences as I shall show in a moment. In 1884, Dr. Bermond announced that he had made the discovery that there is a fourth hypnotic state, which he called fascination, which left the subject in full consciousness of his surroundings and remembrance of what had taken place. If Bermond had only had the courage to omit the fetish word hypnotic from his statement, he would have founded a new school, but he didn't. The German Frommann wrote a large book on the subject of fascination, which he defined as hypnotism without the putting to sleep. The Truth About Suggestion Some of the best work along the without sleep hypnotism has been done by American experimenters and investigators, principally physicians, nearly all of whom believe that suggestion is the explanation of the whole thing and that there is no such thing as a passage of mental currents. These suggestionists hold that the subject act upon the command and suggestion and does what he is told, and that that is all there is to it. The suggestible condition to them means a condition in which the subject yields up his whole attention to the operator and thus becomes suggestible the degrees varying with the temperament etc of the subject while the suggestionists believe that suggestion is a whole explanation and cause i hold that it is but one of the methods of producing the effects and that back of suggestion is the induction of the mental state by the suggester as i have stated in my work on mental magic and as i shall bring out in the present manual personal magnetism Along with the new theories of suggestion without sleep, there has arisen a great interest in personal magnetism during the past few years. There has been much written on the subject, some good and some ridiculous, and some between the two extremes. The laws of the subject are being studied by the thinking public. There has been a great revival in the interest in occultism, which, together with the various phases of mental science, theosophy, new thought, and kindred subjects, has attracted the attention of a large portion of the public to the general subject of mental magic and to the special subject of mental fascination in particular and this manual is written in response to the present demand for definite information on the subject i feel sure that i will be able to show you that the law of mentative energy in its operation along the line of mentative currents as stated in my book on mental magic will account for all the phenomena mentioned above in the history of the general subject, as well as many other forms. I believe that I can bring it all under the definition of the action of a mental force that powerfully influences the imagination, desire, or will of another, which is my definition of mental fascination. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of Mental Fascination. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Mental Fascination by William Walker Atkinson. Chapter Four The Reconciliation. In my last chapter, I have shown you the opposing theories of the various schools which have investigated and experimented along the lines of mental fascination under some of its many names. All of these schools obtained results, notwithstanding their varying and diametrically opposite theories, the same kinds of results, remember. And more than this, they all obtained these results in very much the same way, when we come to examine the essence of the procedure, after discarding the forms added to fit in with the particular theories of the practitioner. 
a new synthesis i believe that all the opposing theories of the schools may be reconciled by a new synthesis that of mentative energy with its incidental phenomenon of mentative induction as set forth in my mental magic and further expounded in this little manual of which this chapter is a part i believe that theories so far divergent as mesmer's universal magnetic fluid abby faria's sleep braid's hypnotism bovey dodd's electrobiology Leibolt's suggestion bernheim's suggestion the later suggestion without sleep bremen's fascination and the various other theories advanced since the time of mesmer can be reconciled and harmonized by careful application of the theory of mentative induction as advanced in my work on mental magic and i believe that all the phenomena obtained by any and all of the above schools as well as the phenomena of the ancient fascinators and the phenomena known as personal magnetism charming personal influence magnetic personality etc etc of ancient and modern times may be accounted for by the same theory and so this chapter shall be devoted to the reconciliation of the various old theories with this basic principle of mentative induction mesmer explained let us first examine the real facts underlying mesmer's theory of the universal magnetic fluid mesmer taught that there existed a peculiar subtle fluid magnetic in its nature which was diffused throughout all space which permeated everything and which was capable of receiving and communicating all sorts of motions and impressions he taught that this fluid flowed freely from one body to another acted at a distance and could be reflected by a mirror etc he did not explain what this fluid was except that it produced magnetic effects and must therefore be magnetic in its nature he proved that he could produce effects and he gave out a theory to fit in with the facts and that was within the comprehension of the people of his time now let us apply the idea of universal mentative energy with its incidental phenomenon of mentative induction to mesmer's theory and see how easily the reconciliation is effected the mentative energy like mesmer's fluid is universal is diffused through all space permeates everything like the fluid it apparently passes from body to body and communicates impressions etc but now we know that the energy is transmitted in waves or vibrations which reproduce the original feeling by mentative induction in the second person there is no necessity for the flowing fluid any more than there is for an electric fluid flowing over wires or through the air the fluid idea has been superseded by the wave idea in both physics and metaphysics the nature of the magnetic fluid we may readily see that this magnetic fluid theory of mesmer may be explained by the theory of mentative energy and mentative induction there is no magnetic fluid the energy is mental in nature and operation and the phenomena arising therefrom is mentative also mesmer sought for his answer in physics but we find it in metaphysics the force is not physical it is mental all the phenomena obtained by mesmer and his followers may be accounted for by the theory of mentative energy and mentative induction the mental states of the mesmerist may be communicated to his subject by waves of mentative energy and a corresponding feeling or mental state is induced by meditative induction as we shall see as we proceed the sleep of the mesmerist and hypnotist is merely an induction condition arising from the desire in the mind of the operator accompanied by the suggestion on his part fabria explained the theory of abbe faria that the sleep condition was not the result of any outside force but arose from within the patient himself is also reconciled by the theory of mentative energy and induction of course the sleep arises from within the patient himself but it is induced by the waves of mentative energy of the operator accompanied by his active suggestions braid reconciled braid's theory is also reconciled he held that the phenomenon was of a physical nature rather than a mental and that it was a reflex physical action arising from fixing the eyes rigidity of the muscles etc his hypnotic sleep was undoubtedly heightened by his practice of tiring the eyes and muscles on the same principle that one is tired mentally by unusual exertion of the eyes as in the case of visiting an art gallery museum strange city etc and that the power of resistance is thereby weakened and one is far more likely to then accept suggestions of mentative waves how many of us have felt mentally done out after visiting a museum or after witnessing a long parade or after sitting through a modern circus performance with its three rings going at one time and who does not remember how many foolish things he had done at times when he was too tuckered out to object to the suggestions and influences of those around him a danger signal 
many a girl has gone to her ruin by the subtle suggestions and influence of some male scoundrel directed toward her after an evening of the show or circus or after a day of sight-seeing in a strange city i tell you friends that in such cases the will becomes tired by overuse arising from unaccustomed tasks and it becomes woozy and incapable of resisting the attacks upon it as i have told you in my larger work beware of all suggestions etc when in a tired state make a habit of saying no to attempts to make you commit yourself at such times wait until you feel fresh and strong and the will is able to attend its business for you many a man has said yes to his sorrow to propositions advanced to him when he was tired by the day's work and his will was weak and unable to resist i cannot say this to you too often and have therefore dragged it in again at this place there is a great psychological principle involved in this point and you will do well to fasten it in your memory braid's theory may be reconciled to the idea of mentative energy and induction when we see that his eye fixation and muscular rigidity is merely the means of producing a suggestible condition that is to say a condition in which suggestions are more readily accepted and mentative currents are more readily received in both cases the tired will allowing the outside influence to enter suggestion explained the theories of suggestion are not contrary to those of mentative energy and induction when properly understood the facts of the suggestionists are undoubted but they make the mistake of ignoring the mental states of the suggestionist they think that their effects are produced by suggestion alone and forget the mental state behind the suggestion which is the real motive force if their theories be true why is it that two men using the same words of suggestion upon the same subject produce varying degrees of effect it is because the mental states or dynamic mentation of the two men vary in quality and degree the suggestionist thinks that he is merely directing his suggestion by words etc toward the subject but all the time he is pouring out a current of mentative energy which rapidly induces the desired mental state in the subject the best suggestionists are those who have acquired the suggestive manner which is developed by the exercise of authoritative utterances and commands the physical appearance manner and tones arising from a reflection of the mental state within i have seen this in the case of one of america's most celebrated suggestionists a prominent physician and scientist with whom i was associated in magazine and other work in the years nineteen hundred and o one i have seen the doctor giving the most powerful suggestions at one of his classes or clinics so powerful were the emanations of mentative energy or currents of the same that the members of the class could distinctly feel the same and at times could almost see them and yet the doctor who was wedded to his particular theories of suggestion pure and simple after such a wonderful manifestation would calmly inform his class that it was nothing but suggestion nothing more to it and he believed it but hundreds who attended his classes went away more firmly convinced than ever that there was something more to it and that there was a cause behind his suggestions the theory of suggestion is all right but what lies back of suggestion what gives the suggestion its force of what inner and invisible thing is the suggestion the visible and outward sign mentative energy in harmony harmonized and my theory of mentative energy and induction may be reconciled with the theories of the later suggestionists including those who still adhere to the sleep delusion as well as those who have advanced beyond it and it explains all the phenomena of the ancients with the religious and mystic rites the phenomena of charming fascination personal magnetism personal influence etc is all embraced under the theory advanced in this work and my larger work which preceded it as we proceed with this work we shall see the mentative energy and mentative induction in actual active operation in these various phases of phenomena but i trust that this chapter will have shown you that there is one principle underlying all of the various theories and phenomena and that the facts of mentative energy and the operation of the same in its phenomenal incident of meditative induction are sufficient to include and cover all of the varying manifestations of the force observable under the disguises of the conflicting theories of the various schools and cults there is but one underlying cause and that is mentative energy there is but one underlying law of the operation of this force in the direction of affecting other minds and that law is mentative induction either direct i e by mentative currents or indirect i e by suggestion or as is generally the case by both combined end of chapter four chapter five of mental fascination this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Mental Fascination by William Walker Atkinson. Chapter 5. The Rationale of Fascination. In this chapter, I shall proceed to lay before you the rationale of fascination, that is, an exposition of the principles of its operation. 
while the phenomena of fascination extends over a very wide area or field there is still to be found a certain unity of principle of operation underlying all of the forms and phases from this point of view we may speak of the science of fascination as well as of the philosophy of fascination the fundamental principle the fundamental principle of the operation of the mental phenomena known as fascination is found in the theory of mentative induction as stated in my work on mental magic and which is briefly stated in the first chapter of the present book this theory you will remember holds that each individual mind is a center of mentative energy and that the mentative energy of an individual mind may be and is transmitted from one person to another by means of mentative waves or currents that these mentative waves or currents tend to induce in the minds of other persons the emotions or feelings existing in the mental states of the person sending out the waves or currents in this connection we must also remember that there are two mental poles known as the motive and emotive poles respectively the motive pole manifesting as will power and the emotive pole manifesting as desire force desire force acts in the direction of drawing pulling attracting luring coaxing charming etc while will power acts in the direction of compelling forcing driving impelling commanding demanding etc desire force always draws its object towards itself while will power always overpowers and compels its object generally in the sense of driving it into action mentative induction this mentative induction acts along similar lines to the induction of electricity and magnetism that is it sets up similar states in the object affected and the resemblance is even still further marked when we consider that the phenomena of electricity closely resemble the action of the will inasmuch as both tend to drive outward in the form of an impelling force and that the phenomena of magnetism resemble the action of desire inasmuch as both tend to draw inward in the form of an attracting energy an interesting question in this connection however i would direct the attention of the student to one fact concerning the effect of induced states which some have failed to grasp in my teachings in my work on mental magic the matter may be stated by the inquiry of a student of the last mentioned work who inquires as follows please inform me how it is that an induced mental state reproduces the original mental state of the mentator in the following case a man desires to have another perform a certain act and sends a mentative current which acts by induction on the mind of the second person setting up an induced mental state therein the second person then performs the act desired by the first person now if the induced mental state was the same as the original one would not the second party simply also desire that the first party should do the act just as the first party desired that the second should do it but it does not work so for the second party does not so desire but instead merely desires to do just what the first party desired him to do that is he feels within himself a desire to do that which the first party desires shall be done it seems to me that the induced state is really the opposite of the original state please set me straight on this the answer i am very glad to have the opportunity to set straight my students on this point a careful examination will show that both states are similar for instance a desires that b shall do a certain thing and induces a similar state in b the induced state produces in b a like desire that the things shall be done as he proceeds to do it no opposite action here is there the essence of the desire in both cases is the same namely that the thing shall be done the expression of the feeling of the two persons in the case as one i desire that you shall do and two i desire to do respectively are merely the personal forms of expression and not the essence of the desire or feeling the desire or feeling in its real essence is i desire this thing done and both hold the same desire a holding the original desire or feeling and b the induced desire or feeling think this over a little until you see the point induced will acts in the same way as the above mentioned instance of the action of the induced desire of course in all cases of the action of desire the will is also called into operation in the above cited case it works as follows a feels the desire to have the thing done and so his will is called into operation to concentrate the mentative currents and to project them to a focused point on the mind of b then b feeling the induced desire that the thing shall be done awakens his will and does the thing do you see this also you had better fix this process firmly in your minds for it is the key to the operation of the principle of fascination and other mentative phenomena. making another feel like doing now to get back to the first principle which is that one person may make a second person feel like doing a thing that the first person wishes to have done that is the thing in a nutshell 
and in the degree that the second person so feels like doing the thing so will be the degree of desire and will induced in him and consequently so will be the likelihood of his actually doing it you see the matter of feeling like is at the bottom of it all and this being so it is readily seen that if one is able to induce a state of feeling like in another he has the secret of the control of the other person's actions now this is the basis of mental fascination now let us see how this principle works out in a case of mesmerism or hypnotism so called which after all is but a phase of mental fascination governed by the above mentioned principle i prefer the term mesmerism for several reasons among them being the fact that it is a recognition of mesmer its discoverer or rediscoverer and also the fact that hypnotism means sleep while mesmerism covers the whole phenomena in both its waking or sleep conditions a case of mesmerism well let us suppose a case of mesmerism the mesmerist whom i will call the operator faces the subject the operator assumes a positive state of mind his will power being active and concentrated practice having improved him along these lines the subject naturally assumes a negative mental state opening his emotive mental pole to the influence of the mind or will of the operator and allowing his motive mental pole to remain quiescent or relaxed that is to say he opens his desire mind to the influence of the operator and lets his will remain inactive and relaxed the operator desires and wills that the subject be influenced and the subject agrees consciously or unconsciously to be so influenced one wills and the other is willing which latter paradoxical expression means that he is not willing the operator naturally asserts his positivity while the subject assumes a decided state of negativity one asserts a supremacy of will and the other submits i would call your attention to the fact that there is no physical compulsion or influence in the matter it is all a matter of mentation and both parties fully recognize the reality of the phenomenon the silent conflict the above relative mental state of the two persons is apparent in a greater or lesser degree whenever two persons meet one is always stronger mentatively than the other and a silent conflict ensues from which one or the other emerges a victor and the result is recognized and acquiesced in by both victor and vanquished ordinarily however the distinction is not nearly so marked or great as in the case of a strong mesmerist and his negative subject the latter having probably been trained in negativity by repeated trials and experiments in private and in public for know you that even as positivity may be cultivated developed and strengthened by practice in actual performance so alas may negativity be encouraged developed and made habitual by a continued practice of giving in to the will of another or others it is all a matter of habit positive and negative it will be seen at once that given a subject and operator bearing the stated degrees of relative positivity and negativity the subject will have a tendency to accept and obey the wishes and commands of the operator with a minimum degree of resistance the operator will strongly wish the subject to feel in a certain way and to act upon the feeling to accomplish this result he will concentrate his desire by his will and then direct a combined and focused attack on the mind of the subject he is likely to call suggestion to his aid in the attack for by so doing he is able to obtain an additional advantage for a suggestion as i have stated in my work on mental magic is a physical agent inducing mental states or an outward invisible sign of an inward feeling or mental state which tends to induce a similar feeling in the mind of accepting the suggestion the suggestive command the operator gives the subject in the suggestion by command and in accordance with the phrase of suggestion known as suggestion through obedience see my work on mental magic the subject obeys it must not be forgotten however that the suggestion is merely the outward symbol of the inward mental state of the operator and becomes effective only by reason of this fact the operator throws his intensified desire force and will power into the suggestion and receives an effect along the line of the threefold activity with his will he produces a dual effect i e one he captivates the desire of the subject and induces in it the desired feeling like state two he takes captive the will of the subject and subjugates it to his own and at the same time by his desire he also produces a dual effect i e one he induces a similar desire in the mind of the subject by mentative waves or currents and two he allures or seduces the will of the subject by the strength of his desire the result of this combined attack causes the mind of the subject to act as follows which adds a third dual effect to the operation i e one the subject's desire being induced as stated by the operator acts to influence his own will thus making the latter fall in with the induced desire two the subject's will controlled as stated by the operator acts upon its own desire thus making the latter fall in with the seduced will 
it must be remembered that the three mental operations above mentioned are concurrent that is they act at the same time and exercise joint action and control upon the mind of the subject and neither the operator nor the subject are necessarily conscious of there being three dual actions under way the operator simply desires and wills with or without suggestion while the subject simply feels like as before stated and accepts the suggestion if one is given without recognizing the various mental operations going on to produce the feeling like the detailed explanation may make the operation seem complicated while in reality it appears to both the operator and subject as quite a simple matter indeed the daydream state the above process is the same whether the operator merely produces the simplest result upon the subject or whether he secures the most remarkable and startling exhibitions of the control of one mind by another the principle of operation is the same in all cases with sleep or without sleep it is the same in fact as we shall see the very sleep condition is produced just as are the other effects and its production merely tends to produce a daydream state in the subject and thus makes him act in a daydream like manner with appropriate illusions sleep phenomena are merely one of the side issues of mesmerism when the true principle is understood habit and repetition habit and repetition in our consideration of the operation of mesmerism we must not forget the part that habit and repetition play in the matter for instance the operator may be able to produce only the simplest effects at first trial but at each subsequent trial in which he gains more and more control over the subject and a greater acquiescence and degree of obedience he is able to obtain a still more marked effect if you will read my remarks on the suggestion by repetition in my work on mental magic page 120 you will realize the awful force of repetition in habit as well as the power of repeated statement this psychological fact is like the operation of the wedge admit the thin edge and each additional blow drives it further in this works along the lines of both good and evil remember the wise use it to their own strengthening while the foolish allow it to be their undoing beware of the thin edge of the wedge of undesirable habits of thought and action a psychological law the mesmerist understands well often too well the nature and results of the above-mentioned psychological law he has found out by experience that although it may be difficult to control a subject the first time it will be easier the next and so on and on until perfect control is obtained and knowing this he bends his endeavors to inserting the very thinnest edge of the wedge understanding that in this he has his hardest task before him and alas how many of us know that this same principle is in operation in everyday life although seemingly having nothing to do with mesmerism how many of us are able to regret the day of the entry of the thin edge of the wedge another point to be remembered is that the subject who is under a fair degree of control does not feel as if he were obeying the commands or wishes of the operator alone that is not in the main it is true that he instinctively obeys the command of the suggestion just as a horse quickens his gait when spoken to or a soldier acts quickly in obedience to orders etc etc but the motive for the action or feeling seems to come from within himself to a great degree it has the force and effect of an instinctive action proceeding along subconscious lines he seems to want to do the thing of his own accord this is the dangerous feature this then in a general way is the rationale of mental fascination as shown in its phase of mesmerism and its corresponding exhibitions along less pronounced lines if you will acquaint yourselves with these principles of operation you will have a grasp on the whole subject in our next chapter we shall have a view of the mental states of operator and subject which will throw additional light upon the subject before us end of chapter five chapter six of mental fascination this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by k hand mental fascination by william walker atkinson chapter six impressionability in the last chapter i laid before you an exposition of the principles of the operation of mental fascination particularly in its phases of mesmerism the student who has followed what i have said therein has seen that there must of necessity be a marked difference in the degree of impressionability or receptivity to mental induction manifested by the operator and subject respectively in order that the pronounced phenomena may be manifested but this difference of degree of impressionability is manifested by all men and women between the one extreme point in the scale of impressionability to the other extreme there are many degrees and each person has his or her own degree subject of course to change by development magnetic positivity i would like to quote from my work on mental magic illustrating this last mentioned point 
I have said therein, I do not mean that the degree of magnetic positivity is fixed permanently in either person, for the contrary is the case. One of the persons, who is really the stronger, usually, may be weaker at that particular moment, owing to his will being fatigued, or by reason of his having relaxed his will power, as often is the case. And in such case the defeated one may be the victor at the last encounter, or may even rally his energies a moment later, and thus turn the tables. One may have a strong will in moments of activity, and yet in moments of passivity he may relax it very much. And this is a still more important fact. One may so increase his will power that he will be able to completely dominate those who formerly overmastered and then overawed him. All of us know of instances of this kind in our own personal experience. The two extremes. At the extreme point of mental positivity are the wonderfully strong-willed men who are natural leaders and managers. At the extreme of negative mentative point are those people who are moved by every passing suggestion or mental current with which they may come in contact. Those impressionable people who seem to live in the emotional plane of their being and who are always open to outside influences and are like weathercocks moved by every passing breeze. These people are really the reflection of the thoughts, desires, and wills of others, the last person who catches their attention being the right one to follow. You all know the type, don't you? I do not mean by this that only persons naturally weak-willed may be mesmerized. But I do say that when strong-willed people allow themselves to be mesmerized, they must relax their wills and become passive or negative to the operator, else there will be no result gained. A strong-willed man may voluntarily relax and become negative in order to be mesmerized. I have seen this done in many cases, although I have always urged against it, for I consider it inadvisable for one to surrender his will in this way even for the purpose of scientific investigation. I am sure that I would not do so myself, and therefore I cannot approve of the practice on the part of others. THE ARTISTIC TEMPERAMENT Then again, I have known people of a highly developed artistic temperament, such as actors, poets, artists, writers, and others who possessed strong wills to allow themselves to become very impressionable by reason of their active imaginations. That is to say, they would allow themselves to be so carried away with the idea of being impressed that they would throw themselves into the part of the mesmerized subject and actually mesmerize themselves, although allowing the operator to take the credit. This last explanation will throw light on a phase of phenomena that apparently presents an exception to the rule, but which, when viewed in the light of the above explanation, may be seen to come strictly within the rule of positivity and negativity. A Mesmerist's Trick Public performers of mesmerism, when they meet with an imaginative subject whose will is too strong to subdue, often begin to bend their efforts toward arousing the imagination of the person and thus causing him to become passive and in a subjective condition of acting out the part suggested by the operator. In such cases, there is no conflict of wills, whatever, but on the contrary, the subject wills to act out the part and becomes the partner of the mesmerist instead of his opponent. The subject in such cases mesmerizes himself and voluntarily allows himself to be led by the suggestions of the operator so long as the suggestions are not contrary to the subject's own interests. This actor instinct is very strong in some people, and this self-mesmerism is far more common than people imagine. It is seen on the stage and among speakers and writers. Mesmeric Subjects even many of the best mesmeric subjects who travel around with the professional mesmerists are of this last mentioned class to a certain degree. They are able to throw themselves into the parts and play them well, so long as they are not adversely affected thereby. They are far different beings from the weak-willed, flabby creatures that are so often seen following around after the professional mesmerists. The imaginative professional subject is alive to his own interests, and as a somewhat cynical friend of mine, who had made a close study of the subject, once said, even the most obedient subject of this class would utterly fail to act upon the suggestion of his powerful operator to effect that the subject consent to a reduction of his weekly wages paid by the operator, even though the deep stage of hypnotic sleep be produced. Don't surrender your will. But I consider that even this imaginative class of subjects are unwise in allowing themselves to be guided and governed by the suggestions and commands of any operator, for I believe that even such a habit is injurious to the will. The will is a precious thing and should not be prostituted in this way. I cannot urge this too strongly upon my students. I say to them, surrender your will into no one's keeping. Regard it as a woman should her virtue, and allow no one to take liberties with it. Who can exert fascination? The average person possessing self-confidence and force can and does exert mental fascination over others with whom he comes in contact, although it requires a developed will to become an expert in this line of mental work. Besides this, there is undoubtedly a certain knack and technique about the work, which is acquired by practice, although some seem to have it considerably developed naturally. 
there are geniuses in fascination as well as in art and there are others who have acquired the mastery in both by careful practice and determination the requisite for fascination in considering the qualities that go to make up the person in whom mental fascination is likely to be strongly developed i may mention the following one physical well-being for there is a certain strength about a man or woman in strong robust health that must be taken into consideration it is true that some persons not physically well but unhealthy have exercised strong powers of fascination but this was in spite of their lack of physical health and owing to a strong will which allowed them to master even this obstacle but all else being equal there is a power about a strong healthy vigorous person that makes itself felt two belief in oneself for without this no one manifests positivity believe in your own power and ability and you impress others with the same belief confidence is contagious cultivate the i can and i will three poise for the calm well-poised imperturbable man has an enormous advantage over one lacking these qualities the man who meets any emergency without losing his head has something about him that makes him looked up to as a natural leader he has one of the qualities of positivity cultivate the calm masterful mood four fearlessness for fear is the most negative emotion in the being of man fearlessness is a most positive quality just as fear is the most negative cultivate the i do i dare five concentration for this one pointedness focuses the will power upon the object do one thing at a time and do it with all the power there is in you six fixity of purpose for you must learn to know what you want to do and then stick to it until it is done cultivate the bulldog quality it is needed to those who recognize the need of the above mentioned qualities but who lack them i would recommend the careful study and determined application of the principles of mental architecture as stated in my seventh lesson in my work on mental magic in which the matter is gone into detail with exercises etc nonsense exposed there has been much nonsense written about who make good subjects etc in works upon mesmerism hypnotism etc and many amusing rules for the determination of the degree of impressionability have been given by many writers some say that brunettes are the most impressionable while others assert that blondes yield more readily etc etc but the experienced investigator laughs at such distinctions some consider that women make the best subjects while others assert that men really are more readily influenced my own opinion is that the percentage is about the same in both sexes then again one must remember that the degrees of impressionability are relative for instance a may be positive to b while b may be positive to c and so on to the end of the alphabet and using the same illustration m is negative to l though positive to n do you see this a lie nailed some writers have tried to make people believe that only strong-minded people may be mesmerized and give as proof thereof the fact that idiots and insane people are almost immune from hypnotic and mesmeric influence this is a favorite argument of the professional hypnotists who use it in order to put at ease their subjects or possible subjects who might not wish to appear as weak-minded people the truth is that the reason that the above classes are exempt is because one the idiots have little or no power of attention and are like mere machines and consequently cannot be induced to pay attention long enough to be mesmerized but all advanced students of mental influence know that idiots as well as animals may be influenced by mental vibrations or mental waves etc by treatments two insane people are usually carried away with a fixed idea or delusion and are in fact practically in a state akin to that produced by hypnotic or mesmeric process to a marked degree their minds are centered on the delusion and cannot be taken off of it if the attraction could be removed the patient would no longer be insane and although the sleep condition cannot well be induced in insane patients still the best authorities know that such people often yield to strong suggestions and mental treatments to a certain degree so that the rule does not always hold impressionable people the class of people who yield most readily to the mesmeric influence outside of the subclass of imaginative people mentioned a few pages further back are those who have not manifested their will determination and self-reliance very much people who have led a life in which implicit obedience or reliance upon others have been cultivated these are the people who are the most impressionable they have not used their wills and are more readily ruled by the wills of others or through their emotions as i have said in my larger work the degree of response to suggestion by command is to be observed in the highest degree among those who have always depended upon others for orders or instruction and have not had to use their own wits and resources in life unskilled laborers and the sons of rich men who have had someone to think for them often belong to this class these people seem to want someone else to do their thinking for them even in the smallest event of their lives and are most impressionable along the proper lines then the degree of positivity rises as we consider the people who have had to do things for themselves and who have not depended so much upon others 
positivity is the greatest among people who have had the ordering of others to do or who have had to depend upon their own resources and their own wits in getting through life the men of marked initiative have scarcely a trace of this form of suggestibility initiative you know is a term for doing things without being told using one's own wits and resources and will the above applies equally to the subject of impressionability to mesmeric influence and what does it all mean when it is boiled down just this that the degree of impressionability depends upon the degree of the lack of will development the word will is the keynote and this in spite of all the talk twaddle and nonsense written and spoken by those who are interested in having the people appreciate the wonderful virtue of hypnotism the mob spirit the reason that mobs allow themselves to be influenced is because they surrender their individuality and individual will and allow it to become merged with the wills of others until a mob will is created which represents the average of the crowd the weaker wills diluting the strength of the whole when this mess of mingled and weakened will is properly mixed it remains in a dazed and excited condition until some individual springs to the front some leader of men who has held on to his individual will and impresses his will upon the more negative will of the crowd and the mob accepts his suggestions and follows like sheep or mesmerized subjects and does his bidding until some other leader catches its attention and interest emotionability there is another phase of mentality that has its bearing upon the degree of impressionability i refer to the quality known as emotionability an emotional person is one who more readily throws off the influence of his own will and reason and gives himself up to the play of the emotional side of his nature such a person is more impressionable than one who is not so emotional but whose will is really no stronger the reason is that by his mental habits he has accustomed himself to open up his emotive pole of mentality to outside influences and allowing his motive pole to remain inactive he allows his feelings to rule him instead of ruling his feelings he allows his emotional nature to usurp the throne of his will the latter being relegated to second place and the consequence is that his emotive nature has become more open to unresisted outside influences and impressions and responds more readily to the same it has acquired the impressionable habit do you see this last explanation will throw some light on the fact that certain races of people are far more impressionable than others they are emotional that's all who is an impressionable in the following chapters i shall use the term impressionable as a noun designating a person who is sufficiently impressionable to respond to the influence of a mesmerist or hypnotist to a greater or lesser degree these impressionables are comparatively easily impressed by the mentative force and suggestions of the experimenter along these lines please remember the sense in which i shall use the term later on i shall use the term hyper impressionable as a noun indicating a person excessively or abnormally impressible by mesmeric influence the latter class will be further described in the proper place in the book let me give you a fanciful illustration of the subject of impressionability it will form the subject of our next chapter which will be entitled the fable of the mentative couple it will explain not only the matter of response to the mesmeric influence but will also throw light on the exercise of personal mental influence that is going on around us in everyday life all the time everywhere you will have a much clearer idea of the matter after reading this fable and you will also be much more on your guard because of the lesson taught therein do not fail to read it carefully and seek for the secret contained within its lines end of chapter six Chapter Seven of Mental Fascination. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Mental Fascination by William Walker Atkinson. The Fable of the Mentative Couple. Once upon a time there lived in the land of Mentalvania, in a wonderful building called the Mentative Castle, a man and a woman called the Mentative Couple. They were happy, though married. They lived in harmony because they were useful to one another, and neither was complete without the presence of the other, and neither did his or her best work unless the other was present and assisting well now the man was called volus which is the same as the english name will and the woman was called emotione which in the language of that country meant something like the combination of emotion desire and imagination now the chronicles inform us that these two people had natures entirely different from each other as has been said we are told that volus was of a stern inflexible strong positive nature apt to stick to a thing once begun full of the will to live and vitality 
full of determination and spirit with a strong dash of the let me alone and get out of my way in his makeup with a taste for meeting difficulties and overcoming obstacles with a goodly degree of habit of reaching out and taking hold of what emotione wanted and needed and a powerful lot of self-respect and self-reliance in him he was apt to be firm although his firmness was not the stubbornness of the mule and his general keynote was strength he was a good warrior and defender of his castle but emotione was of an entirely different type temperament and character she was most impressionable imaginative emotional credulous fanciful full of desire curious sympathetic and easily persuaded while volus was all willing and thinking emotione was all feeling volus was a strong character but lacked certain qualities that make for success but these qualities emotione possessed and she supplied the deficiency in volus volus had to figure out everything while emotione had intuition and jumped at a conclusion in a way remarkable to volus who couldn't understand the process at all when he would ask emotione for an explanation she would say lightly oh just because which answer would often provoke profane and irreverent discourse on the part of volus but nevertheless he learned to respect these becauses of emotione and found that they helped him in his business emotione would dream out things and see things a long way ahead and then volus would proceed to put these plans into operation volus couldn't see very far ahead of his nose while emotione could see miles beyond and years ahead and besides this faculty of mental imagery that came in so useful in volus business emotione also possessed a burning and ardent desire for things which she managed to communicate to volus thereby causing him to get out and do things that otherwise he would never have dreamed of doing emotione was like fire and volus like water the water would hold the fire in check but at the same time the fire would heat up the water and the result would be the steam of action and so you see these two this mentative couple formed a fine co-partnership and prospered mightily but alas the tempter entered eden and the attractive stranger meandered in the direction of the mentative castle and when he reached there trouble occurred and this is what happened one day volus was absent from the castle being engaged in some arduous enterprise and consequently the castle was unguarded volus had provided against this by instructing emotione that she was to keep the castle gate closed tight when he was away from home and never to gaze without in his absence for there was some mysterious danger looking without when he was away emotione had faithfully followed the directions of her liege lord although her womanly curiosity was piqued thereat many the time she had heard the strange knockings at the castle gate but she heeded them not and even refrained from looking out of the little peephole in the gate though this last was much against her inclination for she could see no harm in just looking but to return to our tale this particular day when volus was absent from home her curiosity was too much for emotione when she heard the strange knocking at the gate and breaking her rule she ventured to peep without looking down she saw a most attractive stranger with a fascinating smile on his lips he looked almost as strong as volus but he seemed to have a dash of the woman in him besides he had the strength but also the charm that emotione recognized as being part of her own nature ah sighed emotione here is a man who can understand me the fascinating stranger smiled sweetly and looking her in the eyes masterfully asked to be admitted no no replied emotione 
I cannot let you in, for Volus told me not to. Ah, fair lady, said the stranger softly, Volus means all right, but he is rather old fogeyish and behind the times. He does not understand, as do you and I. Pray, let me in. And, like Mother Eve, Emotione took the bait. Well, to make a long story short, when Volus came home, he found that Emotione had subscribed to a set of the Le Vieux Modern Art, a beautiful work issued by the Deluxe Brothers of Fifth Avenue, to be issued in 824 weekly parts, at the nominal price of $5 a part. 739 parts of which were already out and would be delivered shortly. She had also given a number of side orders for manifold wares, which had dazzled her untrained and unguarded fancy. Volos cried to the gods of his lad, but it was too late. The contracts had been signed. But that was but the beginning. Volos did not understand just what was the matter and contented himself with scolding Emotione, whereat she wept bitterly. But the poison went on with its deadly work, and when Volus again was absent from home, the habit reasserted itself, and when the fascinating stranger again called at the castle, he was admitted. And when Volus returned, he found the castle furnished from dungeon to watchtower with costly rugs and furniture, and various other articles bought from Morganstern's popular installment house, at one thousand down and one hundred dollars per week. He also found that the castle had been lightning-rotted from ground to turret on each wing, tower, and annex, and that notes containing a law-proof, judgment-confessed clause had been given in exchange therefor. And then Volla swear by the beard of Mars, the war god that he would have no more of this he would remain at home thereafter and he did but the subtle stranger was on to the game in all of its details and this is how he played it on volus even though the latter remained at home a few days later after volus had determined to remain at home there came a band of mountebanks singing dancing and performing juggling tricks Volos sat on the great stone beside the open castle gate, and his attention was attracted by the sounds and sights. Faster the dancers whirled, louder beat the drums, sweeter grew the singing, more bewildering grew the feats of jugglery, until poor Volos forgot all about the open castle gate. So rapt was he at the strange sights, sounds, dances, and feats of jugglery. Then one of the Montebank gang, who was really the attractive stranger disguised in motley array, slipped unseen past Volos, and in a moment was engaged in eager conversation with the impressionable Emotione. Volos watched the crowd until it moved away, and then entering the castle and closing the gate behind him, he was confronted by Emotione in tears, for she dreaded the coming storm. Alack a day! woe's me she cried i am again in trouble o volus my liege lord i have just ordered from the fascinating stranger who slipped past you at the gate a baby grand south plain automatic liquid air valved radium carburetor harpsichord upon which i may play for you all classes of music ranging from wagner's gotha da Murung to the popular ragtime air entitled kiss you babe Goodbye. With feeling, depth of expression, and soulful understanding, according to the words of the fascinating stranger who took my order. God zooks, ejaculated Volus. Fain would I cry aloud the name of that production of Wagner's just mentioned by thee, and by my halidom, e'en shalt thou soon be singing to me the words of that ragtime melody just quoted by thy false red lips zounds the truth i have been stung again by that fascinating stranger i must gaze no more upon these fleeting scenes of merriment and amazement 
lest I be again decorated with the ass's ears. Aha! Volus is himself again, and the next time the fascinating stranger appears upon the scene, he shall be smitten hip and thigh with my trusty battle-axe, and my snicker sea shall pierce his foul carcass. But alas, even once more was poor Volus deceived and trifled with. Once more was poor Emotione fascinated by the stranger, and it came about in this way. On the day of his last undoing, Volus sat on the open step in front of the narrowly opened castle door. No man shall pass me now, cried he. But fate willed otherwise, for as he sat there, there approached many people who took seat upon the steps before the gate, and engaged Volus in long-heated and wearisome discourses regarding the outlook for the crops, the presidential campaign, the Japanese question, race suicide, the new theology, how old was Anne, the problem of the final outcome of the collision between the irresistible force and the immovable body, the canals on Mars, what Roosevelt will do when his term expires, and many other weighty, interesting, and fascinating topics of general interest. Most agreeable were these visitors, and most considerate of Volus' feelings were they, and although they seemed to differ from him at the beginning of each argument, still they courteously allowed him to convince them, inch by inch, until they finally acknowledged that he was invincible in argument and invulnerable in logic. "'Tis passing strange,' quoth Volus, "'but nevertheless tis true "'that I always find myself on the right side "'of every question, "'and the wonder grows when they all admit it in the end. "'Verily I am developing into a wise guy.'" And pondering thus, he fell sweetly asleep from the rigor of his disputes the flattering attentions shown him, the joys of the victory, and the exceeding amount of attention and interest he had expended, for human nature has its limitations, even in the case of one so strong as Volus. And while he slumbered, the fascinating stranger, who was really the leader of the argumentative visiting committee, crept into the house and unloaded upon Emotione a choice collection of gilt-edged mining stock. Pure gilt, all the way through, in fact. A bunch of flying machine bonds and 5,000 donkey power, vestibuled drawing room, observation car, automobile called the Yellow Peril. And when Volos discovered what had happened, he wept aloud, crying bitterly, Odds, bones! death of a cert am i the baron e z mark and thereupon he sent for the wise man who dwelt in the next barony the wise man came and after hearing the story said my children yours is a sad case but matters may be adjusted without a visit to sioux falls and without the raising of the question of alimony the trouble is as follows. Volus, without emotione, has no desire or incentive to do things. He has no wants to satisfy, and therefore does nothing. He needs emotione to supply the desire, and without her he has no feeling. He is nothing but a hard-shell clam. Therefore, he needs her to supply the feeling, for verily and of a truth, feeling is the spice of life. And without her he has no imagination, and cannot see beyond the end of his nose. And what is life without imagination? God zooks, one might as well be a mummy. And on the other hand, emotione without volus is a consuming fire of desire an unrestrained imagination, an intuitive faculty degenerated into the basest superstition, most deplorable credulity, and the idlest fancy. 
Volus has no desire, emotion, or imagination of his own, and emotioni has no will of her own. Verily, cannot it be seen by all that this couple needs one another the worst way? Each alone is but an incomplete half. United they stand, divided they fall. In union alone is their strength for them. And more than this, each without the other falls a prey to the wiles of some fascinating stranger. We have seen how Emotione was fascinated and controlled by the will of the stranger who gained access to the castle. But I have also seen, by my magic art, that when Volus was away from home on important business, without having Emotione along to keep him straight, he fell a victim to the wiles of the desire and imagination of a fair stranger across the river, and did her bidding, and used his will to perform her tasks, instead of those desired by his own Emotione. Verily art these people quits with one another, and should now begin over again. True it is that harmony will be theirs only when they are together. And this is the secret of the undoing of Emotione. Without the will of Volus to protect her, direct her, and advise her, Emotione allowed her desire, imagination, and emotion to run wild and unrestrained. And so she became so impressionable as to allow herself to be mastered by the will of the stranger, who took advantage of the same, and gathered to himself many choice orders for things. And even when Volus sat by the door watching the players, dancers, and jugglers, his attention was so centered on what he saw that the fascinating stranger slipped through the gate. It was even as if Volus had been absent from home. And again, when Volus allowed himself to become engaged in weighty discourse with the visiting committee, and used up his energy and force in argument and dispute with them, and when he permitted himself to be jollied into a false security by these united brethren of the Blarney Stone, he relaxed his vigilance, and allowed himself to become tired, drowsy, and sleeping, and so fell into a doze at his post, and the stranger again entered and took Emotione's orders for goods. And this, then, is the remedy, as my successor, Lawson of Boston, will say in the centuries to follow. This is the remedy. Each person of this mentative couple must stick close to the other. Volus must have no important business across the river, which will allow Emotione to be without a protector and adviser. And Emotione must stick close to Volus and satisfy her curiosity imagination, emotion, and desire, by setting him to work out things for her, to do things dreamed of by her, to get her things she desires, to express the things felt by her. This is the secret of success, dear mentative couple, mutual work by desire and will, working in unison and harmony, each faithful to the other, each guarding the other from the fascinating strangers that beset each when separated. Now then, children, get to work. And saying this, the wise man vanished from sight. And the moral of this fable of the mentative couple is this, that the mind of every man and woman is a mentative castle, wherein dwells a volus and an emotione. And what happened to the couple in the fable may happen and does happen to many in everyday life. The will strained from home and paying attention to other attractions, leaves the castle unguarded, and the fascinating stranger enters. And again the will has its attention distracted by passing objects of interest, and forgets the castle door. And again the will allows itself to be fatigued, tired, and jollied by useless argument and talk and cogitation at the instigation of the designing fascinating stranger, and the latter slips past the gate. And in each case, inside the gate, is Emotione unprotected, an innocent, true to her own nature, credulous, imaginative, fanciful, desireful, and emotional. Is it any wonder that she orders goods that are not wanted by the family? 
and the remedy of the wise man as given to the mentative couple may be and should be applied to every man and woman in his or her mental castle and this then is the moral of the fable end of chapter seven Chapter 8 of Mental Fascination. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mental Fascination by William Walker Atkinson. Chapter 8 Experimental Fascination. In this work, I shall give the student an idea of the methods of conducting experimental work in that phase of fascination which has been called mental impression, etc., following the lines of the best investigators and experimenters in America and Europe. My reason for so doing is that the student may have a thorough idea of the practical work even though he may not wish to conduct such experiments in person. I think that everyone should be made acquainted with these things as a matter of knowledge, and also for purposes of the self-protection which arises from an understanding of the subject. Startling Phenomena Explained I also desire to satisfy the careful student and investigator that the feats, tests, and phenomena which have heretofore been regarded by the general public as inseparably connected with mesmerism, hypnotism, and sleep conditions may be reproduced without the aid of sleep conditions, and without the hocus-pocus of the public performer. The entire phenomena of mesmerism, hypnotism, etc., may be produced by simple and scientific methods along the line of mental fascination by means of mentative induction, without any attempt to produce sleep as a necessary precedent condition. When this matter is thoroughly understood by the public, the glamour and sensationalism of public mesmeric and hypnotic performances will vanish, and the subject will receive the scientific consideration that it merits. But at the same time, people will begin to realize the mighty power of the mental influence that is capable of producing such startling manifestations in a waking state, and will seek to guard themselves against the abuse of the power. Hypnotic Performances Condemned It should be almost unnecessary for me to add that I have no sympathy with the public performances of that phase of mental impression known as hypnotism, mesmerism, etc., in which subjects are made to go through all sorts of foolish and absurd performances. Outside of my objection to people surrendering their will to another in this way, I feel that such exhibitions are lacking in feeling, good taste, and often indecency. To say the least, it is making horseplay of a scientific phenomenon. I have nothing in sympathy with such manifestations or exhibitions, and shall speak of them in this work only to condemn the methods employed. Scientific Methods In my remarks and instruction, along the line of antific methods, along the lines of the best authorities upon the subject, and in accordance with the rules observed at the best conducted experiments of such authorities, at which experiments I have frequently been present. I wish my students to place themselves in a scientific attitude of mind, just as if they were attending lectures on the subject at some leading university in its scientific course. The subject is a strictly scientific one and should be approached, considered, and investigated only in accordance with the scientific spirit of investigation. It is not a matter of fun or idle amusement. I trust that I have made my position on this point sufficiently clear to all, 
so that there may be no understanding regarding the same. The Importance of the Knowledge I do not advise all of my students to engage in this experimental work, for there is no necessity for them so doing. What I am really trying to do is to acquaint them with the methods used in these experiments and the results obtained. In this way, they may acquire an extended knowledge of the subject, which will enable them to really understand the different phases and prevent them from entertaining erroneous ideas concerning the matter. This knowledge will also enable them to detect any symptoms of an attempt to use this force upon them in everyday life. When a person becomes acquainted with the true inwardness of a thing, so that he recognizes it whenever he sees it, there is little danger of his falling into error regarding it. The knowing of a thing is half the battle of repulsing it. And with this understanding, and with this explanation, I shall now proceed to describe the work in experimental fascination, now being performed by scientific investigators in the colleges and other places in this country and in Europe. Favorable Environments The investigator of experimental fascination soon learns that certain environmental conditions have a marked effect on the degree of success attending his experiments, and, accordingly, he endeavors to surround his experiments with the best conditions possible, as indicated by his experience. A knowledge of these conditions is an important thing for an investigator and experimenter along these lines. Desirable Conditions The investigator finds that he can obtain much better results when his experiments are conducted in a quiet place, the atmosphere of which is conducive to calm, undisturbed, peaceful mental states. This atmosphere affects both operator and subject, allowing the former to concentrate his mind and the latter to give his full attention and to rest in a passive mental state. It is well if the experiments be conducted in a room remote from the street, and as far as possible apart from the rest of the house, so that noises of either cannot well penetrate. The experimenter should also take measures to prevent interruption, for the latter will interfere with his concentration and the subject's attention. Sense Impressions the best experimenters see that their experimenting room is furnished plainly, having no pictures or decorations, etc., calculated to attract the subject's attention. A soft carpet which will deaden the sound of footsteps is advisable. I have seen some experimenters go even so far as to place rubber tips or cushions on the feet of the chairs, tables, etc., in the experimenting room, in order to obviate such noises. The room should be kept at a comfortable temperature, neither too warm nor too cold, as either extreme will make the subject uncomfortable and less able to give his full attention to the experimenter. I have heard of cold rooms, draughts, etc., interfering with the best conducted experiments and every experimenter is aware of the fact that a close, sultry day will interfere seriously with his experiments. Care should be taken to avoid a glare of light in the room. Shades of soft greens or blues are advised, and these same colors should be used in the decoration of the rooms by the experimenter who wishes to obtain the best results. Remember the expression, a dim religious light, and you will get the right idea. Psychological Effects Some experimenters burn a little incense in the room before the experiment is performed, the same having a tendency to quiet the nerves and impart a feeling of restfulness to those in the room. 
you will notice that the conditions that tend to produce the most successful results in these experiments are the same that the ceremonial churches of all races have adopted in their services, etc. This fact needs but bare mention to the thinker. It is well known that soft, quiet religious music will produce a psychological condition in which persons become quite impressionable, and some of the French psychologists have taken advantage of this fact. The whole theory rests upon the production of the feeling of ease in the subject. Consequently, it is scarcely necessary to add that the chairs should be very comfortable and easy. The Room of a Leading Suggestionist I may conclude these remarks upon desirable conditions by quoting from an article for a magazine written by myself about seven years ago under a pseudonym. The article described the experimenting room of a leading American suggestionist and a series of experiments conducted before a class of investigators and students at which I had been present. I think that the description will convey to your minds the ideal conditions for experiments along these lines. I said in the article, the room is well ventilated and lighted, although there is an absence of glare. It is remarkably quiet and free from disturbing sounds and sights. The air of seclusion and remoteness from the scenes without being very marked. The impression grows upon one and reminds him of the interior of some quiet old rural chapel on a summer afternoon, when all around seems to indicate the lack of existence of an outside world, save the occasional breeze faintly fanning the cheek, and some muffled sound seeming to come from some far distant point, and perhaps the droning of some stray bumblebee that had chanced to float in the open door. The semi-religious air is heightened by the dim religious light, and by the voice of the experimenter as he gives the repeated suggestion to the patient, in the same monotonous tone, encouraging and hopeful, and at times reminding one of an earnest prayer. The surroundings, the stillness, the tone of the operator, the reclining position of the patient, all give the strongest suggestion of quiet, calm, peace, ease, and rest freedom from care and worry, relief from pain and trouble, nirvana. The influence of these suggestive surroundings is distinctly felt by the visitor, and he also unconsciously assumes the role of the attendant at the chapel. The writer was told by some of the patients that they soon become totally oblivious of the presence of the class, and are to all intents and purposes alone with the operator, with no other thoughts than the suggestions being made to them. I might add that the suggestions given to the patients at the beginning of the treatment were calculated to increase the desired mental state of rest, calm, and quiet. How to Determine Impressionability the first thing that the experimenter does is to determine the degree of impressionability of the impressionable. There are a number of ways to determine this. One of the methods that have been found the most effective is to have the impressionable partially extend his left hand and arm until an easy position is obtained. Then have him hold the hand with palm downward and then raise or elevate the third finger of that hand, generally known as the ring finger, holding the other finger steady and down on a level with the palm. Then tell him that you will proceed to will that he shall feel a tingling sensation in the finger, which feeling will increase gradually and will then begin to extend up the hand and wrist and then up the arm to the shoulder. 
Tell him that the feeling will be faint at first, but that it will begin to tingle more and more in a few moments, and then it will extend in the manner stated. Then concentrate your own mind on the feeling you desire to produce in him, and will strongly that it be produced. After a moment, ask him whether he does not feel the faint tingling sensation. But note this. Ask him in such a way as to give him the positive suggestion that he does. This way, for instance, you feel the tingling already, don't you? This form of question is really a suggestion, for you state the thing before asking the question. When you say don't you, emphasize the don't, sharply and positively. You will find that the sensation is perceived in a moment or two, in a large percentage of cases, and in many cases the more pronounced results are obtained. The degree of sensation produced determines the degree of impressionability of the person tested. When you conclude the test, in each case, be sure to take the subject's hand, grasping it firmly, and shaking it gently, saying, Your hand is all right now. All right. Emphasizing the words all right, and saying them firmly and positively. Always say these things with an air of conviction and assurance, for there is a great suggestive quality in such tones. Testing a Roomful of People If you are testing a number of people, a roomful, for instance, you should pass rapidly over the number to be tested until you have finished. You may test the whole roomful at one time, as above, if you desire. Do not act as if you were attaching much importance to the test, telling them that you are merely testing them for impressionability, etc. But when you have finished, you will know just the degree of impressionability of each person in the room, and you will thereby be enabled to select the most impressionable for the next test. Impressing the Subject Having selected the desired number of impressionables, pick out one of them and ask him to stand up before you, looking you straight in the eye. See direction for acquiring the magnetic gaze in a later chapter, saying to him, in a quiet but firm, positive tone, words to this effect. Now give me your entire attention. I wish you to fix your attention firmly upon me and what I am saying. For in this way only can the best results be obtained. You must forget everything and everybody else in the room, and must hear only my voice and feel my thoughts. Make yourself perfectly receptive and passive to my thoughts and words. There must seem to be no one else here but you and I. You must see no one else, must hear no other voice, must think no other thoughts but mine. Give me your full attention now, and open yourself to the inflow of my thought. Talk to him a few moments in this strain, and then say, That's right. Now you are giving me your full attention. You are now feeling my thought. All is going well. Etc., etc. In an encouraging tone, in the same spirit as you would to a child who is trying to perform some task under your direction. Inducing relaxation. Instruct him to relax all his muscles to take the tension off of them. Tell him that in so doing he will draw his will away from his muscles, which is just about what really happens. 
if he seems to be slow at grasping the idea, give him a practical illustration of relaxation by lifting one of his hands and then letting it drop. If it does not drop freely, then he has not relaxed. Try him until he learns just what relaxation means. This practice will bring about a state of passivity which will tend toward success in your experiments. Exercises in Relaxation It is of the greatest importance that the subject of the experiments be brought into a passive condition of mind. And the best way to induce this desired condition is to bring about a passive condition of body, for the latter will have a reflex action on the mind, according to well-established laws. The following exercises will aid you to bring about the relaxed condition, preparatory to your psychological experiments. Exercises Instruct the subject to withdraw his will from his right hand, making it perfectly limber, so that he may swing it loosely from his wrist. Then have him so swing it backward and forward. Repeat with the left hand. Then have him impart to the hands a twisting motion, to and fro, from the wrist, of course letting them twist about limply. Then have him withdraw the will from his arms, and then shake and twist them about the shoulder, like a pair of empty coat sleeves. Then lift his arms up above his head, and allow them to fall like a dead weight to his sides. The falling must be occasioned by the weight of the arm, and not aided by his will. His will must be withdrawn entirely. The above exercises may be varied and amplified, as found desirable. Putting Subjects at Ease some of the best experimenters take considerable time in putting at ease the persons who offer themselves as subjects for psychological experiments, and at the same time they bring about the desired state of relaxation. They realize the distaste and fear that anything like hypnotism inspires in the minds of people, owing to the public performances thereof, and they avoid any suggestion of similar conditions. They generally begin by talking of the value of relaxation, and how few people are able to relax their muscles. Then, they illustrate the matter by showing the subjects how few of them are able to relax easily. This leads to the trying of the above-mentioned relaxation exercise, or similar ones, which as you will see in a moment, leads directly to the first real test of mental induction and suggestion, which is known as the falling forward test, which is one of the simplest tests known to the psychological laboratory. From that test to others is merely a matter of successive steps. So the experimenter really begins his work with the process of putting the subject at ease and training him in relaxation. In this connection, I would say that very few people know how to relax, and some teaching is necessary in the majority of cases. The above exercises should be sufficient. The Primary Test After instructing the subject in relaxation, say to him, Now, Look me straight in the eyes, and let my thought act through you. You are feeling an inclination to fall forward. Fall forward. Fall forward toward me. Do not fight it, but yield to it. Yield to it, I say. I will catch you as you fall. Now fall forward toward me slowly. That's it. You are leaning a little now. Come on, come on, come on now, this way, this way, now. 
extend your two hands, one on each side of his head, but a little in front of him, so that he can see the palms of your hands which should face each other. Then, as you repeat the suggestions mentioned above, draw your hands slowly away from him, as if you were drawing him by some physical power. This is a strong suggestion, which will render him more susceptible to your will. The more reality you throw into the acting out this drawing, the more strength you will put into your willing, and the more readily will he obey. USING THE WILL While saying these words, look intently into his eyes, and will that he fall forward. In a moment, he will begin to sway forward a little, and if you keep up the concentrated will and suggestions, he will fall forward toward you. Be ready for him, and catch him with your hands. This test is far more simple than it would seem from reading the description of it, and is capable of being produced in a large percentage of cases, where the persons will allow their minds to become passive to yours. Where there seems to be a resistance, tell the person to hold the thought that he is inclining forward toward you. Some find it easier to feel the falling forward sensation with their eyes closed than with them open. With others, the reverse is true. Reversing the test. After you have succeeded in this experiment, stand behind the person about one yard, and concentrate your gaze upon a point at the base of the skull, that is, where the neck joins the head. Then tell him that he will experience a falling backward sensation, just as he did before in the falling forward test. Be sure to tell him that you will catch him when he falls, etc., in order to reassure him. Use the same tones, etc., as in the falling forward test, except that you will substitute the word backward for forward. In a few moments, you will obtain the same result as in the falling forward. Both of the above experiments are among the easiest tests known to experimenters but they are important inasmuch as they serve to inspire confidence in himself, in the mind of the experimenter, and a passive confidence in the mind of the impressionable. Then it is always well to begin by some easy tests, and then work up by degrees to the more difficult ones, even upon subsequent occasions. The Fastened Palm Test the next test may be as follows. Tell the impressionable to place the palm of his hand upon your own, allowing it to rest there a few moments, withdrawing all of his will from his hand, and leaving it perfectly relaxed and like a dead weight. Then tell him that you are going to fasten his hand to yours by thought. Then, looking him straight in the eyes, say, in a strong, firm, positive tone. Now you can't take your hand away. You can't, I say. Try, but you can't. Try, try, try. You can't, you can't, you can't, I say, etc. Always accent the word can't in these experiments for that is the word you wish to emphasize and drive home in his mind. And you must, of course, accompany your words by the thought, you can't, you must will that he cannot. Remove the impression by saying, all right, now, all right. The Locked Fingers Test Your next test is that of fastening his own hands together. This is accomplished by getting him to lock the fingers of his two hands together, holding them as tight together as he is able to do, using his will actively in so doing. Then say to him, Now do not resist me, but remain as you are. 
Now, you can't unloose your hands. You can't, I say, you can't. Try, but you can't, etc., etc., at the same time, concentrating your gaze and will upon his hands, thus holding them together. It may help you in the beginning to hold his hands together with your own, at the first, and then gradually loosen your own until they are entirely away from his hands, repeating your suggestions meanwhile. Remove the impression as previously instructed. The Clenched Fist Test Your next test may be that of preventing him from unclenching his fist. Proceed as in the last test, telling him to clench his fist together as tight as he can, and then you must say to him, Now you can't unclench it. You can't, I say, etc. It will be some time before he can get his fist unclenched. Remove the impression. Rotating Hands Test The next test may be that of making him rotate his hands. Proceed by telling him to relax his hands, somewhat, but begin to rotate them around each other, in an outward direction. Then say to him, Faster, faster, faster. Faster as fast as you can. Then, when his hands are rotating rapidly, say to him, Now you can't stop them. You can't, I say. Try, but you can't, you can't, etc. And it will be some time before he will be able to stop. Remove the impression by the suggestion. All right. All right. The drawing test. Your next test may be that of drawing him forward or backward toward you. This is accomplished by standing before or behind him, as the case may be, and telling him that he will walk toward you, backward or forward as you wish. The command must be accompanied by the will. Remove the impression akin to the last two tests as follows. 1. Preventing him from stepping out at all. And 2. Preventing him from stepping outside of an imaginary circle that you have drawn on the floor. These tests are of course accompanied by the appropriate suggestions and use of the will. Remove the impression. The chair tests. Similar tests, such as preventing him from sitting down in a chair, or causing him to remain seated in a chair, unable to rise, may be made in the same way. Remove the impression. Other tests. Another common test is that of giving the impressionable a cane, telling him to hold it fast, and then telling him sharply that he cannot throw it down for it is sticking to your hands, etc. Remove the impression. A similar test is preventing him from lifting a light weight, a box, or a chair by your suggestions of you can't, accompanied by the use of your will. Remove the impression. The name test. Some experimenters Try the test of preventing the impressionable from speaking his name by their Kent suggestions. A variation of this is making him say his name is Tom Jones, or some other fictitious name, by the mere strong suggestion of Tom Jones, it's Tom Jones, I say, following upon the sharp question, what's your name? Strange as it may appear, this test is successful in many instances. Remove the impression. The eyelid test. The test of fastening the eyelids is accomplished by having the impressionable fasten his eyelids tight together, 
keeping them in that position for a few moments, when the experimenter says, Now you can't open them. You can't. Try, but you can't. Etc., etc., as above described. Release the impression. Stiffening the arm or leg is accomplished along the same general lines using the appropriate suggestions and will. Remove the impression. The catalepsy test. The catalepsy feat of the professional hypnotists is but an enlargement of the above muscular tests and consists of producing a condition of rigidity all over the body of the subject. I do not advise conducting this test, for accidents have occurred in some cases, and there are other reasons why it is not advisable. I mention it here merely as a matter of scientific interest. Notwithstanding the claims of the hypnotists that this test is capable of being produced only when the subject is in the deep stage of hypnosis, known as a cataleptic stage. All psychologists know that it may be produced in the wide-awake condition, and is merely a muscular test, having nothing whatever to do with the sleep condition. One Underlying Principle You will see that one law governs all of these tests and thousands of others of a similar nature which may occur to the experimenter. It is all a matter of the use of the will and the suggestion of the experimenter, accompanied by the relaxation of the will of the other person. The law of mentative induction is the real cause behind the phenomena. The suggestions render doubly efficient the will power of the experimenter by giving the mind of the impressionable a mental image around which his mental poles materialize an action. Muscular Tests and Beyond The above tests are what are known as muscular tests, all depending upon the control of the muscles of the impressionable, by the will of the experimenter. Many of these tests are believed by the hypnotists and mesmerists to be possible of production only when their subjects are in the sleep condition, or at least only after they have been put to sleep and then aroused. As a matter of fact, sleep conditions have nothing whatever to do with this phenomena, as may be proven by the fact that all of the above tests may be performed without any suggestion of sleep or similar condition. There is a more remarkable class of phenomena than the above mentioned, which will be considered in the next chapter, all of which, also, may be produced without any attempt to induce sleep. This sleep delusion has led people astray for many years, but now it is known that the phenomena of sleep itself is merely an effect of mental impression and suggestion instead of being the cause of the various phenomena known as mesmerism and hypnotism. Removing the Impression Referring to my repeated caution to remove the impression, I wish to call your attention to the fact that the best experimenters lay much stress upon the advisability, if not the absolute necessity, of removing the induced condition from the mind of the person experimented upon. Otherwise, he might carry away with him the induced condition or impression which is often far deeper and stronger than is commonly believed to be the case. I urge this upon you specially. Do not neglect it. The conditions may readily be removed by the suggestion of Now you are all right. All right now you understand. You are now all right, accompanying the suggestion by the mental picture of their being relieved from the induced condition. The gentle touch of the hand, as in patting the part that has been controlled, will help to accentuate 
the effects of suggestion of all right. Removing undesirable conditions. In this connection, it may be as well to mention that if you ever happen to come across an impressionable, or the tendency to manifest a drowsy condition, or the so-called sleep state of hypnotism, probably arising from previous suggestions, either direct from a hypnotist or from having witnessed a hypnotic exhibition, you may proceed to awaken him to the method just given for removing the impression. In such cases, you may make upward passes along the sides of his head, saying to him, sharply and positively, Wake up. Wake up now, I say. Wake up. Wide awake now. You're wide awake. Wide awake. All right now. All right, I say. All right. All right and wide awake. All right. All right. You may heighten the effect by snapping your fingers close to his face and slapping his shoulders sharply. Be sure to speak positively, firmly and sharply. Just as a father would in rousing up a sleepy boy in the morning. And don't lose your head. You are not likely to have need for this advice in ordinary experiments, but I give it in case you happen to come across some impressionable or hyper-impressionable later chapters who may have been previously hypnotized by some operator who believed in the sleep condition and brought same about by suggestion see later chapters or else some subject of the same class who has seen hypnotic subjects go asleep and induce the same state in himself by imitative self-impression in such a case I would advise that you afterwards give the subject a good, sound, suggestive treatment, to the effect that he will never again go to sleep in this way, that he is immune to hypnotic sleep suggestions, and in other ways build up in him a resistance to this deplorable condition. These sleep-conditioned hypnotists have much to answer for, for which their plea of ignorance is not quite sufficient. End of chapter 8。Chapter 9 of Mental Fascination。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mental Fascination by William Walker Atkinson Chapter 9 Experiments in Induced Sensation In the last chapter, we considered instances of tests of experimental fascination along the lines of muscular control. In this chapter, we will consider the phenomena attendant upon induced sensation all of which follows the same law of cause, and is produced in the same manner, and by the same methods as the muscular phenomena. Let us begin our consideration of sense control by the familiar test of the burning hand. The burning hand test. This test is performed in the following manner. You stand before the impressionable, the latter extending his hand toward you, palm downward. You place the first two fingers of your right hand upon the back of his hand, holding them there for a moment, and concentrating your gaze and will upon his hand. Then you say to him, sharply, rapidly, and positively, I am burning your hand. I am burning your hand. It is hot, hot, hot. It is burning, burning, burning you. Burning you, I say. Take it away, quick, I tell you. 
It is burning you, etc., etc. Always emphasizing the words hot and burning. And at the same time, willing that your fingers will feel hot to him. It is surprising how many people will experience the sensation of heat if you perform the test properly and are able to concentrate your will sufficiently well and accompany the same with vivid suggestions. A variation of this test is to give the impressionable a silver coin, telling him to hold it between his thumb and forefinger. Then, after a moment, give him the suggestions of it being hot, hot, hot. It's burning you, burning you, etc. You may even impress upon him the idea that while it is burning him, he is unable to let go of it, etc. Induced Pain Another test of the sense of feeling is that shown by having the impressionable hold out his hand, his arm being extended full length. Then, standing before him, with a pin between the finger and thumb of your right hand, pretend to prick your own hand, jabbing the pin into it, and grimacing as if with pain, at the same time saying to him, You see, you feel the pain of this pin. It hurts you. It hurts you, I say. You feel the pain instead of my feeling it. See, you feel it now. Making a feint of jabbing the pin into your own hand. You feel it, I say, etc. It is remarkable how many persons will take on the pain you are supposed to be feeling. Of course, your imagination should be exercised under the control of your will, so that you will allow yourself to imagine that you feel the pain. I have seen the above experiment tried before a room full of people, and many of the audience shared the induced pain with the impressionable, upon whom the experiment was being tried. Do not forget what I said in the last chapter about taking away the induced condition after the test. In the above cases, rub your finger over the burnt or hurt spot, saying, It's all right now. All right. The pain is all gone. If you do not do so, the impressionable may carry away with him a sensation that his hand had been subjected to heat or pain. Remarkable Phenomena In this connection, it may be proper to call your attention to the fact that the history of the subject shows cases in which burns have actually been produced on the bodies of persons by strong suggestion, coupled with physical aids, for instance, postage stamps have been placed in portions of the body with the suggestion that they were fly blisters, and the blister appeared. You will see that it is all a matter of induced feeling, the more marked results merely evidencing the power of the mind of the individual over the mind in the portions of his body, as I have shown in the chapter entitled Mental Therapeutics, in my work on mental magic. Many other experiments, along the line of sense control, might be mentioned, but they are all but different forms of the same thing. The ingenuity of the experimenter will indicate manifold variations, if he sees fit to follow up the subject. Induced Sense of Smell The sense of smell may be induced by the experimenter suggesting to the impressionable that a bottle contains a liquid smelling like certain perfumes, etc. This may be varied by changing the suggestion so that all the well-known perfumes may be sensed, like the legend of the magic perfume bottle of the wizard, which probably was nothing more than a case of clever induction of the sense of smell by the method mentioned herein. Personal Experiences I have seen a number of cases of this kind in my personal experience, in which large numbers of people were impressed in this way. In one case, 
I was attending a play, the scene of which was laid in the South, and in which one of the characters remarked, Oh, smell the magnolia. How strong is their odor in this heavy, warm night air. And in a moment, the audience noticed a plain odor of magnolias floating over the house. So strong was the impression that many insisted that the management had actually introduced the odor, in order to heighten the effect, but inquiry showed this to be erroneous, for no odor was actually used. More recently, I attended a play, The Girl with the Green Eyes, in which one of the characters was supposed to have committed suicide by turning on the gas, in full sight of the audience. The room was large, and jet after jet of the many chandeliers, bracket lights, etc., were turned on by the woman. In a short time, people in the audience began to sniff, and say, Smell the gas! Until everyone thought they smelled it, and some women felt faint. Of course, the original impression was given by the physical suggestion, but as soon as people took on the impression, it spread like a contagion, by the law of mental induction, until all felt it more or less. THE PROFESSOR'S EXPERIMENT There are cases recorded of the effect being deliberately produced, for instance, the tale of the old German professor, who after telling his class that he would uncork a bottle containing a chemical compound noted for its foul odor, uncorked a bottle of distilled water, possessing no odor at all. The class soon perceived the supposed odor, and row after row of students showed their disgust. The waves of the supposed vapor floated over the room, just as would have been the case if the genuine liquid had been uncorked. Those nearest the platform perceiving it first, and then the next row, and so on, until the whole room was filled with it. Even after the professor explained the nature of the experiment, the class still sniffed away, and many refused to believe the explanation. So strong was the impression. These cases were nothing else than instances of induced sensation of smell, along the lines of mental impression. Induced Sight A sense of sight may be induced in the same way. A common experiment with a very impressionable person is as follows. Tell him to extend his hand, palm down. Then mark a cross on the back of his hand with your forefinger, pressing well into the skin, at the same time saying, See, I have marked a black cross on your hand. On your hand, a black cross. See it there. You see it. There now. Black. Black. A black cross. You see it there, don't you? Etc. And if he be sufficiently impressionable, he will see it. The more that you can imagine the black cross there, the stronger will be his impression of it. If you will call the attention of people to the extraordinary blueness of the sky, they will be very apt to acquiesce, some of them going into raptures over it, although the sky is no bluer than at any other time. It is astonishing how many of these impressions are given and taken in everyday life. Someone thinks the room is very close, and immediately many people begin to feel suffocated and wish the windows raised. Someone suggests a draft, and people begin to shiver. Someone remarks how extremely warm the day is, and people begin to mop their foreheads, and so on, all being bits from the same piece. Induced Hearing the sense of hearing may be induced in the same way. Tell your impressionable that he hears the song of a bird or the whistle of a locomotive, at the same time using your own imagination vigorously and giving the suggestions sufficiently vividly, and he will hear the sounds mentioned. 
you may try this on several people in a room, on an ordinary occasion, by pretending to hear the humming of a bee, or a distant whistle, or some other faint sound such as the distant wail of a child, and a certain percentage of those present, after a moment or two of intent listening, will affirm that they heard the sound. Induced Taste The sense of taste is easily induced. The well-known experiment of suggesting the taste of lemons with the accompanying flow of saliva and taste of acid is a good example. With a good impressionable, you may induce a sense of changing tastes from extreme sweetness to extreme acidity in a simple, tasteless glass of water. It all depends upon the degree of impressionability of the persons tested and the strength of your own imagination and suggestion. It is all a question of induced sensation. The professional hypnotist turns this to good account in his entertainment. Personal Experiments In this connection, I would say that several years ago, when I was devoting much time to experimental work, I cured many cases of tobacco chewing, cigarette habit, etc., by a course of vivid suggestion, accompanied by visualization, manifesting as mental induction. I would create a mental image of the tobacco or cigarettes as having a disgusting taste, a taste that produced a feeling akin to nausea, and then would concentrate my mind and feeling upon the other person, giving him at the same time the most vivid suggestions of disgusting, nauseating, sickening taste, etc., 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 until he would be unable to chew the tobacco or smoke the cigarette. Then by following up the matter by giving him the strongest future impression that he would always remember the sensation of disgusting taste whenever he attempted to chew or smoke, and that the tobacco or cigarette would always induce those feelings in him a cure of the habit would be effected. Sleep condition not necessary. Some practitioners of suggestive therapeutics have met with much success in the treatment of undesirable habits in this way. It is true that many of these practitioners have believed that it was necessary to produce the hypnotic sleep in order to get the results but this is simply because they themselves are self-hypnotized with the sleep delusion. And if they would but throw off their spell and begin to experiment along the other lines, they would see that the same results could be obtained without the slightest attempt to produce sleep. Senses Inhibited Just as the senses may be rendered by induction, so may they be inhibited in the same way. Any of the above experiments with the senses may be reversed at will. Tell your impressionable that he cannot hear a certain sound, smell a certain odor, taste a certain taste, feel a certain sensation, see a certain thing, and if you be sufficiently positive, and he sufficiently impressionable, and if you use your imagination and suggestion sufficiently well, the senses will be inhibited in his mind for the time being. Remarkable Instances In the matter of inhibition of the sense of feeling, some most remarkable results may be obtained. In fact, all of the results along this line, secured by the hypnotists with the aid of the deep sleep, may be obtained without attempt at sleep. I have seen minor operations performed under the influence of induced inhibition of the sense of feeling. I have seen teeth extracted with little or no pain in this way. I have seen nervous patients, unusually sensitive to pain, able to stand dental work with practically no discomfort by means of such inhibition of the sense of feeling. Even the brutal experiments of many of the stage hypnotists, who run needles through hypnotized patients' cheeks without causing pain, 
even these can be duplicated without sleep being induced. Although, I consider such exhibitions deplorable and disgusting, and worthy of the severest condemnation. I merely mention these last to show the power of induced feeling, or inhibition of the same by induction. THE SECRET OF INHIBITION The secret of the inhibition of the senses is that the will is directed to shutting off the attention to the part or organ. If the attention can be removed, or shut off, no pain will be felt. Many persons have practiced on themselves until they can inhibit pain in portions of their body and in inducing the effect in another person, the same methods are used, accompanied by suggestion. Mental Anesthesia It may be of interest to many students to have me make a little more detailed reference to this subject of anesthesia by mental induction. Anesthesia, you know, is an entire or partial loss or absence of feeling or sensation. We generally think of this condition as being brought about only by something like ether, gas, etc. But anything that will tend to inhibit sensation is an anesthetic. The word inhibit, you know, means to check, to hold back, to restrain, etc. And pain and sensation may be inhibited by pure mental impression. Historical Instances History is full of instances of inhibition of pain by strong mental feeling, emotion, ecstasy, etc. Religious fanatics have mutilated themselves barbarously without the feeling of pain. The American Indians, in their wild dances, wound themselves without feeling the pain. In India, the fanatical devotees torture themselves in horrible ways, as a religious rite, and seem entirely callous to pain. People have been burned at the stake, chanting joyful songs, and martyrs have been crunched in the jaws of the wild beasts with laughter and joy fully manifest. All of these instances, and many others of the same kind, show that it is possible for the mind of a person to inhibit pain in himself and the inhibition of pain in a person by another person is merely a calling into play of the same power by means of induction and suggestion. It is not a creation of the power in the person, but merely a calling forth that which is already there. How to inhibit pain in another. The following simple but very effective method is that used in the best psychological laboratories. The impressionable is comfortably seated or placed in a reclining position before the experimenter. Let us suppose that it is wished to inhibit sensation in his arm. In that case, the experimenter will begin to stroke the arm upward from fingertips to shoulder. The effect of this stroking is to restrain the circulation, which latter responds readily to such suggestion, as we shall see a little later on. The experimenter says, Now I am taking the circulation away from your arm, and putting the nerves to rest. You will begin to feel a sensation of coolness and numbness coming over your arm, from fingertips to shoulder. Now you feel it. Your arm is getting numb. Numb, I say, quite numb. Getting numb, getting numb, getting numb, 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 numb. It is now quite numb. You cannot feel pain in it. See, I will prick it with this needle, but you will not feel pain. You can feel the touch, but cannot feel any pain and so on, until complete inhibition is effected. When you first prick with the point of the needle, 
do so but gently, although appearing to do it with force. This will reassure the patient, and will make him relax his resisting will the more. Result of Repetition The above process continued, in the right person, and in the proper manner, will produce wonderful results. In fact, in this way is the inhibition of sensation produced, in order that minor operations may be performed without the use of ether, etc. A little practice for several days renders the effect more marked each time, until the desired degree is obtained. The above method is the most simple, and yet the most effective, known to experimental psychologists, and if persisted in, and performed intelligently, is capable of wonderful development. It should be unnecessary for me to add that the experimenter should keep before his own mind, vividly, the condition he wishes to produce in the patient. He should endeavor to actually see him insensible to pain, and should throw his whole belief and earnestness into the suggestions. More than lip service is necessary. Directing the Circulation In connection with the above experiments, the following is interesting. You may take an impressionable person and increase the circulation in any part of the body, or else inhibit it partially, just as you wish. You may prove this by ordering the circulation back in one arm, and increasing it in another, the result being that one hand will be a ghastly white, and the other a deep red color. Blood may be drawn away from the head in this manner, and headaches thereby relieved. But I must stop this, for I am encroaching upon the subject of mental therapeutics. In this direction of the circulation upward or downward, as the case may be, passes of the hands will prove of great assistance, for this motion is followed by the attention, and an axiom in suggestive therapeutics is that the circulation follows the attention. Downward passes increase the circulation to the limbs. Upward ones inhibit it. I have spoken of the above effects being produced upon the impressionables. I mean by this that such people are the more readily affected. But remember this, that even the strongest-willed man or woman may be affected in this manner, if he or she, by directing this will, actually cooperate in the matter. For instance, the very strength of a man's will may aid in the inhibition of pain by suggestion, because he will be cooperating with the suggester. All the effect comes from the power within in any case, and all the experimenter a suggester does is to call that power into effect. It is akin to driving a team of strong horses or the running of a 1,000-horsepower engine. The power is not in the driver or engineer, but they make the thing go nevertheless. In closing this chapter, let me again impress upon the experimenter the importance of always removing the impression after the experiment. Remember the important final, now you're all right. All right now, all right. In the next chapter, we pass on to the consideration of the phenomena of induced imagination. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of Mental Fascination」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mental Fascination by William Walker Atkinson Chapter 10 The Phenomena of Induced Imagination 
I will now lead you to a consideration of a class of experiments more marked in sensational features than those related in the previous two chapters. These experiments are the ones usually alluded to as the higher hypnotic phenomena, although they are really as distinct from the hypnotic or sleep condition as the ones already considered. Any and all forms of the hypnotic phenomena may be produced without resorting to the methods of the hypnotists so far as producing the sleep condition is concerned. I call this class of phenomena induced imagination. What imagination is? The term imagination, you know, means the power of the mind to create mental images of objects of sense, the power to reconstruct or recombine the materials furnished by experience, memory, or fancy, a mental image formed by the faculty of imagination, etc., etc. The word is derived from the English word image, which in turn has for its root the Latin word imitari, meaning to imitate. Imagination and Fancy the imagination is creative in its nature, and works with the plastic material of the mind. The writers usually make a distinction between what is called imagination proper, on the one hand, and what is called fancy, on the other. By imagination proper is meant the higher forms of activity of the image-creating faculty, such as is manifested in the creation of literature, art, music, philosophical theory, scientific hypothesis, etc. By fancy is meant the lighter forms of the manifestation of the image-creating faculty, such as the ideal fancies and daydreams of people, the arbitrary and capricious imaginings, fantasy, etc. Imagination proper may be considered as a positive phase, and fancy as the negative phase, of the image-creating faculty. Positive Imagination Imagination in its positive phase is a most important faculty of the human being. It lies at the basis of active mental manifestation. One must form a mental image of a thing before he can manifest it in objective form. It is distinctly creative in its nature and really forms the mold in which deeds and actions are cast. It forms the architect's plan, which we use to build our life of actions and deeds. And, mind you this, it is the faculty used in the occult practice known as visualization, which is spoken of in my work on mental magic. Positive imagination is very far from being the fanciful, capricious, light, whimsical thing that many suppose it to be. It is one of the most positive manifestations of the mind. Not only does it proceed, and is necessary to, the performance of objective acts and the producing of material things, but it is also the faculty by which we impress our mental images upon the minds of others by mentative induction, and by the use of desire and will. Positive imagination is the mother of ideas. And idea is but an image formed in the mind. Webster. And the imagination is the faculty in which the image, or idea, is formed and in proportion to the activity of the imagination, so is the strength of the image or idea. And as is the strength of the image or idea, so is the degree of its power to impress itself upon the minds of others. So you see, imagination in its positive phase is a strong, real thing. But it is largely with its negative phase that we shall have to deal with here. The Nature of Mesmeric Control 
all of you who have witnessed an exhibition of mesmerism or hypnotism or else read descriptions of the same have doubtless marveled at the phenomenon of the subject performing all sorts of ridiculous and peculiar actions under the direction of the hypnotist there have been many theories advanced to account for this phenomenon some of them very complicated and labored but i have discarded theory after theory of this kind finding them inadequate to explain the mental processes involved much less the underlying principle i have come to a conclusion arising from my own investigation and experiments which i shall give you here this theory or explanation for it is scarcely a theory does not attempt to go into the what is mind question nor does it attempt to divide or subdivide the mind it merely explains the workings of the mind in this class of phenomena an explanation the explanation just mentioned is as follows i hold that the action of the hypnotic subject may be explained upon the hypothesis that his negative imagination or fancy if you prefer to call it such is acted upon by the suggestions and mentative currents of the operator and an induced state of negative imagination is set up that is to say that in hypnotic phenomena instead of the subject's negative imagination being aroused by his own desire or will or other planes of his mentality such condition is aroused by mentative induction caused by the mentative currents of the operator and aided by suggestion let us see whether this is reasonable induced imagination all of you know that your negative imagination may be aroused by outward persons or things you hear a piece of music and before you know it your fancy is running along paintings all the sorts of pictures in your mind and inducing all sorts of feelings a picture may affect you in the same way a piece of poetry or poem may lift you out of yourself on the wings of fancy a book may carry you along in a world of fantasy and unreality until you forget the actual world around you have you not had this experience and more marked than any of the above mentioned cases is the effect of a perfect stage performance in which the world and characters of the play take such a hold upon you as to seem reality itself and you laugh and cry with the characters in the play you scowl at the villain and tremble at the danger of the heroine you glory in the hero's success and shed tears at the sorrows and trials of the suffering characters and you feel these things in proportion that your negative imagination or fancy is called into activity by induction but remember this the actors poet writer composer or artist created his effect by the exercise of his or her positive imagination while the effect upon you is induced in your negative imagination the first is an act of positive creation while the second is merely a reflection impressed upon your mind by either the suggestion or the mentative energy of the actor in your consideration of the above remember what i have said about suggestion in an earlier chapter suggestion is merely the presentation of the outward symbol of the inner feeling the mistake of the suggestionists the radical school of suggestionists pooh-pooh at the idea of mentative energy having anything to do with the phenomena which we are now considering they claim that suggestion is sufficient to account for it all 
without going deeply into a discussion of this matter, I would ask these gentlemen, why is it that the same words, uttered in the same tone by two different suggestors, produce widely different degrees of effect? Also, what is that peculiar personal force that we feel when certain persons suggest, that is absent in the suggestions of others? My answer is that the difference lies in the degree of feeling called into activity in the mind of the suggester, the degree of mentative energy released by him. And I think that any careful investigator will agree with me in this, if he will open his mind to all the impressions received during his investigations, instead of tying himself to a previously conceived theory. Highly Impressionable Subject Now here is an important feature of this matter of the phenomena which we are considering. The investigator will find that while the conditions mentioned in the two last chapters, the muscular and sense induction, respectively, may be produced in a large percentage of the impressionables, still there are comparatively few of them in which the more startling phases may be induced. Why is this? The answer is that there are a certain number of persons who combine within themselves the negative qualities of the impressionables, combined with a highly developed faculty or fancy, or negative imagination. This combination causes the person possessing it to be an ideal subject for these strange experiments referred to. Such a person is what the French hypnotists call a somnambule, or hypersensitive, by which terms I discard because of their hypnotic association, and I substitute the term hyperimpressionables. I have explained the sense in which I use the term impressionable. The word hyper is a prefix meaning over, above, excessive, abnormally great, etc. The term hyperimpressionables, as I shall use it, means an abnormally impressionable person. This excessive or abnormally great impressionability, as I have said, arises from the combination of a negative will with an excessive faculty of fancy, the latter being a form of negative imagination, remember. So you see that the taint of negativity is all over these persons. A Psychological Combination In order to show that I am correct in this classification, I will call your attention to the fact that an ordinary impressionable, even though his willpower be the weakest, cannot be induced to perform the tests of the hyper-impressionable, if his faculty of fancy be not excessive. And on the other hand, one may take a person of highly developed positive imagination, and our great people in all lines are such, and they are most difficult to influence in this way. In fact, they are constantly affecting and influencing others. The strongest influencers of men belong to this last-mentioned class. So you see, the ideal, hyper-impressionable, may have the combination of negativity and fancy. He is in a class all by himself. Let us examine him. The Hyper-Impressionable in the first place, he is most credulous, superstitious, fanciful, bigoted, and unstable. He is of the class whose fancy is easily aroused and induced, and whose general tendency is toward giving airy nothings a local habitation and a name, and to whom, when shown an egg, the next minute the air is full of feathers. He is also prone to imitation, and is inclined to follow my leader, rather than to strike out a new path for himself. 
he has but little originality and initiative, which are highly developed in the man of strong positive imagination. He resembles the sheep and goose, rather than the eagle or lion. He is always dependent upon others for ideas, information, advice, and often material support. His imagination is negative, that is, has little or no original action, and acts only, and easily, when induced or excited by another's mentality or suggestion. He has no executive ability, and feels easier when he has someone to order him around, and tell him what to do. He is a good copier, mimic, and imitator, and is often quite serviceable in positions where the work is mechanical and a good copier is needed. The mysterious and unusual has a fascination for him akin to the fascination exerted over some birds by a waving bit of colored cloth. He is governed by his emotions rather than his reason. He is excessively fanciful and imaginative, as the term is generally used, and has a decided hysterical tendency, and a disposition to see things, and to feel strangely. He has many strange experiences. He has bought a minimum of self-control, and is apt to fly off readily. He lacks voluntary attention and application, and his mind is apt to go a-wandering. The only time that he can be kept steady is when some positive individual controls and superintends him. The excitable, emotional-colored man who gets religion at every camp meeting only to backslide next week, is an illustration of one class of this type. He takes on the mental states of those around him, readily, and accepts readily a strong, positive suggestion. These are some of his characteristics. The earmarks. There are many of these people in the world, in high and low life. But high or low, there is a strong family resemblance in their mental makeup. The two great characteristics by which they may be distinguished are, as stated, 1. A negative will, and 2. An excessive faculty of fancy. These two combine to manifest a highly marked example of negative imagination. The prize subjects of the hypnotists. Now, the reason that I have gone into the matter of the nature and character of the hyper-impressionable people is this. It is from the ranks of these people that the subjects of the hypnotists are recruited. If you understand the nature of these people, you will understand how the phenomena are produced. Of course, the majority of professional hypnotists deny this, and make great claims that their subjects belong to a class of people having peculiar qualities, owing to ability to concentrate, etc. But every one of them knows in his heart that my above statement is true. Those who have had the opportunity of personal acquaintance with these subjects know that they all come under the above classification, with the exception of those persons known as horses, the name which the professional hypnotists give to people who travel around as professional subjects, and who play their parts just as any other actor does. These horses are trained to go through their parts and also to serve as bellwethers, or leaders of the flock of hyper-impressionables, who are taken from the audience. I know just what I am talking about when I make this statement, notwithstanding the commonly accepted opinion of the uninformed public to the effect that the prize subjects are just the average run of folks. Now, let us attend an imaginary public hypnotic performance, 
in order to form a clear understanding of the matter. End of chapter 10、Chapter、11 of Mental Fascination This is a LibriVox By William Walker Atkinson, Chapter Eleven. An Inquiry into Certain Phenomena. And now for our public hypnotic performance. Take your seats, please. The hypnotic performance. The audience is seated, and the hypnotist appears. He makes a nice little introductory speech. In which he gives the history of hypnotism and mesmerism. He avoids the scientific side of the subject, except such parts of it as serve to arouse the interest of the audience. He points out to the audience that the commonly accepted opinion of the subjects being weak willed, etc., is erroneous, and that so far from this being the fact, No one except persons having will power and the ability to concentrate may be hypnotized. He mentions the time worn tale that idiots and insane people, and very young children, are not amenable to hypnotic influence, and from these things he draws the moral that the ability to be hypnotized is an honor and a proof of one's strong mentality. Rather than otherwise. This, of course, flatters the hyper impressionables, who always flock to a public hypnotic performance, being drawn there by their love of the curious, and the fascination that such exhibitions seem to have for these people. The Call for Subjects The hypnotist then calls for volunteer subjects. The audience does not seem to be in a hurry to respond, although some are found to be fidgeting in their chairs, and a few almost rise from their seats as if to go forward. The hypnotist encourages and commands, Come on, come on now, right up this way, come right up, etc., and the inclination to come forward grows stronger. Then a young man starts forward with a rush, and then another from the other side of the house, then maybe a third or a fourth, and then comes the grand rush. These first people to move forward are usually the paid performers who travel with the hypnotist, and their coming to the front starts up the impressionables and hyper impressionables among the audience, and perhaps a few curiosity seekers. These paid performers act as bellwethers for the flock of human sheep. Testing and Selecting Subjects The volunteer subjects, including the paid ones, are now grouped around the back of the stage in a large semicircle, and then the hypnotist proceeds to test them. He usually starts off by bidding the semicircle gaze at their hands. Or upon some bright object placed in their fingers. After they have quieted down and have been rendered passive and attentive, he calls them one by one to the front and gives them a test for impressionability. He usually begins with the paid subjects, for he knows just what they will do, and their actions have a powerful impression on the others along the lines of imitative suggestion. He usually tries the falling backward and forward test, and perhaps the fastening of the hands, or some other simple muscular test. Those who respond readily to these tests are accepted and instructed to sit down again, while those who fail to respond are told that they are not needed, 
and resumed their places in the audience. The hypnotist must have reasonably sure things to work upon for his success upon producing a quick result, and he cannot afford to devote the time to developing subjects that the experimenter in the laboratory does. Finally, he has weeded the goats from the sheep, the former being retired to the audience, and the latter exalted to places of honor on the stage, having successfully passed their initiation, and now being accepted subjects. THE STORY OF THE PAID SUBJECTS Now, just a moment here about the paid subjects. Some of them are genuine hyper-impressionables, who are fascinated by the mysterious nature of the business, and flattered by the position of prominence given them in the performance, and who travel around with the hypnotist on a small salary and board paid. The horses are different kind of people. They are out for the money alone, and are generally fakirs all the way through. They have trained themselves to stand pain and to allow needles to be thrust through their cheeks and similar rough treatment to be accorded them. They learn to act out their parts with a surprising degree of ability in some cases, and many of them, in time, graduate into the cheaper grade of variety actors, and a few mount even higher up and develop genuine talent as actors. The majority of them, however, belong to the cigarette type of youth, who is out for a good time, and who is glad to play his part in the performance for his board, traveling expenses, cigarette money, a little loose change, and the cheap notoriety of public performance. Some of the more expert of them demand and receive larger salaries as they advance in the scale and a few star performers in the business receive quite good salaries, and earn it, too. These horses often display considerable ability in the line of suggestion, and really lead the volunteer subjects through their acts, the latter obeying the line of least resistance along the general lines of imitative suggestion. These star performers among the horses are often just as expert hypnotists as their employers, and consequently much of the success of the entertainment is due to their efforts. Producing Sleep The next stage of the performance is to induce sleep in the subjects. This is done by first inducing fixation of the eyelids along the lines of muscular control of which I have spoken. Then suggestions of sleep are given by the hypnotist, such as, You are getting drowsy, drowsy, drowsy. Your eyelids are heavy, heavy, heavy as lead. You are falling asleep, falling asleep, etc. And soon the heads of the horses and the hyper-impressionables are nodding. The impressionables who are not affected by the sleep suggestions are sorted out and sent back to the audience, until there is left only the horses and hyper-impressionables, including the paid performers among the latter, as well as those who have volunteered. Then the hypnotist has obtained that what he has tried for. He has a circle of hyper-impressionables and horses who will accept every suggestion that he may give them and be responsive to every demand upon their negative imagination that he may induce in them. The Daydream Condition But are they not really asleep, you may ask? No, they are not asleep. Their condition is one of a drowsy, daydreamy state, such as many of us have felt when lost in reverie, or absent-mindedness. 
they have had the feeling of drowsiness induced in them by the suggestions and influence of the hypnotist, and have had their negative imagination acted upon by him until they are in a state of dazed daydream. They know what is going on about them and realize the illusion which they are acting out, but are so passive that their imagination is partially beyond their own control and is induced and managed by the hypnotist through his positive imagination and his suggestions. It is a queer state. I have talked with many of these people and I think I have measured the mental state existing in them. They are living in two worlds. Their wills are passive, and the negative imagination, or fancy, is most active and under the control of the hypnotist. The Playing Bear Explanation An illustration that I have used in some of my lectures on this subject may give you a clearer idea of the matter. It is as follows. A party of children are playing bear. One of them is the bear, and goes growling, wagging his head, and showing his teeth in a ferocious manner. The other children pretend to be frightened, but after a bit they induce in themselves a feeling of real terror. The assumed becomes almost real to them. Children have very vivid negative imaginations, and often suffer great torture by foolish suggestions of boogeyman, big bear catch you, something will grab you when you go upstairs, etc. An understanding of suggestion would show the folly and criminality of such things. The terror among the children grows more acute, and tears mingle with laughter as they run from the bear. At last, one of the youngest runs with a shriek to its mother and buries its little face in her lap, crying out, Make him go away. Why, that isn't a bear, Mary. That's only Johnny dressed up like one, says the mother, endeavoring to quiet the little one. Yes, I know it is, sobs little Mary, venturing a frightened glance behind her but I'm scared anyhow. Well, that is the condition of the hyper-impressionable who is hypnotized. He knows it's only Johnny, but he is scared anyhow. It is not all a make-believe, as some radical iconoclastic investigators have affirmed. It's half real and half unreal. The hypnotized hyper-impressionable is not a fakir or a willful deceiver. He is a make-believe, whose illusion seems half real, or even more so, although less than half in some cases, the degree of reality varying with the degree of impressionability on the one hand, and the vividness of the negative imagination on the other. Opposing Views Reconciled I have gone into this matter of the mental state of the genuine hypnotic subject rather fully, for the reason that the statements of the two schools of investigators are diametrically opposed to each other on the subject. The old school of mesmerists and hypnotists insists that the subjects are in a true sleep condition and are absolutely oblivious to all that goes around them, outside of their illusions that they are acting out dreams suggested to them. The new school of suggestion, on the other hand, claims that the subjects are wide awake as usual and merely acquiesce in the suggestions made them, just as they would in any other, and are fully conscious of what they are doing and are make-believe all the way through, from beginning to end. I think that my theory or explanation, will supply the reconciliation, or missing link, between these two opposing views, and I believe that it will meet with the approval of many who, like myself, have had the opportunity of examining these people and getting close to the heart of the matter.
it is true that many of these subjects will tell you that they were totally unconscious of what they were doing. But that is because in so doing they are carrying out the suggestions, express or implied, of the hypnotist, who tells them that they are hypnotized and know nothing else. A funny thing about these subjects is that each one of them thinks that he is the only one who was half awake, and that all of his companions were completely under the influence. Remember now, I am now talking of trans conditions, which belong to another phase on the subject, nor am I talking about the horses on the stage, who are fakirs all the way through, although contributing much to the interest and action of the show. My description of the mental state of the subject applies only to the genuine cases of hyper-impressionability in the day-dream state. The Hypnotic Show I shall not take up your time and space by describing the many features of the public hypnotic performance, the barbershop scene, the balloon trip, the baseball game, the hive of bees, the school session, and the thousand of variations shown by the many hypnotic exhibitors and performers, some of whom are artists in their line, and show a wonderful ability in the direction of making their performances interesting and akin to a vaudeville show. Nearly everyone who reads these lines has seen a performance of this sort and will know to what I refer. The principle is the same in all of these acts or performances. The horses and the hyper-impressionables accept the suggestions, and the latter are also impressed by the hypnotist's positive imagination acting upon their negative imagination through mental currents by induction. But even the most startling and complicated experiments are but combinations of the experiments in induced sensation, mentioned in chapter 9 of this book, raised to a superlative degree by means of induced imagination. The experiments I have given you, and others of the same kind, are the building blocks by which the mesmeric structures are built, the style, variety, decoration, and stability, depending upon the art of the operator or manager. There are many books on stage hypnotism that instruct the performer in constructing effective scenes. It is a matter of stage art, rather than of scientific knowledge. The successful hypnotist must be a man of strong suggestive ability, one able to focus his force in his tones, and also of strong, active, positive imagination and thus able to form a clear, vivid mental picture of the scene he wishes to be enacted on the stage before him. By forming this mental picture, and by using his will to project and focus his mentative energy upon the subjects, he is able to induce in them the feelings and daydreams desired. His success as an entertainer, of course, requires ability as an originator of scenes etc., which have nothing whatever to do with his ability as a hypnotist. When both qualities are combined, the man comes to the front as a financial success. While the above has dealt solely with public performances of hypnotism, still the principles called into play in the private psychological experimental work are the same. In the latter, there is no audience to be entertained, and much more time may be devoted to developing a subject and producing interesting phenomena, and the horses are eliminated. End of chapter 11。Chapter 12 of Mental Fascination。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. 
Mental Fascination by William Walker Atkinson The Dangers of Psychism In the preceding chapters, I have gone into the subject of the rationale of mesmerism for the purpose of pointing out to you that the phenomena of mesmerism and hypnotism is not dependent upon sleep conditions, but may be readily produced by mental fascination, pure and simple, without any attempt to bring about the sleep which is publicly associated with the phenomena. I have not only pointed out the general principles underlying the subject, but have given in detail the technique and methods whereby the phenomena may be produced by any experimenter. The methods given therein are the ones in constant use in the leading psychological experimental laboratories of this and other countries, and the results mentioned may be duplicated by any person who will put into operation the principles mentioned. Why the information is imparted. But I wish to state that my primary object in imparting the said information was not that the students of the book must necessarily undertake a series of psychological experiments, but principally that they might understand the power and force of the mental principle known as mental fascination, and see its practical operation in all of its varied phases. I wish them to know the experiments in the psychological laboratory, the performance of the public mesmerist or hypnotist, and the use of mental influence in business and everyday life that we see in operation around us on all sides and at all times, are all phases of the same underlying principle. I wish to show them the oneness, in essence, of all these varying phases of operation of this great mental principle. Certain Phases Mentioned There is one phase of mesmeric or hypnotic phenomena, however, that I have omitted. I shall call your attention to this briefly, that you may know that I have not overlooked the same, and also that you may recognize my reasons for not going into detail regarding this class of phenomena. I allude to the so-called higher phases of mesmeric or hypnotic phenomena, the various forms of the trance condition. The Abnormal Conditions This trance phenomena, whether produced by mesmeric processes or by other means, are abnormal, unhealthy, and undesirable phases of mental condition. I cannot speak too strongly against the encouragement of and instruction in the development, I had almost said the devil opment, of these abnormal states, either by self-practice or by means of hypnotic or mesmeric practices. It is high time that someone should call the attention of the public to the dangers of this so-called psychism. I know positively that this psychism is not the desirable thing that it is supposed to be. I know also that it is very far from true occult development. This psychism, when compared with true occultism, is but as the baleful glare of the moon, as contrasted with the bright, warm, life-giving rays of the sun. This false occultism, which is not occultism at all, but is merely psychism, has deluded many into its fold, and has led its followers on to planes which are akin to mental quagmires and swamps, following the ignis fatuus, or will-o'-the-wisp, of psychism. THE ANTIQUITY OF THE PRACTICES Nearly all races of men have discovered that there are means possible to people whereby they may produce in themselves abnormal conditions known as the trance, and men from the dim past to the present time have seen fit to indulge in these deplorable practices. The means by which these states are obtained are various, the favorite methods being the gazing at a bright object, of fixing the gaze at the root of the nose, staring at the umbilicus, staring at a drop of ink, inhaling vapors, listening to weird music, etc., etc. Much mock occultism, which is really psychism, depends upon these methods for its results, manifestations, and phenomena. The Hindu fakirs and the Arab dervishes indulge freely in these methods and produce results which, while highly esteemed by themselves, are viewed with disgust, horror, and repulsion by true occultists of all lands, including, of course, the real Hindu yogis, the Persian Sufis, both of which last-mentioned bodies of Oriental occultists 
regard these practices as harmful and the phenomena resulting therefrom as bogus and misleading western fallacies and much of the latter-day western psychism is also based upon the same practices and brings about like results in this connection i would say that some of the practices adopted by some of the new thought people belong to this class i have seen methods advised for going into the silence in which the student is advised to focus his gaze on the root of his nose, etc., which is the identical method used by Braid to produce hypnotic conditions, and which is also used by the Hindu fakirs to produce trance conditions. Is it not time that the truth regarding these things should be known? Low states, not high conditions. These self-induced abnormal conditions may also be produced by hypnotic methods, by leading the subject into the deeper stages, which some authorities speak of as if they were highly spiritual, but which are nothing more than the miserable, abnormal, deplorable trance conditions just referred to. These conditions may be produced by hypnotic methods, simply because any mental state may be so produced, and not because of any mystic process, or knowledge, or connection. Let us take another hasty glance at the so-called sleep conditions of hypnotism that we may get a clear idea of the subject. The Sleep Delusion In the first place, there is no real sleep condition. Let us say why this is. Well, to start from a beginning, much of the sleep does not exist at all. In some cases, the subject merely acquiesces in the suggestion that he is asleep, and then he acts out the suggestion just as he would act out any suggestion. He plays out his part, that's all. This phase is far more common than the majority of students of hypnotism are aware of. They hear the subject say that he was asleep and did not remember a thing that was said to him or what he did. But all of this is merely in the line of acquiescence and playing the part, which fact has been positively proven by advanced experimenters. But there are other stages of sleep. The next in order is the daydream state, which I have described as the playing bear phase. Even this is not true sleep, but a condition resembling a daydream. It is in this stage that the majority of instances of hypnotic phenomena are produced. Sometimes the daydream becomes very deep, and the trance condition is almost reached, but still it is not sleep as the word is generally used hypnotic trances deplored next in order come the several stages of the condition which hypnotists speak of as deep sleep conditions but which i state positively are nothing more or less than the well-known trance conditions into which people of all nations and times have plunged themselves by the methods before mentioned the only difference is that the operator induces the condition by mental influence and suggestion just as he would induce any other mental state, instead of the subject inducing it in himself. It is the same old abnormal, harmful practice in another guise, and anything that is said against the self-induced condition is equally applicable to the operator-induced one. They are the same thing. Well-meaning practices I shall not describe the conditions at further length, nor shall I give any instruction in the production of them. I consider them essentially harmful, and my object in speaking of them here is to warn off and caution anyone from allowing themselves to be placed in this condition by experimenters. The practice is weakening to the will, for the reason that it depends upon tiring out the will by straining the eyes or other organs of sense. Practitioners of mental influence in all ages have recognized this fact and have employed objects calculated to tire out the will. Bright objects to stare at and thus tire out the sense of sight have been employed. Monotonous sounds ending in mmm are used in the Orientals to tire out the sense of hearing by its monotonous and soothing sound. Vapors and perfumes and incense are used to overcome the sense of smell all tending to tire out the will and to reduce it to a passive, non-resisting stage. Then when the will has been rendered passive or tired, the mind becomes receptive and impressionable, 
and in extreme cases becomes as wax in the hands of the operator. Remember these things, students, and you will see this principle called into operation many times in unexpected places. Beware of the methods that tend to drug the will. Psychism like a poisonous cobra. Let me urge upon you to avoid psychism. Put it away from you as you would a poisonous cobra, for it seeks to strike at the heart of your will and would thus paralyze your mentality. Beware of all that tends to make you weak. Beware of the claims of soul development or spiritual unfoldment that are accompanied by these methods, for they are but psychism masquerading as occultism or spiritual philosophy. Remember my test. Does this make me strong? Apply the touchstone, and then govern yourself accordingly. This is a word to the wise. Heed it. The Proof Concluding this part of the subject, I would say that if any of you are disposed to question the correctness of my above statement, then you have but to examine the types of psychics seen on all sides. Are they not all hyper-impressionable, excessively sensitive, neurotic, hysterical, passive, negative people? Do they not become as mere psychic harps upon which the passing mental breezes play, producing weird sounds? Remember now, I am speaking of genuine psychics, not the bogus psychics, who are out for the money, and who are a shrewd, cunning lot, far from being impressionable, and in reality using their mesmeric power to impress and influence the credulous persons coming under their influence. I am not alluding to these people, but to the poor, frail-willed, negative sensitives, who are as impressionable as the photographer's negative, and to whom also the development means but the bringing out of impressions from outside. I pray you, be a human positive, not a human negative. End of chapter 12「Chapter Thirteen of Mental Fascination. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Knight. www.sandranight.net. Oriental Fascination. At this point, I wish to call your attention to a feature of the subject that has received but scant attention at the hands of Western writers. I allude to the wonderful manifestations of mental fascination displayed by some of the magicians of the Orient, particularly of India and Persia. These feats are being performed today in those lands and are equal to any of the wonderful instances related of the ancient Persian and Egyptian magicians mental fascination in the east without going into an extended consideration of the subject in question i will mention a few of the recorded instances of mental fascination among the oriental people in order to give you an idea of the degree of power possible to an adept in the practice of mental influence one writer describes an exhibition of this kind in india witnessed by himself the writer was a profound skeptic who believed that it was all hanky-panky along the lines of sleight of hand or similar methods, that is, he so believed until he actually witnessed the demonstration. He goes on to relate that the magician was a native Hindu of dignified and imposing appearance, surrounded by a number of assistants of his own race. The Serpent Feet The magician seated himself on the ground, with several jars, boxes, implements, and other paraphernalia before him. He opened the seance by the production of a number of tiny snakes, which he lifted from one of the boxes, and placed on the ground before him, in full sight of the audience, after allowing the latter to examine the serpents, and thereby satisfy themselves regarding their reality. An English naturalist present identified the snakes as belonging to a well-known native variety, the magician then began a slow, mournful, droning, monotonous song, the predominant sound of which was um, 
like the droning of a bumblebee or a distant sawmill the snakes reared themselves up and moved their heads from side to side at the sound of the chant the magician touching them softly with his wand from time to time to the eyes of the audience the snakes seemed to gradually grow from their original tiny proportions until finally they appeared as immense boa constrictors which caused great alarm among the audience both englishmen and native the magician bade the audience remain quiet and assured them that there was no danger then he reversed the process and the snakes were seen to gradually decrease in size until they vanished from sight altogether the vanishing hindu the next act was equally as wonderful the magician placed one of his assistants in the center of a circle described on the sand and with appropriate gestures and ceremony went through some magical incantation the boy was then seen to spin around faster and faster like a large top and then began to gradually ascend in the air still spinning around until he vanished from sight then the magician reversed the process and brought him down from the aerial heights the boy appearing like a small speck at first gradually growing larger as he neared the earth until he stood before the audience bowing and smiling the mango feet the next act was the placing of some mango seeds in the sand building a tiny hillock around them the magician then began his chant and waved his hands over the hillock in a moment a tiny shoot was seen to appear and then a little bush which gradually grew up until a mature mango tree was seen bearing leaves the blossoms were seen and the ripe fruit appeared which was passed among the audience then reversing the process the tree disappeared gradually and at the end the magician dug up the original seeds and showed them to his audience and wonderful to relate the fruit that had been distributed among the people also disappeared the rope feet the concluding act was as startling as those preceding it the magician produced a coil of real rope which was passed around for examination then he knotted one end of it and then tossed the knot into the air the rope rapidly uncoiled itself and the knot was seen away up in the air and still ascending when the rope was completely uncoiled and the end left dangling on the ground as if supported by some hook holding the knotted end hundreds of feet in the air one of the assistants approached the rope and took hold of it at a shout from the magician he began climbing rapidly up the rope and in a short time disappeared from view after appearing as a tiny speck in the air then at another word from the magician the rope itself flew up in the air and vanished from sight the test and explanation this concluded the performance but here is a remarkable sequel an englishman present took a snapshot with a pocket camera just as the boy began to climb the rope when the negative was developed there was no trace of rope boy or anything else appertaining to the manifestation even the magician was absent from the center of the scene and was shown on the plate as sitting down on one side with an amused smile on his face this fact demonstrated that which similar tests have also proven i e that the facts were not really performed at all but were simply illusions produced by impressions upon the minds of the audience in fact they were examples of mental magic along the phase of mental fascination and arising from concentrated will and visualization of mental images transmitted by mentative currents and acting by mentative induction i shall give you another proof of this in a moment or two after i have related a few more instances of this wonderful manifestation of mental influence a wonderful man another writer a correspondent of an american paper relates that he was once on a steamer plying up one of the rivers in india when at a stopping place there scrambled up the side as nimbly as a monkey a native hindu clad only in a loin cloth and having a tight rolled red bundle fastened at the back of his neck to keep it safe from the water while swimming from shore there was nothing about the man to distinguish him from the ordinary fakirs but he soon showed his quality 
his startling feats passing along the deck he picked up a ball of thin rope which was lying there and unwinding an end he knotted it and tossed the knot up in the air where it ascended rapidly unwinding the ball until the whole of the rope disappeared in the air just as in the instance previously related then passing a sailor who was holding in his hand a broken coconut shell containing the liquid or water of the nut he lifted the shell from his hand and holding it high up over a ship's bucket standing nearby he emptied the liquid until it filled the bucket and repeated the process upon another bucket and so on until twelve buckets had been filled from the half coconut shell then he picked up one of the buckets filled with the liquid and holding it in his hand he caused it to gradually shrink until it completely disappeared then a moment later he exhibited a tiny speck in his hand which gradually grew until it was again the bucket of water filled to the brim with the liquid which he then poured out on the deck a strange occurrence witnessing the strange performance was a young mother with her babe beside her and a young nurse girl several feet away to her horror the mother then beheld the nurse girl rising a few feet in the air and moving rapidly toward the babe reaching down for the infant as she glided over it and then rising high into the air with the child clasped in her arms until both were lost in the clouds the mother burst into frantic cries and shrieks and gazed upward and as she gazed she saw a fleecy cloud appear which gradually took the shape of the nurse girl who grew larger and larger as she descended until she finally reached the deck again and handed the babe to the rejoiced mother the mother after clasping her babe close to her bosom cried out how dare you take my child away when to her surprise the girl answered why ma'am the baby has been asleep all the time and i have not touched him and then the fakir smiled and said mem sahib has been dreaming strange things it was merely an instance of mental impression of a remarkable degree of power produced by the will and mental imagery of the fakir and his previous feats were also so performed wonders upon wonders but this was only the beginning the fakir then untied his red bundle and extracting therefrom a coconut he exhibited it to the passengers passing it around for inspection then placing the nut on the end of a bamboo stick and balancing it there he commanded it in hindi to spout as a fountain and immediately a great jet of water sprang from it falling over the deck in great showers he then caused it to stop flowing and it obeyed then he restarted it this he repeated several times then he materialized a cobra from the air and caused it to disappear at his command after he had terrified the passengers with it then he materialized several human forms in broad sunlight in full view of the passengers and afterwards caused them to melt away gradually until they disappeared like a cloud of steam then taking up a collection which was quite liberal he jumped over the side and swam rapidly to shore the real secret the natives among the ship's passengers smiled at the wonder of the europeans present and laughed at the latter's talk of jugglery or magic power informing them that it was merely an instance of hindu mesmerism or mental influence and that those among them who resisted the spell saw nothing of the phenomena except the fakir with glistening eyes and every evidence of a powerful and concentrated exercise of his will these feats are quite common in some parts of india but they are known to be but mental illusions for all attempts to catch the exhibition on photographic plates have failed the plate showing nothing but the magician in a state of mental concentration these magicians have developed the power of causing many persons at the same time to have the illusion of seeing hearing tasting and smelling things that have no material existence it is induced mental imagery in a developed degree but differs only in degree from the phenomena more familiar to the western world testimony of a hindu sage in this connection i would like to add the testimony and explanation given to me personally by a greatly esteemed friend of mine a hindu sage traveling in this country who in addition to his oriental learning has received the highest english education 
and who is a highly educated man in both the eastern and western meanings of the terms this gentleman told me that when a youth he had witnessed exhibitions of the kind just related in his native land at first he was puzzled and mystified by them but his naturally scientific turn of mind caused him to seek for the solution he began experimenting and soon at least was able to classify the phenomena as pure mental illusion he found that the crowd would gather close around the magician in order to see what was going on although all were required to keep a certain number of yards away from the wonder worker by the latter's instructions and requirements my friend found that if he retreated a few yards beyond the outer edge of the crowd he could see nothing but the magician all the material doings disappearing when he would join the crowd the mystic appearances were again plainly seen he tried the experiment in several ways with the same result then he tried a riskier one and pushed nearer to the magician than was allowable and with the same result in short the influence was confined to a certain area and the mental influence was doubtless increased by the contagion of the different minds in the crowd my friend tested the well-known mango feet and the rope disappearing feet as related in these pages in this way and was determined that they came well under the rule of mental illusion instead of being an occurrence defying the established laws of nature the testimony of this gentleman corroborated the opinion that i had already formed to that effect which opinion agrees with that of the best authorities an erroneous western idea in closing this chapter i wish to point out to the students of the work an erroneous idea that has crept into some of the western works along the lines of hypnotism etc and which i shall now mention and explain the hindu magicians or mesmerists frequently sit in a squatting position during their enchantments droning a monotonous soothing chant as has been described and at the same time moving the body from the waist upward in a circling twisting motion from the hips at the same time fixing their gaze firmly upon their audience this motion and twisting is merely an accompaniment to the droning chant akin to the motions of the oriental dancers who twist their bodies in a similar manner in rhythm to the music the motion is merely a custom among these people and has nothing to do with the production of the phenomena as all hindu occultists know and will tell you in fact the higher magicians among the hindus do nothing of the sort but maintain a dignified calm standing position or the firm yogi seat in which the body is evenly and firmly poised in a position of dignified rest the hands resting on the lap the back of one hand in the palm of the other a foolish idea all native hindus understand the above matter but western visitors jump at the conclusion that this gyrating circling of the body from the hips has something to do with the power manifested and as i have said some of the western works on the subject have gone into considerable detail regarding this wonderful oriental hypnotism which they assert is accomplished because of this twisting of the body they might just as well point out some physical trick of motion of each leading western hypnotist and assert that the motion was the secret of his power i do not think that further comment is necessary in this case the motions and attitudes etc are merely part of the setting of the piece or possibly bits of stage business designed to heighten the impression of mystery that's all oriental methods of developing power i've been informed by an authority whose word is entitled to the greatest respect and who has spent many years in india and other oriental countries that the following method is used by these oriental magicians in developing within themselves the power to create these strong mental images in the minds of those witnessing their performances the magician starts when a youth and practices mental imagery in his own mind this process is akin to visualization as mentioned by me in my work on mental magic 
the magician at first uses his will in an endeavor to form a clear and distinct mental image of some familiar object a rose for instance he practices until he is able to actually see the thing before him in his mind's eye just as certain eminent painters have acquired the faculty of visualizing the faces of persons they meet so that they can reproduce them on canvas without further sittings superlative sense induction attained then the magician experiments upon larger objects and then upon groups of objects and so on to more complex pictures after years of constant experimentation and practice a few of those undertaking the work find themselves able to picture any of the scenes described in this chapter as feats that is they are able to clearly picture them in their own minds and this being accomplished the magician is able by his highly developed concentrated will to project the mental image into the mind of those around him it is the sense induction described by me in this work only raised to a much higher degree of manifestation oriental versus occidental the people of the west will not devote the time and attention to the cultivation of such faculties while the oriental will willingly give up half of his life for the attainment but on the other hand the western man will devote his time to the acquirement of will power and concentration in the direction of becoming a ruler of men and a general of finance each to his taste and temperament and neither would trade places or power with the other they are both dealing with the same force however as little as they realize it end of chapter thirteen oriental fascination recording by sandra knight www.sandranight.net chapter fourteen of mental fascination this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mental Fascination by William Walker Atkinson. Chapter 14 Future Impression. Now I wish to call to your attention to what may be called future impression, or, as the hypnotists call it, post hypnotism etc future impressions are like seeds planted in the mind which grow blossom and bear fruit at some future time the hypnotists produce this phenomena by giving the subject while in the hypnotic sleep the suggestion that at a certain time either in a few minutes or hours or days he will do certain things or feel certain things but the newer school of psychologists have discovered that these future impressions may be made in the ordinary receptive state just as is the case with any of the other forms of mental impressions and the result will be the same as that obtained by the hypnotist in spite of their theories and methods the general principles i do not propose going into detail regarding this class of phenomena because all that is necessary to be said can be comprised in the following two statements one that generally speaking all the phenomena of the ordinary immediate mental impression may be produced as future impression and two that all the phenomena of future impression produced by the operator on the subject may be likewise produced by auto impression of the subject that is by the subject inducing impressions in himself how future impressions are given in the first of the above stated principles the subject is merely told that you will do so and so at such and such a time instead of do so and so now for instance instead of telling the impressionable that the chair is burning him now you may tell him that in two minutes he will feel the chair burning him the result will be similar in both cases apply the same principle to any of the mesmeric phenomena mentioned in previous chapters and the result will be similar the force of the impression the degree of impressionability etc will play the same part in both immediate impression and future impression this principle is called into operation by suggestionists in treating for habits the suggestions being given along the lines of every time you pick up a cigar you will feel nauseated and will think of a disgusting barroom spittoon etc etc 
it is always a case of you will in future impression instances from everyday life many foolish suggestions are given in everyday life along the lines of future impression and alas many of them are accepted carelessly owing to a lack of knowledge of the principle how many times has it been said to an impressionable young bride never mind you'll grow tired of him after a while etc or to a man wait until the novelty wears off and you'll see how sick of the job you'll get or you'll lose your interest and enthusiasm by and by or you'll find him out after a while and will see that he's not what he seems and so on you may add to these instances from your own experience and too often these suggestions are recalled and have a tendency to cause the person to make them come true. Many fortune tellers prophecies have been made come true in this way by impressionable and ignorant people. I have given you a key to this principle now. Heed the lesson. If you feel that an attempt at future impression is being made on you, headed off with a mental, no, I won't. That is the antidote for the bane. Remember this, it may save you trouble some day. The Secret of Future Auto-Impressions The second principle in the statement made several paragraphs further back, i.e., that all the phenomena of future impressions may be duplicated by auto-impression, or impressions made by one's self, is true and worthy of consideration. You make up your mind that you must awaken to catch a train at four tomorrow morning, and you awaken in time. You have set your mental alarm clock. If you have an engagement at three this afternoon, you may set your alarm as follows, talking to yourself, of course. Now see here, remember that you must see Smith at three this afternoon. Three, three, I say. Remember now, three, I say. And if you impress it sufficiently, strong upon your mind, a little before three, you will begin to feel uneasy, and then suddenly your Smith engagement will pop into your mind from your subconscious region, and you will reach out for your hat and overcoat. Mental alarm clock, remember. That tells the whole tale. The mental alarm clock. You see, the experimenter giving future impressions simply sets the mental alarm clock, going along impressionable lines. He makes the mental impression and attaches it to the mental alarm clock. When the alarm goes off, the impression emerges into the field of consciousness and acts just as if it had been freshly made. That's the whole story in plain, homely terms. Self-protection. But don't be frightened, you timid people. Remember this, that you will not accept a future impression unless you would also accept a present impression. The degree of impressionability is the same in both cases. The only reason a future impression has the advantage over a present one is that it is more subtle and people are not as much on guard about future things as they are about things to be done right now. You will resent an impression that you do this thing right now. While you pay but little attention to the earnest impression that in a year from now you will feel so and so about this matter and dismiss the subject with a shrug of the shoulders instead of saying at least mentally no i won't the present impression is apt to attract your attention the more forcibly because it is more apparent while the future impression is more insinuating but now that you know the facts of the matter you may laugh at them both and take the sting out of them by your little no i won't how to kill out old adverse impressions and just one word more if you feel that you are harboring any future impressions made on you in the past, but upon which the alarm has not yet gone off, you may kill them by direct self-impression or auto-suggestions to the contrary. That is, you may say, I will not act upon any adverse impressions that may have been made to me. I will them out of my mind. I kill them this moment by the power of my will and at the same time make a mental picture of the impression being obliterated by the action of your will, just as the chalk mark is erased from the blackboard by the passing over of it of the eraser. Try this plan and be free. Some of you will thank me for this. Mark my words. End of chapter 14. Future Impression. Recording by Sandra Knight. www.sandranight.net
Chapter Fifteen of Mental Fascination. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Knight. www.sandranight.net. Mental Fascination by William Walker Atkinson. Chapter Fifteen. Establishing a Mentative Center. We now approach that part of this work in which each individual student is called upon to decide for himself whether or not he wishes to take his place in the world as a live, active center of mentative energy, or whether he wishes to remain a negative, passive, half-alive center. No matter which plan you may choose, you cannot avoid being a center of some kind. The question for you to decide is, what kind of a center do I wish to become? Each individual a center. I have explained in my work on mental magic, and again in the first chapter of the present work, that each individual is a center of life, energy, and force in the great ocean of universal mentative energy. Each individual is a center around which revolves his own world, be that world great or small. The principle is the same in all cases, and each man's world is largely what he makes it, what he attracts to himself, from the time that the child begins to assert the I in him he begins to create for himself his world. He draws this person and thing, and repels that person or thing, in accordance with his mental nature, and he is constantly changing his little world according to the growth of his nature. Mental world building. In view of this law of life, does it not become of importance to us to begin to build our mental world with care and with the best possible material? Should we not begin to make ourselves active centers of energy that we may have the necessary power to build strongly and well? Should we not develop within us our powers of attraction that we may draw to us the things, persons, and circumstances that are conducive to our well-being and content? Should we not develop the will-power within us in order to exert that force which is necessary to push our way through the tangled underbrush of life and make a wide path for ourselves? Answer these questions as you will. I have answered them for myself, and you must do the same for yourselves. The Important Decision and so I shall proceed with this work with the understanding that you have answered my questions in the affirmative and have decided to create an active mentative center for yourself. If you have decided in the negative, you might as well close this book, for from now on the instruction will be along the lines above indicated. The Dual Force let us pause for a moment and see what forces are combined in this active mentative center. In the first place, we see that the dual aspect of the mental energy manifests itself always. That which we have called the desire force and that which we have called the will power appear as the two mentative poles. You know this well, for you have studied my main work on mental magic, wherein this point is brought out and illustrated. But here is an aspect of the matter that I did not take the time to bring out at great length in the said book. I allude to the resemblance of the two phases of mentative energy, i.e., desire, force, and will, power, to the physical phenomena of magnetism and electricity, respectively. Physical Laws in the Mental World Desire force, like magnetism, manifests in a drawing, pulling, attracting power, while will power, like electricity, manifests in a pushing, compelling, driving power. Desire force, like magnetism, tends to draw things inward and to itself, while will power, like electricity, tends to drive things outward and away from itself. This dual manifestation of energy is seen all through nature in all of its manifold forms and conditions. There is ever the drawing in to a center, and there is ever the pushing outward from the center. And this law manifests upon the mental plane as well as upon the physical plane. Mental Electromagnetism We have heard much of people being magnetic, 
that is having the power to attract persons to them but that is merely one phase of the operation of mentative energy we do not hear so much about people being electric and yet the term is just as proper and applicable as the term magnetic electric people are the people in whom will power is strongly developed and manifest these people get after others and make them do things they are the active energetic forceful men and women who get behind things and push them along all great leaders possess this phase of energy to a marked degree the mere mention of the matter to you will cause you to think of instances of people who possess mentative electricity there are men who are able to make the crowd around them do their bidding they are able to work their will upon the mass of people these men are seen to possess a strange power but very few understand it it is entirely different from the fascinating alluring charming attractive personality of the magnetic man for it forces and compels by sheer forces of character and will instead of drawing and attracting you will see why i have spoken of these two phases of masculine and feminine respectively when you consider their different manner of manifestation the electromagnetic individual but while both of these forms of power the magnetic and the electric have their strong points and advantages i hold that the highly developed individual must have both of these phases developed highly in short instead of being merely a very magnetic individual on the one hand or a very electric individual on the other hand the ideal man must be an electromagnetic individual in other words he must have both sides of his mentative energy highly developed and in full operation in this way he is able to manifest a combined influence which will make him a very giant of mentative energy from theory to practice now i have said enough about the theory of the thing i shall ask you to read over what i have said above several times in fact reread it until you thoroughly understand it and then i shall take you on to the practical work and exercises calculated to develop in you the qualities mentioned taking it for granted that you have carefully considered what i have just said i shall ask you to perform the following exercises etc first exercise for realizing the center exercise one in order to realize the reality of the statement that you are a center of mentative power you must first enter into a realization of the existence of a great ocean of mentative energy itself do not pass over this lightly for it is most important you must begin to create a mental picture of the universe as a great ocean of living energy vibrating with life and force and power endeavor to make this mental picture so clear that you can see it with your mind's eye and until it becomes a reality to you picture yourself as alone in the universe and surrounded on all sides with a vibrating pulsating sea of energy or power see that all power is locked up in that ocean and that the ocean exists everywhere cut out from your mental field all other persons things or conditions imagine yourself as alone in the great ocean of power you must practice frequently upon this mental picture until you are able to visualize it distinctly this does not mean that you have to actually see it just as you do this printed page but that you should be able to actually feel it. you will begin to understand just what i mean after you have practiced this a little this great ocean of universal power must become real to you and you must practice until it does so become the importance of the exercise the importance of the above exercise may be understood when i tell you that it will be impossible for you to manifest more than a moderate degree of power until you are able to realize yourself as a real center and it will be impossible for you to realize yourself as such a center until you realize the existence of the ocean of power itself for how can you think of yourself as a center of power in an ocean of power until you realize the existence of the ocean itself the universal ocean of mentative energy contains within itself all the power 
force and energy that there is it is the source from which all forms of energy arise it is filled with an infinite number of tiny centers of energy of which you are one and in the degree that you draw upon it for strength so will you receive strength by all means endeavor to clearly visualize the great mentative ocean for it is the source of all the force with which you are filled and which you hope to acquire enter into this great realization friends for it is the first step to power second exercise for realizing the center exercise two the second exercise which will tend to increase your vibration as a center of force is as follows picture yourself clearly as a center of force in the mentative ocean while seeing the ocean on all sides of you you must see yourself as the center of it do not be frightened at this idea for it is based on the truth the highest occult teaching informs us that the great mentative ocean has its center everywhere and its circumference nowhere that is that being infinite in space there is no finite spot that is really its center and yet on the other hand every point of activity may be called its center being extended in every direction infinitely its circumference is non-existence therefore you are entitled and justified in considering yourself as a center of the ocean of power each individual is such a center and each has his world circling and revolving around him some have a small world and some have mighty ones there are centers so mighty and exalted that the human mind cannot grasp their importance but even the tiniest point of activity is a center in itself so hesitate not but begin to form a mental picture of yourself as a center of power a focal point of force practice this exercise until you can clearly feel yourself as a center of power you must learn to think of yourself as a focal point of force in the great mentative ocean just as the great body of electricity manifests itself in tiny points of activity so does the mentative energy so express itself in you who are a point of activity within itself in urging you to perfect yourself in this realization i would impress upon you the fact known to all advanced occultists that in the measure of your realization of this real nature of the ego will be the measure of the power possessed by you all of the strong men of our times and of all ages had this realization intuitively or instinctively that is although they did not know the philosophy or science of the matter they still felt and feel this sense of the power of the ego in themselves which gives them the confidence to do things and the will power and desire force to carry out their undertakings it is this feeling of inherent strength that makes men strong and successful and positive and this feeling and realization may be developed and unfolded within any one providing he wants it sufficiently hard by the exercise of your desire and will you may build up this realization of power and in the building up there will come to you a constantly increasing stream of desire and will in the measure of your expression will be the measure of your impression from the source of all positive impression third exercise for realizing the center exercise three the third exercise consists in the realization of the nature of the force this force energy or power with which you are being filled and which you are now attracting toward your center consists of the electrical manifestation of will power and the magnetic manifestation of desire force these two constitute the dual phases of the one force and therefore you must begin to realize that these qualities are within you in order that you may be able to express the same and thus gain the addition and increased force that comes to those who express the same 
you must begin to realize that you have a will which is capable of impressing itself on the things persons and circumstances of your world and you must begin to realize that you have a desire which attracts to you the things people and circumstances of your world and which in fact draws to you the very material form which your world is made when you realize this dual force within you it will begin to express itself automatically the act of realization causes the mental machinery to begin to work smoothly and effectively therefore picture to yourself this dual force within you see yourself as influencing and acting upon the world around you see yourself as a power in the land and also see yourself as an attracting force drawing to you that which you need and want and require consciously and unconsciously picture yourself as an electromagnetic individual you are an individual because you are a center of power you are electromagnetic because you possess the electric will and the magnetic desire a strong statement carry with you this thought constantly and repeat it often to yourself and you will find it a source of strength you will find the strength pouring into you when you say or think it when you feel weak or when you feel the need of additional strength use this statement of strength i am a living electromagnet and when you say it or think it you must picture to yourself just what you mean by the statement hence the importance of knowing just what is meant do not pass over this statement of strength as unimportant but try it in actual practice and you will soon see what a battery of strength it will be for you and those around you will soon become aware of a new sense of power within you don't lean on others don't let others lean on you keep this statement to yourself do not invite the ridicule of those around you by telling them the source of your strength do not bother about them if they are individuals themselves they will understand without being told and if they are not why all the telling in the world would not make it clear to them hoe your own row and mind your own business and let them do the same no one can build up his individuality except from within and each must work out his own salvation and climb the ladder of attainment for himself and the sooner that people learn this the better will it be for all don't be a leaner or a leaning post don't lean on anyone else and don't let anyone lean on you live your own life and let others live theirs there's been too much of this fool business about living other people's lives for them or letting other people live your life for you each man or woman must grow into an individual by his or her own work and life there is no such thing as vicarious individuality don't be afraid to assert the i to claim your rightful heritage and birthright to be an individual and not a parasite and don't be afraid to shake off and trim off the parasitic persons that have encumbered your own unfoldment toward individuality let the parasites take root in the earth just as you have done let them fasten their roots in the great body of strength and power instead of in the mental body of someone else let them stop their second-hand nourishment and learn to draw from the first source this is the only way and the lack of the knowledge of it is filling the world with weaklings instead of with individuals therefore think of these things hold them well in mind when you make your statement of strength i am a living electromagnet end of chapter fifteen recording by sandra knight chapter sixteen of mental fascination this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by sandra knight www sandranight dot net mental fascination by william walker atkinson chapter sixteen personal atmosphere the mentative force emanating from each individual creates a mental atmosphere around him which often extends a considerable distance from his body especially in the case of strong individuals whose mental atmosphere is felt when they enter a room or public place 
persons whose personality is weaker have a mental atmosphere extending only a few inches from their bodies and which is scarcely perceptible to those coming in contact with them the positive aura the man of positive individuality our man who feels himself to be a living electromagnet carries with him an aura of mental atmosphere of positive strength which is plainly felt by those coming in contact with him people say about such a man that he has something about him which impresses them but which they fail to understand it will be worth your while to study this mental atmosphere of some strong men with whom you come in contact for now that you have the secret of the matter that you may take some valuable lessons from him the air about strong individuals as i have said in my mental magic i cannot very well describe this air to you for unless you have met a man of this kind you will not understand it but it is a very different thing from the pompous self-sufficient self-important fussy air and demeanor manifested by the cheap imitators of these great men the magnetic man does not tell you how great or smart or important he is he leaves that for his cheap imitators he makes you feel his strength by his very manner and atmosphere without saying a word he has that something about him that people notice and wonder at and that something comes from his conscious or unconscious relation to the universal will individuality not personality in the above paragraph i have pointed out to the student the kernel of the matter the little fellow who thinks he is one of the big ones believes that his strength comes from his personality and sooner or later he trips himself up because of this error but the real big ones of life know better they may not understand it all but some way they feel that there is a something back of them from which they are able to draw strength and power and believing this they are filled with courage and daring and radiate their strength on all sides they may talk of their lucky star or special providence or else believe themselves to be specially favored of god as is the case with at least one of the big men of modern finance but no matter what may be their special interpretations of this something they all recognize its existence and trust to it and this conviction and realization gives to the strong individuals that air of calm positive power and self-confidence that impresses those with whom they come in contact and which forms their mental atmosphere back to first principles and in giving you instructions in the art of building for yourselves a positive mental atmosphere i can do no better than to refer you back to the first principles and again bid you to realize that you are a dynamic focus a center of force in the great universal will having the dual attribute of will power and desire force in short that you are a living electromagnet realization brings power if you will but get this realization firmly fixed in your mind you will automatically create for yourself a most positive mental atmosphere that will be felt by all with whom you come in contact so first last and all the time build up this realization say to yourself i am a living electromagnet think it out dream it out act it out and of course always realize what all this means you are the electromagnet through which is pouring the universal will power and in the degree that you will allow the current to so flow through you so will be the power you are able to manifest how to use the realization when you wish to manifest a special degree of power just let this statement flame out in vivid letters in your mind when you feel that you are being approached by some other person of strong will whom you do not wish to influence you just bring this statement into effect and you will actually see the effect of it upon the other person he will feel your strong mental atmosphere and will cease to try to affect you and even when there is no special need for making the statement of power it will be well for you to keep it burning bright within you for by so doing you strengthen your realization and your mental atmosphere reflects the inner mental state special mental atmospheres 
so much for the general mental atmosphere as we proceed we shall see that the electromagnetic individual creates special mental atmospheres around him by his mental states depending upon his will or desire at the time not only does his will and desire affect other persons directly by means of mental currents but mentative induction is also set up by the mental atmosphere without any special effort on his part maintain your positivity in this place i wish to call your attention to the importance of always maintaining your positivity as a means of mental training do not allow yourself to become negative to others even where there is nothing lost by doing so for by this neglect you create a negative habit which will cause you trouble to overcome later if a person comes into your presence whose personality seems likely to dominate or overpower yours by all means interpose a mental resistance right then and there it is not necessary for you to manifest the same in words for that would make you ridiculous in many cases nor is it necessary for you to give any special physical expression to your mental state simply look the person in the eye carelessly and without any special effort at the same time making the mental statement I am a living electromagnet, and you will find that your positivity will rise until it is equal with his, and your feeling of negativity will disappear. In exceptional cases, you may add mentally, I am as positive as you. How to Create Positive Auras It will be well for you to practice the creation of special mental atmospheres in order to establish the habit and thus render it easier to avail yourself of the same on special occasions opportunities of all kinds will present themselves to you in everyday life the gist of the matter is to surround yourself with a mental aura of such a nature that people will act toward you as you wish them to do a few examples may help you to get a clearer idea of what i mean so i herewith give you the same an interesting example i know a lady living in chicago who was constantly complaining that people were always running over her on state street the crowded retail street of the great western metropolis she said that they were always crowding her off the sidewalk and pushing bumping and jostling her in a most annoying manner she asked me for instructions as to what thoughts she should use to prevent individuals from so acting i answered that i did not think it was necessary to consider the separate individuals in the case but that she should treat the crowd as a whole by means of a protective mental atmosphere i then advised her to build up a mental atmosphere around this statement people respect my rights they will not unduly impose on me in the street i deny the power of the crowd to impose on me and she followed this advice and in a short time had built up a protective mental atmosphere which acted almost magically upon the crowd who stepped aside and gave her a full right-of-way on the pavement she would simply go on her way calmly serenely and undisturbed and the crowd let her alone i must add that i think that the original trouble arose from a subconscious dislike to the crowds and an extreme shrinking from people the result being that this dislike acted almost as does fear and really attracted to her the inference of people the new mental atmosphere dispelled the old one and gave her an additional positivity beside fear as an attracting force in this connection i would call your attention to that remarkable psychological fact that fear acts as an attracting force in a negative way if you want a thing very much you attract it to you and if you fear it very much you do likewise this apparent contradiction has bothered many students of the subject but it seems very plain to me i think the explanation is that in both cases a vivid mental picture is held and the attraction results along the line of visualization which always tends to materialize the mental image do you see what i mean think over it a bit and you will see it plainly the transformation of a human doormat another case from actual experience another lady also a resident of chicago complained that the clerks in the great department stores would not treat her courteously but would keep her waiting without paying her any attention and in other ways would treat her like a human doormat she said she would not have minded this so much if other women were treated likewise 
but that while she was ignored others would receive the greatest attention the clerks falling over themselves to wait upon them i told her that she had gradually built up around her a mental atmosphere of expectancy that she had fallen into the habit of expecting such treatment and consequently she got what she expected i think that in the beginning she had manifested a timid humble meek worm of the dust state of mind when she entered the big stores which somewhat overawed her and then after this drew upon her the neglect of the clerks who seemed very ready to wipe their feet on human doormats she grew to regularly expect the shabby treatment it was not a matter of dress or anything of that kind for she dressed well and for that matter i know women who dress poorly who never got any such treatment for they understand the underlying mental laws too well for that it was simply a matter of a negative mental atmosphere as many of you will clearly see how the change occurred well i told her to brace up and create a new mental atmosphere around this general statement the clerks like me they like to wait on me they give me every attention they do this because they like me and also because i insist upon it as my right the charm worked in a short time and now the good lady reports that the clerks not only treat her well but even take the trouble to call her attention to desirable selections special bargains and all the rest of it the cure was perfect an analysis i call your attention to the above statement please note that the first part of it operated along the lines of desire force and the latter part along the lines of will power the statement of the first mentioned lady the one who objected to street crowding was altogether along the lines of will power i asked the students to study and dissect each of these cases because by doing so they will be able to apply the principles in cases coming under their own observation and also in their own cases End of chapter 16. Recording by Sandra Knight. www.sandranight.net. Chapter 17 of Mental Fascination. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Knight www.sandronite.net Mental Fascination by William Walker Atkinson Chapter 17 Direct Personal Influence In the last chapter I spoke of the effect of mental atmospheres with which people may and do surround themselves. You will notice that in my discussion of that part of the subject I spoke only of the general influence exerted upon others, and not of the direct personal influence exerted by one man upon another in personal intercourse. The present chapter and those following it shall be devoted to the part of the subject just referred to, the direct personal influence. The Silent Mental Conflict as i have told you elsewhere every time two people meet there ensues a silent mental conflict or struggle for supremacy from which one or the other emerges a victor and which victory is fully recognized by both of the parties to the proceeding the mental struggle is usually the combat between the general mental powers of the two without regard to special mental states induced at the time but the man who is skilled in the art of mental fascination goes further than this for he recognizes that he may concentrate his mentative energy into different shape and form and focus the force of his mental imagery direct upon the other person with such force and power that the second person will have a similar mental state induced in him along the lines familiar to the students of this book the lines of operation this direct personal influence operates along the lines of both desire force and will power of course i have explained elsewhere how the will power may be used to awaken desire in another and how it may also capture the will of the second person i have also explained how desire force induces a similar desire in the second person and also how it is often used to captivate the will of the other person it is not necessary for me to repeat these things you are supposed to be fully acquainted with them from your study of this book and mental magic and so i shall proceed to a consideration of the instruments of expression of personal influence and the methods usually employed by those using it 
the instruments of expression these instruments of expression may be classified as follows one suggestive instruments consisting of a the suggestive manner and b the suggestive tone and c the suggestive word two the instrument of the eye three the instrument of the touch and all of these three forms are of course merely the instruments by which and through which the mind expresses itself the channel through which pours the mentative energy let us consider them in the above order suggestive instruments i will ask you now to turn to my chapter on mental suggestion in my work on mental magic you will see therein stated the active principles of mental suggestion with which you should thoroughly familiarize yourself for i shall not repeat the instructions in this book you will see there that suggestion is the outward symbol of the inward mental state and that it is the inner state that gives vitality to the suggestion get this idea fixed firmly in your mind and always think of the force behind the suggestion i have explained to you also that when one receives a suggestion through a physical agent he has induced in himself the mental state corresponding to the one originating that physical suggestion for example if you feel yourself filled with confidence energy and fearlessness your outward appearance will reflect that inner state and the outer appearance will become a suggestion to others these others will instinctively feel that your inner state is as i have stated and this being so a physical suggestion made stronger than usual will produce a deeper impression on others than would any ordinary suggestion the suggestive manner in view of the above you will see why it is that those familiar with the subject deem it important to cultivate the suggestive instruments beginning with a the suggestive manner you will see why it is that we are impressed with the manner of a man who manifests energy self-confidence and power in every motion and also why we have confidence in a man whose manner indicates that he is a person used to being trusted by others accustomed to having confidence reposed in him and so i might mention hundreds of examples tending to show that if a man's manner conveys the impression that he is used to being treated in a certain way and that he is accustomed to acting in a certain way we are very apt to accept the suggestion of manner and fall into line with the rest of people and if the man happens to be a good actor we may be imposed upon and fooled by his suggestive manner the rule works both ways not only does this law hold good in the case of the manner and appearance of success strength confidence etc but it also operates along the lines of the appearance and manner of failure weakness and distrust do you not know of cases wherein you have felt that certain persons were not worthy of confidence or were not to be depended upon where strength of character was required or were not likely to succeed of course you have and you acted upon the suggestion too an illustration in illustrating this point i have frequently used the illustration of the two dogs the one carrying himself in a manner betokening self-respect and an ability to prevent and resent undue liberties and the other carrying his tail between his legs in a manner and appearance indicating that he expected to be kicked and cuffed the first dog is almost invariably treated with respect even by the most mischievous youngsters while the second one almost always invites to himself the kicks tin cans and brick bats of the young hoodlums of the neighborhood and this illustration is as true in the case of people as in the case of dogs better take the hint how to acquire this manner but you may say how is one to acquire the proper suggestive manner my answer is that there is but one sure way and that is to begin to think out the part visualize it and act it out you will see the philosophy of this in my lesson on mental architecture in my work on mental magic in other words if you wish to convey a suggestive manner of confidence you must begin to think confidence from morning until night and you must also begin to visualize confidence when you have the chance to do so that is you must make a mental picture of yourself as manifesting confidence and you must also begin to act out the part acting out your part 
now about this acting out i would say that i mean not only the playing the part in your interviews with people but i also mean an actual series of rehearsals in private just as you would do if you were preparing to play a part on the stage in public you must form a mental image of how you would look and act if you were filled with confidence and were approaching people you will find that practice will improve you very much in this way and that you will soon acquire a manner that will be like second nature and will really serve to give the suggestion of your manner to others with whom you come in contact and more than this it will actually tend to build up confidence in yourself imagine yourself as approaching strange people and then act out the part the best you know how improving a little in ease and smoothness of action each day think of how the actor on the stage impresses you and then remember that the manner was acquired by constant practice and work and you may do the same and may manage to impress other people just as the actor does you and what is true in the case of confidence is true regarding any character that you wish to play any and all characters may be played out in this way and an appearance and manner acquired which will give the suggestion to others i wish i could make you realize how much there is in this method if you could realize how some men have used it to acquire qualities that have enabled them to prey upon the public you would realize how important it might be for you for legitimate and honorable use practice makes perfect in this acting out you must remember that the practice will make you so perfect that the part will appear natural when you play it in public but without practice an attempt to play it in public will make one ridiculous remember the illustration of the real actor and you will have the secret of acting out and also remember this that in the measure that you throw your mind into the part so will be your success when you practice you must throw your mind into the acting just as you would if you were in earnest it is the mind back of it all remember the suggestive tone the suggestive instrument is the suggestive tone this too may be acquired by acting out you must practice until you are able to express your meaning with feeling that all who hear may be impressed you should begin your practice by choosing some simple words in everyday use good morning for instance try it now and see how roughly clumsily and crudely you give the morning greeting then try to imagine that you are full of good cheer energy and brightness and then throw your feeling into your good morning and see how different it seems practice this a while and you will soon acquire a natural cheery bright and invigorating tone when you say good morning you will not need a teacher in elocution to tell you how to do this try to feel the part and you will express it naturally make your feelings more flexible and your tones will reflect them after you have mastered the simpler terms of expression work up to larger sentences and speeches try them on the chairs in your room in imagining that people are seated therein speak to them feelingly and with expression until you acquire the art you will not realize how much you may gain by such practice until you actually try it i wish that you could hear the testimony of some people to whom i have taught this thing the importance of it there is nothing more important in personal influence than a good suggestive tone think of the people that you know and then remember what an influence their voices have on you not only the quality of the voice but the tone you readily recognize the difference between the tone of the hesitating timid self-doubting person and that of the confident self-reliant individual there is a subtle vibration about the tone of the latter that causes one to feel confidence and respect and which exacts obedience in a quiet calm way devoid of bluster or rant read what i have said on this subject in my lesson on personal influence in my work on mental magic examples of its use if you will read the part of the present book dealing with psychological experimentation you will see that much depends upon the tone you will see that when you say to a subject you can't the tone in which you say can't goes a long way toward producing the response and so it is with the suggestive tone no matter what it is made to express 
it always impresses upon one that the speaker using it means what he says and that is why many public men practice year after year in mastering this instrument of influence the suggestive tone again i would refer you to the example of the actor see how he manages to throw feeling into his tone and you may do likewise if you will but practice in earnest and throw your mind into the work think of the thing you wish to express visualize it and then act it out in your tone you will be surprised at the rapid progress that you will make remember always though the tone is but the instrument of expression of the mind back of it use nerves not muscles many people make the mistake of speaking with the muscles instead of with their nerves as one writer has expressed it in other words they seem to throw muscular force into their tones instead of nervous energy and in so doing they make a great mistake for the former has a dull non-penetrating effect whereas the latter vibrates subtly and reaches the feeling part of one's mind feel 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 when you wish to speak impressively and your tones will reflect the same and induce a corresponding feeling in others the suggestive word the third form of the suggestive instrument is the suggestive word i may be able to explain this more clearly when i call your attention to the fact that each word is a crystallized in every word there is an imprisoned thought and when you lodge a word in the mind of another person the crystal covering is dissolved and the released thought manifests itself and this being so it becomes important for one to carefully choose the crystallized thoughts or words which he wishes to implant in the mind of another i have spoken of this in my larger work in my lesson on mental suggestion to which i refer you but i wish here to say to you again that you should study words until you are able to distinguish between those which carry a live active feeling thought and those less strong examples take the word strong for instance does it not make you feel strength when you hear it forcibly and feelingly pronounced take the word kind and see what feelings it arouses in you pronounce the words lion and lamb and see the different feelings you experience from the differing sounds take the word crash and see how it suggests the crashing crunching tearing startling thing for which it stands compare the sound of the words rough and smooth and you will see what i mean the only way that i can point out to you to acquire the use of suggestive words is to study words themselves listen to the words used by others and note their effect on you take a small dictionary and run over its pages and you will soon have a collection of good strong effective terms for handy use when occasion demands a man does not have to be highly educated in the usual sense of that term in order to use strong suggestive words some instinctively choose vital words charged with feeling and such make their words felt think over this matter nutshell instructions in the use of all the three suggestive instruments remember that the object is to make others feel the mental state you are expressing that is the whole thing in a nutshell end of chapter seventeen recording by sandra knight www.sandranight.net chapter eighteen of mental fascination this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by sandra knight www.sandranight.net mental fascination by william walker atkinson chapter eighteen eye expression next in order in our list of instruments of mentative expression is the eye that most wonderful of all the human organs and which is as much an instrument for all the expression of mentative force as it is an instrument for receiving the sense impression of sight let us consider it in its former aspect the eye as a suggestive instrument in the first place the eye is one of the most potent and effective instruments of suggestion 
although i have not included it in that class the expression of the eye will induce mental conditions in others along the lines of suggestion and those who understand and have mastered this art of using the eyes have at their disposal a wonderful instrument of suggestive influence those of us who have ever met a very magnetic man or a charming and fascinating woman have carried away with us a lively recollection of the expression of the eyes of such a person actors and public speakers as well as those whose business it is to meet and impress people often make a close study of eye impression in order to produce a heightened effect along these lines while this phase of the subject belongs more properly to the various schools of expression in various parts of the country it may be worth while to pause a moment and examine some of the leading principles of this art of eye expression considered without reference to the phase of mentative energy exercises in eye expression begin by studying your eyes in a mirror you will see that in the center of the eyeball there is a black spot this is called the pupil of the eye the larger circle surrounding the pupil is called the iris the white of the eye surrounds the iris the upper eyelid moving over the eyeball produces a variety of expressions each giving to the face a totally different appearance expression of suggestive meaning we all recognize the meaning of these different expressions but very few of us understand the mechanism producing the expression standing before your mirror study these various expressions the following exercises may help you eyelid exercises one hold the upper eyelid in such a position that its edge rests halfway between the pupil and top of the iris this gives an expression of calmness two rest the edge of the upper eyelid at the top of the pupil this gives an expression of indifference three the edge of the eyelid resting at the top of the iris gives an expression of strong interest four the edge of the eyelid resting halfway over the pupil gives an expression of deep thought five the edge of the eyelid resting just above the edge of the iris and thus showing a narrow strip of white between the edge of the lid and the edge of the iris gives an expression of emotional activity six the above position exaggerated so as to show as much of the white as possible between the edge of the iris and the edge of the lid will give an expression of emotional excitement how to practice the exercises teachers of the art of expression instruct their pupils to practice the above expressions and positions they find that with a little practice nearly everyone may easily acquire the art of expression in the first four exercises but that the last two are more difficult of acquirement the last exercise emotional excitement especially is found to be quite difficult at attainment and teachers claim that but a small percentage are able to produce the expression without considerable practice practice these movements until you can reproduce them without the aid of the mirror just as a man may learn to shave without a mirror by constant practice before one the exercises will not only enable you to express the different mental states easily and freely but will also tend to strengthen the muscles and nerves of the eyes themselves providing that you pr proceed gradually and do not overtask the eyes at the beginning do not scowl or contract the brows in the practices a few minutes at a time is all that you should use in practicing the seventh exercise when you have mastered the above exercises especially numbers five and six you may try the following which is the most difficult of all seven rest the eyelid in the position of strong interest number three and then at the same time lift the edge of the under lid to the lower edge of the pupil this position gives the expression of close scrutiny the power of expression you will be surprised at the added power of expression that the careful practice of the above exercises will give you you will be able to manifest more suggestive feeling and will induce emotional states of feeling in others 
a little practice will give you such convincing proof of this that you will not need urging to further perfect yourself in them the expressions of emotional activity and emotional excitement especially will produce a startling result if used on appropriate occasions when you wish to exhibit the appearance of the deepest emotional excitement and force development exercises the following development exercises are highly recommended by teachers who have devoted years of study and practice along these lines one open the eyes quite widely but not so widely as to strain them and hold them in that position for a few seconds gazing into your mirror which must be directly in front of you on a level with your eyes while gazing open them a trifle wider still without straining and throw an intense expression into them do not move the eyebrows but allow them to remain normal two resume the above position and then change to the expression of strong interest see previous exercises looking at yourself in the glass just as you would in looking at another person with that expression three resume position one and then gradually change to the expression of emotional activity see previous exercises gazing at yourself in the mirror four resume position one and then gradually change to the expression of emotional excitement see previous exercises gazing at yourself in the mirror five resume position one and then gradually change to the expression of close scrutiny see previous exercises gazing at yourself in the mirror in the above exercises you must act as if the reflection of yourself in the mirror were in reality another person whom you wished to influence the better you act this out the better your results will be six practice the expression of strong interest on persons to whom you are listening until you feel that you have awakened a response in them i may add that the expression of deep interest consists of but the same expression heightened by more feeling behind it and the expression of loving interest is the same only more so this more feeling may be either real or assumed as in the case of the good actor seven practice the expression of close scrutiny upon other persons upon appropriate occasions in which you desire to appear as taking a deep critical interest in some proposition undertaking theory etc many persons have built up a reputation for being good listeners and keen observers by this practice i mention it for what it may be worth to you i am merely giving you the rules of the game not necessarily advising you to play it end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of mental fascination this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by Cielucent. mental fascination by william walker atkinson and now i have reached the part of my subject in which i must speak of the power of the eye to convey mentative force owing to some law of nervous mechanism not fully understood as yet the eye is one of the most effective mediums for the passage of mentative currents from one person to another. I shall not attempt to indulge in any special theory on the subject, but shall proceed to the description of the facts of the case. I may add, however, that advanced occultists inform us that portions of the human brain, during a manifestation or strong emotional effort or exercise of will, resembles an incandescent surface glowing and phosphorescent and that also there are seen great beams of this incandescent energy streaming out of out from the eyes of the person and reaching the mind of other persons and more than this these beams of energy transmit mental states thoughts etc of the person just as scientists have found that beams of light will carry waves of, of electricity and have thus been able to send telegraphic and even telephonic messages over such beams of light mentative beams of energy one who has mastered the fascination of the eye is able to convey most readily to others the mentative currents which tend to produce similar mental states by mentative induction as explained elsewhere in this book and in mental magic 
if you will but remember the above illustration of the beam of light along with the electric and magnetic currents travel and will form a mental picture of these mentative beams from the eye you will understand the process much better and you will at the same time tend to give to your own mentative beams a substantial reality along the lines of visualization that is when you wish to use these mentative beams you should imagine them as actually existing in full force and reality this will tend to cause to give them a material reality and thus render them a highly efficient medium for the passage of your mentative currents the fascinating gaze and now right here is the best place to instruct you in the proper use of the eye in what has been called the magnetic gaze but which would be more properly styled the fascinating gaze there has been much nonsense written on this subject and in some of my own earlier writings i gave directions along these lines which i am now able to replace with more approved methods and later discoveries coming from the study and experimentation of myself and others along these lines i am willing to improve upon my own methods as well as upon those of others i have no false pride upon this subject and if to-morrow i find that i can improve upon my work of to-day i will do so and give my students the benefit of the change instead of stubbornly sticking to it just because i had once stated a theory fact or result there is no standing still in scientific work he who stands still really goes backward the former method the former instructions regarding the magnetic gaze told the student to concentrate his gaze at the root of the nose of the other person that is right between his two eyes now this was all very well but there is a far better plan this focusing the gaze between the eyes of the other person really results in crossing your gaze and thus robbing it of a portion of the direct electromagnetic power that it possesses you may prove this by holding up a pencil before your eyes and focusing your eyes upon it as you draw it nearer and nearer to your eyes the nearer you get to the pencil or to the other person the more will your gaze be crossed and the effect impaired a gaze from a pair of crossed eyes is not nearly so fascinating as one from a pair of straight eyes giving out a direct forceful impression the new method the new fascinating gaze is performed as follows you do not focus your gaze at a point between the two eyes of the other person but instead you gaze directly and straightly into his two eyes with your two eyes you will find this difficult and tiring if you perform it in the ordinary way and herein lies the secret instead of focusing your eyes upon his as if you really wish to see the color of his eyes you might so focus your eyes that you are really gazing through him as if he were transparent and you wish to see something beyond him a little practice before a mirror will show you what i mean better than i can explain it to you in words practice at gazing through objects will aid you in acquiring this gaze try for instance focusing your eyes upon the wall opposite you as you raise your eyes from this page then as you look at the wall slowly pass your hand before your eyes at a distance of about two feet but don't change your focus don't see the hand plainly but keep your gaze focused on the wall as if you could see it through the hand how to practice this case must not consist of a blank vacant stupid state but must be intense and earnest practice on objects as above stated and with your mirror will aid you in perfecting the gaze it will help you if you have some friend with whom you can practice the effect upon others the other person will not be aware that you are not seeing him and are gazing through him to him it will appear that you are giving him a very deep intense steady earnest glance he will see your pupils dilate as they always do when looking at a distant object and your expression will be one of calm serene power it does not tire the eyes and another important point about this gaze is that you may maintain it a long time without tiring the eyes and without the eyes watering or blinking you may outstare another person or animal in this way without fatigue while the other's eyes grow tired and weak so much is this true that the results of my own investigation of the subject have convinced me that the animals who manifest the fascinating gaze as mentioned in the previous chapter really focus their eyes beyond the object in just this way if ever you get a chance to observe an animal fascinating another you will see that i am right in this theory 
the scientific explanation this gazing through the other person is accomplished by a certain accommodation of the eye as oculists and opticians call it and while you are performing it you cannot examine distinctly or see distinctly the eyes of the other person because your focus is different to show you why you are able to maintain this case such a long time without tiring your eyes i would remind you of the case with which you may maintain the expression of being wrapped in thought daydreaming lost in a brown study just thinking about things etc with which you all are familiar in such a mental state you're able to gaze into space for a long time without the slightest fatigue while a few seconds focusing your eyes upon a nearby subject will tire them very much indeed and then again you know how long you are able to gaze at an object far out at sea or far across the desert or far down or across the mountain without tiring your eyes the whole secret is that short range focusing upon an object tires the eyes much more than does long range gazing into space this being the case it will tire you far less seeing through a person than gazing at him and seeing him at a short range rules for practice in practicing the maintaining of the gaze for a long time i would advise against tiring the eyes by gazing at short range objects better practice at gazing at distant objects until you're able to maintain the gaze a long time as you will be able to do after a little practice in fact i advise you to practice the gazing into space because proficiency in that will enable you to perfect the fascinating gaze after you have practiced this gazing through method a bit you will be able to look at an object a couple of feet away and gaze right through it and that is you will not consciously see it objectively although apparently staring hard at it make haste slowly avoid all exercising tiring the eyes and proceed slowly working from trifling successes to more important ones you will be surprised how a little intelligent practice along these lines will give you a penetrating glance firm earnest and full of magnetism and fascination without the slightest sense of strain fatigue or effort you have long wished for such an expression here it is for you End of chapter 19. Recording by Cielo Sand. Chapter 20 of Mental Fascination. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Knight. www. Sandranight.net. Mental Fascination by William Walker Atkinson. The Use of the Mentative Instruments. In the use of the eyes for the purpose of conveying mentative currents, you should always remember that the feeling is the real power behind these currents of force, and that the brain is the dynamo from which the currents originate. The brain, you know, is the great transformer or converter of the mentative energy and acts just as does a dynamo in the direction of sending forth great waves of force consequently if you wish to send out mentative currents for the purpose of inducing feeling in others you must first have feeling generated in your mental dynamo valuable exercises it will be well for two people to practice the eye exercises together but in the absence of a friend in whom you have confidence you may obtain excellent results by practicing before your friendly mirror. In either case, you must first arouse in your mind the feeling that you wish to express in mentative currents. Put your feeling into your glance and it will be felt. Exercise 1. Look into the eyes of your friend or your own in the mirror and then say mentally, I am stronger than you. Throw into your glance as much of the feeling of strength as you can. Exercise 2. Say mentally, I am more positive than you. I am outgazing you. Throwing as much positivity as possible into your gaze, the same being inspired, of course, by your feeling. Exercise 3. Say and feel, You are afraid of me. I am making you feel my strength. Throwing the feeling into your gaze. Actual Practice 
after you have acquired the faculty of making your strength felt by the above exercises you may use same upon other people when the occasion renders it advisable if you are addressed by some person whom you think is trying to master you mentatively or whose strong influence you wish to ward off you may use the above method on him as a rule the person who is doing the talking has a slight advantage over the listener all else being equal the speaker is the more positive because he is expressing more energy but you may counteract this if you are the listener by simply sending him a glance accompanied by the feeling of i scatter your force into bits you cannot affect me points of practice in resisting an attack of this sort keep your mouth closed with the teeth touching for this bite denotes strength and firmness and brings into play the parts of the brain manifesting these qualities and thus charges your mentative currents with these feelings at the same time gaze firmly and steadily into the eyes of the other using the fascinating gaze i would bid you remember my remarks in mental magic about the person standing having the advantage of the one sitting avoid the sitting position when the other person is standing do not give him this advantage but take it for yourself if you can mental commands and refusals in speaking to persons and requesting them to do something you should accompany the verbal request by a mental command for instance if you say you will do this for me won't you this is the suggestive form of questioning remember you should accompany the question with the command made mentally with the proper glance you will do this if you are the person requested to do something that you do not wish to do you should answer no i do not care to do this or i do not see my way clear to do it or i am unable to oblige you etc etc but at the same time you must send the mental answer with its accompanying glance i will not do it and you cannot make me certain dangerous teaching a well-known teacher along these lines several years ago taught his pupils to gaze into the eyes of persons whom they wished to affect at the same time saying mentally i am looking at you i am looking through your eyes into your brain my will power is stronger than yours you are under my control i will compel you to do what i wish you must do what i say you shall do this do it at once it will readily be seen that this will generate a powerful mentative current if there is a sufficiently strong feeling will and desire behind it but right here i shall give you an antidote for this kind of influence in all cases where you are attacked mentally in this way you may dissolve the force by a positive denial the positive denial the positive denial is the powerful force that scatters into tiny bits the force directed against one it is a destructive agent just as is the positive statement a constructive or creative one one who understands the scientific use of this destructive force may undo the mentative work of others to a surprising degree some day i shall have more to say regarding these two warring forces along the broader lines of the entire subject of telementation but at present i shall confine myself to their use in personal influence by a strong positive denial you may scatter and disintegrate any mentative influence directed against you this formula will give you a general idea of it suppose that you are repelling a statement such as given above in that case you should say mentally accompanying it with the proper glance with feeling back of it i deny positively your power over me i deny it out of existence i will not do your bidding and i deny your right and power to command me i deny your power and i affirm my own how to cultivate this power you may cultivate this power to use the positive denial by practicing on an imaginary person whom you may suppose is trying to influence you imagine the strong positive person before you trying to influence you and then start in to practice the positive denial on him 
until you feel that you have beaten him off and have sent him flying away in retreat. These imaginary mental battles will develop a great power of mentative resistance in you, and I advise you to strengthen yourself along these lines. If you feel that you are weak, you may improve on the above exercise by imagining that after your enemy is in full retreat, you follow him up and pour statement after statement into him, changing your position from a defender into an attacking force. The Secret of Effective Speaking In personal conversation with another, you will find it of the greatest value to see as clearly as possible a mental picture, chart, or map of what you are saying to him. By so doing, you will impress most forcibly upon his mind that which you wish him to see and feel. In this statement is compressed the secret of effective speaking. In the degree that you see and feel the thought that you are expressing in words will be the degree of impression made upon and mentative induction produced in the other person. The secret, of course, lies in the law of visualization, as explained in Mental Magic and in this book. Psychological Experiments You may find an evidence of your increasing mentative influence by trying the physiological experiment of willing people to move this way or that way by gazing intently at them. In this experiment, it is not necessary for you to gaze into their eyes gazing at their back preferably at the upper part of the neck at the base of the brain will answer you may try willing persons to look around on the street or in public places etc or you may will that they turn to the right or left of you when approaching each other on the street or in stores you may will that a certain clerk from out of a number will step forward to wait upon you these and many similar experiments have an interest to the majority of students and are accomplished with comparative ease after sufficient practice. The whole theory and practice consist of a steady gaze and the mental command and will that the person will act so and so, together with the earnest expectation that they will obey the command and the mental picture of their doing so. That is all there is to it. General Advice and the use of the eye as a mentative instrument, remember first, last, and all the time that desire and will are the phases of the mentative energy, and that in the degree that desire is kindled and will is exerted, so will be the power expressed by yourself and impressed upon others. Read Mental Magic over a number of times until you have fully grasped the underlying principles. Then reread the present book and commit its exercises and instructions to memory. Then practice frequently and perfect yourself in the methods pointed out until you render them second nature. You will be conscious of a gradual growth and development along the lines of mentative power and influence. The flame of electromagnetic power once lit will never die out. Tend the flame carefully keep the wick trimmed clean and fill the lamp with oil and it will ever burn bright and emit heat and light and power the magnetic touch the last mentative instrument mentioned in a previous chapter is the touch there was a time in my early stages of experimentation and psychological research when i laughed at the idea of the touch playing any real part in the work of mentative influence of course, I saw the effect of the touch in certain phases of psychological work, but I believed that it was all merely suggestion. But I soon learned that the touch was really a most potent instrument of mentative energy. I now explain it by the idea of the nerves being like the wires upon which the electric current travels. The brain is the dynamo, or converter, of the energy, and while the latter travels in waves and currents without any wires, just as does the wave of the wireless telegraph, still, if there is a wire to be had, then it follows the lines of least resistance and takes the advantage of the nerve wire. Certain parts of the body have nerve cells very highly developed in them, and are in fact miniature brains. In the cases of some persons of sensitive and trained touch, there exist little clusters of nerve cells at the ends of the fingers that act like miniature brains. The lips are also highly developed in this respect, 
as the well-known phenomena of kissing evidences. The fingers and hand are excellent polar mediums for conveying the mentative energy that pours down over the nerves from the brain and through which it passes to the other person. How to use the hands. The use of the touch of the hands as a channel for conveying mentative energy depends greatly upon the development of the hands by the individual. Those who understand this matter develop the conductivity of the hands by treating them as follows. Think of your hands as excellent conductors of mentative energy, and imagine that you can feel the energy pouring down the nerves of your arms and out your hands, obeying your will when you shake hands with people. You will soon develop your hands to such a degree that some sensitive persons will actually feel the current passing into them. Always accompany the passage of the current with the thought or feeling that you wish to induce in the other person, just as you do when you use the fascinating gaze. In fact, the gaze and the hand clasp should be used together, when possible, for by doing so you double the effect. The Magnetic Hand Clasp When you shake hands with a person, throw mind and feeling into it, and do not fall into the mechanical, lifeless method so common among people. Throw your feeling down to your hand and at the same time make a mental command or statement appropriate to the case. For instance, grasp the person's hand with feeling and interest, saying mentally, at the same time, you like me. Then, when you draw your hand away, if possible, let your fingers slide over the palm of his hand in a caressing manner, allowing his first finger to pass between your thumb and forefinger, close up in the crotch of the thumb. Practice this well until you can perform it without thinking of it. That is, make it your natural way of shaking hands. You will find that this method of shaking hands will open up a new interest in people toward you, and in other ways you will discover its advantage. You will never know a fascinating person who did not have a good hand clasp. It is a part of the fascinating personality. Other Uses of the Hands there are many persons well grounded on the psychological principles underlying mental fascination who use the hands as a medium for mentative energy without shaking hands. For instance, they sit near the other person and place their hands so that their fingers will point toward him, at the same time willing that the current flow through the fingers and toward the other. They also use their hands in conversation so as to have the tips of their fingers pointing toward the other. This last plan becomes highly effective when used with the appropriate gestures, for it is akin to the mesmeric pass of the hands. In this connection, I would say beware of the person who is always trying to put his hands on you. Beware of the pawing over process. Avoid it in the ordinary way, if possible, or else deliberately practice the positive denial toward the person, holding the idea and mental statement that, I deny the power of your magnetism. I scatter it by my denial. A warning to women. In concluding this chapter, I would especially caution young women, and older ones for that matter, against allowing men to be familiar with them in the direction of holding hands or similar practices. Not only does this familiarity breed contempt, but there are good psychological reasons why the practice is to be condemned. You have seen what part the hands play in magnetizing, as it is called, and is it not clearly discernible how one may use the hands in this petting and all that sort of thing in order to psychologically affect another person? I am not speaking now of the caresses indulged in by honorable true lovers, for all the talk in the world would not change that sort of thing. But I am alluding to the indiscriminate pawing over on the part of strange men that some young girls allow. There is a danger in this sort of thing, and I want you to know it. If you have daughters or young female relatives, warn them against this thing and tell them the reasons why. A Caution to Men And the same thing is true of the man who is always patting other men on the shoulder or resting his arm around them or else taking hold of them in a friendly, caressing way during a conversation. 
such men may not know the psychology of the thing but they have found out that this sort of padding up makes other men more impressionable and amenable to their influence and so they practice it make them stop it either by moving away or by positive denial the protective armor now once more remember the power of this positive denial as a disperser and disintegrator of adverse influence if this book taught you nothing else it would still be worth while to you because of this one point of instruction for this positive denial is a mentative armor that will protect you a mentative sword that will defend you a mentative lightning flash that will clear the mental atmosphere learn the secret of positive statement and positive denial and you are clad in an invulnerable armor and armed with the weapon of strength and so you may like the warrior bold go gaily to the fray may the victory be yours end of chapter twenty use of mentative instruments recording by sandra knight www .sandra -knight .net. chapter twenty one of mental fascination this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Knight. www.sandranight.net. Mental Fascination by William Walker Atkinson. Concluding Instruction. We have now reached the end of our consideration of the subject of mental fascination in this book. But you have reached only the beginning of the subject when you close these pages for the real subject rests in the action of the principles in real life the effect of the instruction though you may not feel disposed to put into operation much of the instruction given herein yet from your very acquaintance with what has been taught in these pages you will be compelled to see the operation of the principles in the everyday life around you you will see them in operation on every side now that you are familiar with their laws of operation and you will find yourself instinctively guarding against its influence just as you would guard against a threatened physical blow and you will be surprised and perhaps pained sometimes at seeing people trying to influence you in this way whom you would not have suspected of doing so on the whole you will be a much stronger man or woman by reason of the information herein given you and you will have the advantage of knowing how to resist defeat and dispel the adverse influences that may be used to influence you remember the assertion of the positive will and the use of the positive denial additional information there is one thing more that i wish to call your attention to before closing although strictly speaking it forms part of the subject of telemental influence rather than that of mental fascination I have mentioned this matter in my work on mental magic in my lesson on the science of telementation I allude to the use of telementation for the purpose of mental fascination which is performed by some persons who have become acquainted with the subject distant fascination the person wishing to influence another at a distance just as he would in the case of personal interview forms a mental image of the person whom he wishes to influence and then proceeds just as if the person was actually before him according to the methods mentioned in this book i know of at least one teacher who advises his students to treat prospective customers and others with whom they expect to have dealings or relations as follows imagine your prospective customer or other person as seated in a chair before you which you are standing Make the imagined picture as strong as possible, for upon this depends your success. Then proceed to treat the person just as you would if he were actually present. Concentrate your will upon him and tell him just what you expect to tell him when you meet him. Use all of the arguments that you can think of and at the same time hold the thought that he must do as you say. Try to imagine him as complying with your wishes in every respect for this imagining will tend to come true when you really meet the person this rule may be used not only in the case of prospective customers 
but also in the cases of persons whom you wish to influence in any way whatsoever. How to counteract the influence. Now all this is very plain to the student of this book and of my work on mental magic, for the principles employed are familiar to my students. The result of a practice like the above would undoubtedly tend to clear a mentative path in the other person's mind and make easier the effect of a subsequent interview. For the other person would be thus accustomed to the idea, thought, or feeling, and the work of clearing away the mental underbrush would be done in advance. But fortunately for us all, we have the antidote for this bane, if we have acquainted ourselves with the underlying principles of the subject. So important do I regard this matter of self-protection against this telemental influencing that I propose adding to my remarks on the subject several paragraphs from my book on mental magic, which, although you have already read them, should appear right in this place in order to be impressed upon your mind in connection with what I have just said. I want you all to read again what I have said on this subject of self-protection, so here is the reproduction of a few rules to use on occasions when you think that someone is trying to treat or influence you. Better study them carefully. Here they are. Valuable Rules 1. In the first place, steady your mind and calm your feelings. Then pause for a moment and say the words, I am calmly and forcibly at the same time forming a mental picture of yourself as a center of force and power in the great ocean of mind see yourself as standing alone and full of power then mentally form a picture of your aura extending about a yard on all sides of you in an egg-shaped form see that this aura is charged with your will power which is flowing outward repelling any adverse mental suggestions that are being sent to you and causing them to fly back to the source from whence they came a little practice will enable you to perfect this picture which will greatly aid you in creating a strong positive aura of will which will prove to be a magnetic armor and shield it has helped many I assert my individuality as a center of force, power, and being. Nothing can adversely affect me. My mind is mine own, and I refuse admittance to unwelcome suggestions for influences. My desires are my own, and refuse to admit undesirable variations by induction or otherwise. My will is my own, and I charge it with power to beat off and repel all undesirable influences. I am surrounded by an aura of positive will, which protects me absolutely. A Useful Denial The following denial has proved of the greatest value to many. I deny to all or any the power to influence me against my best interest. I am my own master. These words may seem simple, but if you will use them, you will be surprised at their efficacy. You realize, of course, that it is the mental state aroused by the words that does the work, rather than any special virtue in the words themselves. Guard against impulses. 2. Guard yourself from acting upon impulses. When you feel a sudden or unaccountable impulse to do this thing or that thing, stop and assert your positive individuality, and then drive out all outside influences, by repeating the affirmations, etc., given above, and by creating the proper mental picture. Then, when you have recovered your balance, consider the impulse and decide whether it is to your best interests or otherwise. You will be able to see this clearly by reason of your mental house cleaning a moment before. Then, if the impulse seems to be against your best interests, drive it from you, saying, I drive you away from me, you do not belong to me, return to those who sent you, or other words to that effect. This may be rendered more forceful if you will but create a mental picture of the discarded idea flying away from you in the shape of a tiny thought wave. These mental pictures aid one very materially in such matters, both in the sending forth of an idea as well as in the discarding of one. The Positive Aura 3. Cultivate the picture and idea of a positive aura, and always think of yourself as being encased in such a one.
see yourself as a strong positive eye a center of power encased in an impregnable sheath of auric force you will thus be able to build up yourself into a mighty center you will be surprised at the confused manner of people who try to influence you when they come in contact with this aura and find their suggestions and mentative currents being cast back upon themselves such people find themselves all broken up when they meet a condition like this which they do not understand for a very few of them are practical occultists the mental picture of yourself as a center of power surrounded with a positive aura will if persisted in render you extremely positive so that your influence is sure to be felt by the world with which you come in contact amusing sequels you will often be amused by occurrences following after the rejection of these stray impulses etc you will find that if you have had an impulse to buy a certain thing or sell a certain thing at a sacrifice that in a day or so perhaps an hour or so you will be approached by some person who will advise you personally to do that same thing the person being likely to be benefited by the scheme or plan i do not mean that such person has necessarily tried to influence you by mentative currents for he may not have consciously done so but nevertheless that is just what has happened and his desire or will has caused these currents to flow in your direction and you have felt them now that your eyes have been opened to this fact you will be amused and surprised to see how many cooperative proofs you will receive but always insert your individuality as a center of power and all will be well with you in these matters the protective agent i hope that the above reproduction of the advice given in mental magic will do you good and once more remember the power of the positive denial as a protective agent by its use you may disperse and scatter the mentative currents of others and surround yourself with an impregnable armor of mentative energy and also remember this which i have not said elsewhere that the law of life is concerned with the protection of the individual and gives to each the weapons with which to preserve his individuality so true is this that occultists know that there is the greatest difference in the use of the mentative power as an attacking force and as a protective force i will illustrate this briefly protective individuality a man's mentative force is immensely more powerful when he uses it to protect his individuality than when he uses it to attack the individuality of another in fact if everyone understood the laws of mentative defense and would avail himself of the information given by me under this head there would be almost a total absence of mentative attack for the futility of the same would soon be recognized the only reason that the strong individuals are able to affect the weaker ones so frequently is because the other do not know their inner power and make no defense in fact the majority of people do not know of these laws at all and if one tells them they sneer and smile knowingly tapping their foreheads to indicate that their informant is just a little off poor sheep and geese they are so happy in their ignorance and conceit that it almost seems a pity to disturb them nature's protective armor but to return to my subject you will find that it will require a much less effort of will to protect your individuality than it will to attack the individuality of another you will find that the law is on your side when you say i won't be influenced i deny the power of another to weaken my individuality for you have then called into operation that law of nature which is always in operation and which she gives to her creatures in the way of an instinctive protective force so there is no occasion to be afraid you are immune from attacks if you will but assert the force within you the glory of individuality and now friends in conclusion i beg of you to remember that you are individuals centers of mind power force and energy yes centers of life in the great ocean of being 
each of you is something different from any other sinner and the law wishes you to live your own life develop your own individuality assert your own birthright and in the measure that you do so so will the law be on your side do not let the snare of personal pride trip you up and entangle you in its meshes for it is but an illusion but glory in your pride of individuality and do not be frightened coaxed seduced lured or driven by the race thought into the condition of the worm of the dust person do not be a human doormat do not be a human sheep or goose following some fool leader in a stately goose step or the sheep-like follow my leader fashion remember that you are men and women that you are individuals for which the cosmic machinery has been laboring for ages in order to evolve the statement of individuality the statement of individuality that i am here now is a mighty one it will always be i am with you it will always be here with you it will always be now with you no matter what state your individuality may reach no matter what point of space you may occupy no matter what period of time it may be it will always be true that i am here now for it will always be your i that is speaking it will always be am with you everywhere place will be here to you all time will be now with you may you unfold into a perception of this statement of individuality for when you do you will have reached a mental plane where even the principles herein taught will seem elementary to you for you will have soared above them and their operation may this and other works of mine be as ladders upon which you may mount and which you may then kick away from under your feet as no longer needed students i thank you and bid you of wiedersehen may the law protect you till we meet again end of chapter twenty one concluding instruction recording by sandra knight www sandra knight net end of mental fascination by william walker atkinson